Chapter 10 In the week that followed the episode of Megrims, Holly became aware of some changes in the Bronson household. The most obvious difference was the attitude of the servants. Although their service had formerly been sloppy, inconsistent, and indifferent, it seemed that they had begun to take a sort of collective pride in their work. Perhaps the result of Holly's discreet education of the Bronsons on what to expect from their hired help. I understand your reluctance, Mrs. Bronson, Holly had murmured one afternoon, when the maids had brought a tea tray containing a pot of lukewarm water, a jug of off-scented milk and stale cakes. However, you must send it back. There's nothing wrong in refusing unacceptable fare. They do so much work already, Paula protested, already fussing with the tea service, as if she fully intended to make do with it. I can't put them to more trouble, and this isn't so bad, really. It's terrible, Holly insisted, smothering a frustrated laugh. You send it back, Paula implored. Mrs. Bronson, you must learn to manage your own servants. I can't. Paula surprised Holly by catching at her hand and holding it tightly. I used to be a rag seller, she whispered. Lower than the lowest scullery maid who works in the kitchen downstairs. And they all know it. How can I give them orders? Holly regarded her thoughtfully, feeling a surge of compassion, as she finally understood the source of the woman's timidity toward everyone outside the immediate family. Paula Bronson had lived in wretched poverty for so long that she did not feel worthy of the circumstances she now found herself in. The fine house with its rare tapestries and artwork, the elegant clothes she wore, the lavish meals and expensive wines, only served to remind Paula of her humble beginnings. Yet there was no way for her to go back. Zachary had raised his family to a level of wealth far beyond anything Paula had expected or imagined. It was imperative that Paula learn to change along with her circumstances, or she would never find any comfort or happiness in her new life. You're no longer a rag seller, Holly said in a purposeful voice. You're a woman of means. You're Mr. Zachary Bronson's mother. You brought two remarkable children into the world and reared them with no help from anyone, and anyone with their wits intact will admire your accomplishment. She returned Paula's grip with a strong one of her own. Insist on receiving the respect you deserve, she said, staring directly into the woman's troubled brown eyes, especially from your own servants. Along this vein, there are many other things I intend to discuss with you, but for now... She paused and tried to think of a curse word to give her statement emphasis. Send the damn tray back! Paula's eyes rounded, and she put her hand to her mouth to smother a bubbling laugh. <laughs> Lady Holly, I've never heard you swear before. Holly smiled back at her. If I can make myself swear, then you can surely ring for the maids and ask for a proper tea. Paula squared her shoulders in determination. All right, I'll do it. She hurried to the bell pull before she changed her mind. In an effort to further improve the relations between the Bronsons and their servants, Holly arranged for a brief daily meeting with the housekeeper, Mrs. Burney. She insisted that Paula and Elizabeth be present, although both were reluctant to do so. Paula was still excruciatingly shy about giving directions to Mrs. Burney, and Elizabeth had little interest in domestic matters. However, they had to learn— the business of household management is something every lady must attend to, Holly instructed the two. Every morning you must meet with Mrs. Burney and review the menus for the day. Discuss what special chores the servants must perform, such as cleaning carpets or polishing the silver. Most importantly, you must go over the household accounts, make entries and arrange for necessary purchases. I thought Mrs. Burney was supposed to handle all that. Elizabeth looked disgruntled at the idea of dealing with such tedious business on a daily basis. No, you are, Holly said, smiling. And you may as well practice along with your mother. 
because some day you will have your own household to manage. To the Bronson women's amazement, their efforts were rewarded with far better service than they had been accustomed to. Although Paula was still clearly uncomfortable with giving directions to the servants, her skills were improving, and her confidence along with them. The other significant change in the household routine was the behavior of its master. Gradually, Holly realized that Zachary Bronson was no longer prowling back and forth to London every evening in search of revelry. While she wouldn't have ventured so far as to suggest that he had reformed, Bronson did seem quieter, calmer, a bit less callous and coarse. There were no further wicked, dark glances or provocative discussions, no more near kisses or disconcerting compliments. During their lessons, Bronson was sober and respectful as he applied himself to what she had to teach. He behaved perfectly, even when they continued their dance lessons. And to Holly's dismay, Bronson, the aspiring gentleman, had an appeal for her that went far beyond the pull that Bronson the rogue had exerted. She now saw many of the things he had kept hidden behind his sardonic, cynical facade, and she began to admire him more than she had ever dreamed possible. He had a passionate interest in helping the poor, not merely by making charitable donations, but by increasing their opportunities to help themselves. Unlike other men of his extraordinary wealth, Bronson identified with the underclasses. He understood their needs and concerns, and he took action to improve their circumstances. In an effort to pass a bill that would shorten the working man's labors to ten hours a day, Bronson had countless meetings with politicians and lavishly funded their favorite causes. He had abolished child labor in his own factories and provided benefit funds for his employees, including pensions for widows and the elderly. Other employers had resisted instituting such measures in their own companies, stating that they could not afford to provide such benefits for their workers. But Bronson was becoming so enormously rich that his success provided the best argument in favor of treating employees like men instead of animals. Bronson used his companies to import or produce goods that improved the lives of common men, bringing affordable products to the masses, such as soap, coffee, candy, fabric, and tableware. However, Bronson's business strategies were winning far more enmity than admiration among his peers. Aristocrats complained that he was trying to erase class boundaries and diminish their rightful authority, and they were almost unanimous in their bitter desire to see him brought low. It was clear to Holly that no matter how polished Bronson became, he would never be welcomed into first society, only barely tolerated. She would be heartily sorry to see him marry a spoiled heiress who would value him only for his money and disdain him behind his back. If only there were some spirited girl who might share in his causes— who might even enjoy being married to a man of his intelligence and vigor. Bronson had much to offer a wife who had the sense to appreciate him. It would be a unique marriage, lively and interesting and passionate. Holly had thought of introducing him to one of her three unmarried younger sisters. It would be a good match, and certainly advantageous to her family to have such an infusion of wealth but the idea of Zachary Bronson courting one of her sisters caused a deep stab of something that felt very much like jealousy. Besides, her sisters, being the unworldly creatures they were, would not be able to handle him easily. There were times, even now, when Bronson became overbearing and required a firm set-down. The matter of the guns, for example— on the day that Holly had arranged to take Elizabeth and Paula to her own dressmaker to order styles a bit more elegant than those they currently wore, Bronson had taken Holly aside and made an astonishing offer. "'You should have some new gowns made up as well,' he said. "'I'm tired of seeing you in all that half-mourning, grey, brown, lavender. No one expects it of you any longer. Order as many as you like. I'll take care of the expense.' Holly stared at him open-mouthed. Not only are you daring to complain about my appearance, 
You are also insulting me by offering to pay for my clothes. I didn't mean it as an insult. He countered warily. You know very well that a gentleman would never purchase items of apparel for a lady, not even a pair of gloves. Then I'll subtract the necessary amount from your salary. Bronson gave her a cajoling smile. A woman with your looks deserves to wear something beautiful. I'd like to see you in shade green or yellow or red. The idea seemed to spark his imagination as he continued. I can't imagine a finer sight in the world than you in a red gown. Holly was not mollified by the flattery. I most certainly will not order new gowns, and I'll thank you to spare me further mention of the subject. A red gown, indeed. Do you know what would become of my reputation? It's already tarnished, he pointed out. You may as well enjoy yourself. He seemed to enjoy her spluttering outrage at the comment. You, sir, may, may, go to the devil, he suggested helpfully. She seized on the expression with enthusiasm. Yes, go right at once to the devil. As she should have expected, Bronson ignored her refusal, went behind her back, and ordered a selection of new gowns for her. It had been easy enough, as the dressmaker already had her measurements and knew her tastes. On the day the boxes of finery arrived, Holly was livid to discover that fully a third of them were for her. Bronson had ordered just as many for her as he had for his mother and sister, complete with matching gloves, shoes, and hats. I won't wear any of this, Holly declared, glaring at Bronson from behind a tower of boxes. You've wasted your money. I can't begin to describe how vexed I am with you, sir. I won't wear a single ribbon or button from any of these boxes. Do you understand? Laughing at her annoyance, Bronson offered to burn them himself, if it would serve to restore her good humour. Holly considered giving the garments to her sisters, who were of similar build and size. However, as unmarried girls, they were consigned to wearing mostly white. These were gowns intended for a woman, a worldly one at that. Only in private had Holly allowed herself to examine the gorgeously, beautifully made garments, so different from her morning weeds or the styles she had once worn as George's wife. The colours were rich, the styles dashing and feminine, and wonderfully flattering to a woman with her full hipped figure. There was the jade green Italian silk, with its full sleeves that narrowed to neat cuffs with cunning triangular points that lay over the backs of her hands, and the dark rose watered silk promenade dress with its matching broad brimmed hat trimmed with delicate white lace. The lavender striped morning gown with crisp white sleeves and double flounced skirt, and the yellow silk gauze with sleeves and hem thickly embroidered with roses. Worst of all was the red silk. An evening gown of such impeccable simplicity and elegance that it nearly broke her heart to know that it would go for ever unworn. The daring scooped neckline flowed into a smooth, unadorned bodice, while the skirts cascaded in a majestic fall of red. The shade somewhere between fresh apples and rare wine. The gown's only ornamentation was a red velvet sash trimmed with silk fringe. It was the most beautiful garment she had ever seen. Had the gown been made in a more circumspect shade, even some quiet dark blue, Holly would have accepted the gift and propriety be damned. However, Bronson, true to form, had made certain it was a colour that she could never wear. He did it for the same reason he ordered her plates of cakes. He enjoyed tempting her and watching her struggle miserably with her conscience. Well, not this time. Holly did not try on a single gun. Instead, she ordered Maud to store them in an armoire, to be given away at some future date when the opportunity presented itself. There, Mr. Bronson, Holly murmured, turning the key in the armoire lock with a decisive click. I may not always be able to resist your infernal temptations, but in this matter at least I have succeeded. 
Almost four months had passed since Holly had come to reside at the Bronson estate, and now it was time to test the results of her patient tutoring. The night of the Plymouth Ball had finally arrived. It would serve as Elizabeth's introduction to society. It was also an opportunity for Zachary Bronson's newly polished manners to be displayed to the Tom. Holly was filled with pride and hopeful anticipation, suspecting that there were many in first society who would be pleasantly surprised by the Bronsons this evening. At Holly's suggestion, Elizabeth wore a white gown trimmed with swathes of pale pink gauze, with one fresh pink rose pinned at her waist. And another fastened in the piled-up curls of her hair. The girl looked fresh and graceful, her slender figure and considerable height lending her a queenly air. Although Zachary had given his sister many gifts of jewelry in the past, Holly had looked over the priceless array of diamonds, sapphires, and emeralds, and realized they were too heavy and expensive for an unmarried girl. Instead. She had selected a single pearl on a delicate gold chain. This is all you require, Holly said, fastening the chain around Elizabeth's neck. Keep your appearance simple and unspoiled, and save the extravagant jewels for when you're as old as I am. Elizabeth stared at their shared reflections in the dressing table mirror. You make it sound as though you're decrepit, she said with a laugh, and you look so beautiful tonight. Thank you, Lizzie. Holly gave the girl's shoulders a squeeze and turned to glance at Paula fondly. As long as we are spreading compliments, Mrs. Bronson, I must say that you look magnificent this evening. Paula, who was dressed in a forest green gown adorned with sparkling beadwork at the neck and sleeves, nodded and smiled tensely. It was clear that there were a thousand things she would rather be doing than attend a formal ball. I'm not certain I can manage this," Elizabeth said nervously, standing before the mirror. "I'm a wreck. I'm going to make some terrible faux pas that everyone will talk about. Please, Lady Holly, let's forget about going anywhere tonight and try again some other time after I've had more lessons. The more balls and parties and soirees you attend, the easier it will become," Holly replied firmly. "No one will ask me to dance. They all know what I am." An illegitimate nobody. Oh, damn my brother for doing this to me! I'm going to be a wallflower tonight. I don't belong in a ball gown. I should be somewhere peeling potatoes or sweeping a street walkway. You're lovely, Holly said, hugging the girl while Elizabeth continued to stare at her own alarmed reflection. You're lovely, Lizzie, and you have very good manners, and your family is quite wealthy. Believe me. You won't be a wallflower, and not a single man who views you tonight will think you should be peeling potatoes. It took a great deal of persuasion and stubborn insistence to force both of the Bronson women from the room. Somehow, Holly managed to bring them down the grand staircase. As they descended, Holly took particular pride in Elizabeth's outward appearance of poise, despite the fact that the girl was quaking with nerves on the inside. Bronson awaited them in the entrance hall, his black hair gleaming in the abundant light shed by the chandeliers and the silver coffered ceiling. Although there was not a man alive whose appearance wasn't improved by the traditional formal scheme of black and white evening wear, it did Zachary Bronson particular justice. His severely simple black coat had been tailored according to the latest fashion, the collar low, the sleeves close fitting. The lapels extending nearly to the waist, on Zachary's towering form, with his expansive shoulders and lean waist, the style was immensely flattering. His narrow white cravat and crisp white waistcoat looked snowy in contrast to his swarthy, freshly shaved face. From his neatly brushed dark hair to the tips of his polished black leather shoes, Zachary Bronson appeared to be a perfect gentleman. Yet there was something a bit dashing, even dangerous about him. Perhaps it was the irreverent gleam in his black eyes, or the raffish quality of his smile. His gaze went first to Elizabeth, and his smile was filled with affectionate pride. "What a sight you are, Lizzie," he murmured, 
taking his sister's hand and brushing a kiss on her blushing cheek. You're prettier than I've ever seen you. You'll come away from the ball leaving a trail of broken hearts in your wake. More likely a trail of broken toes, Elizabeth replied dryly. That is, if anyone is foolish enough to ask me to dance. They'll ask, he murmured, and gave her waist a reassuring squeeze. He turned to his mother and complimented her, before finally turning to Holly. After all the rigorous instruction in courtesy she had given him, Holly expected a polite comment on her appearance. A gentleman should always offer some small tribute to a lady in these circumstances, and Holly knew that she looked her best. She had dressed in her favourite gown, a glimmering silk of light grey, with silver beadwork adorning the low scooped bodice and the short, full sleeves. A bit of light feather padding kept the sleeves puffed out, and the gown's skirt was supported beneath with a stiffly starched petticoat. Holly had even allowed the dressmaker to persuade her to wear a light corset that trimmed her waist almost two inches. Maud had helped to arrange her hair in the latest fashion, parting it in the center and pulling the heavy mass to the back of her head. They had pinned the gleaming brown locks into rolls and curls, allowing two or three stray tendrils to dangle against her neck. Smiling slightly, Holly stared into Bronson's expressionless face as he surveyed her from head to toe. However, the expected gentlemanly compliment was not forthcoming. Is that what you're going to wear? he asked abruptly. Sack! his mother gasped in horrified disapproval, while Elizabeth jabbed him in the side in response to the rude inquiry. A disconcerted frown drew Holly's brows together, and she felt a sharp stab of disappointment, coupled with annoyance. The rude, insolent boor. She had never received a derogatory comment on her appearance from a man before. She had always prided herself on her sense of style. How dare he imply that she was wearing something unsuitable? We are going to a ball, Holly replied coolly, and this is a ball gown. Yes, Mr. Bronson, this is what I intend to wear. Their gazes locked in a long, challenging stare, so clearly excluding the other two that Paula pulled Elizabeth to the other side of the hall on the pretext of discovering a stain on her glove. Holly was barely aware of the women drifting away. She spoke in a clipped tone that fully conveyed her displeasure. What precisely is your objection to my appearance, Mr. Bronson? Nothing, he muttered. If you want to show the world you're still in mourning for George, that gown is perfect. Offended and strangely hurt, Holly sent him an outright glare. My gown is quite suitable for the occasion. The only thing you don't like about it is that it is not one of the ones you purchased for me. Did you really expect me to wear one of those? Considering it was your only alternative to wearing mourning, or half mourning, whatever the hell it's called, I thought it was a possibility. They had never argued like this, not in deadly earnest, in a way that ignited Holly's long, dormant temper like a flame set to gunpowder. Whenever they debated an issue, the words were spiced with humour, teasing, even provocative meaning, but this was the first time that Holly had ever been truly angry with him. George would never have spoken to her in the blunt, brutal manner Bronson did. George had never criticised her, except in the gentlest of terms, and always with the kindest of intentions. In her flaring anger, Holly did not stop to wonder why she was comparing Bronson so closely with her husband, or how his opinion had come to hold such power over her emotions. This is not a morning gown, she said irritably. One would think you had never seen a grey gown before. Perhaps you've spent too much time in brothels to notice what ordinary women wear. Call it what you like, Bronson returned, his voice soft but stinging. I know morning when I see it. Well, if I choose to wear morning for the next fifty years, that's my concern and none of yours. His broad shoulders lifted in a careless shrug, a common gesture that he knew was bound to incense her further. No doubt many will admire you for walking around dressed like a crow. A crow? 
Holly repeated in outrage. But I've never been one to admire displays of excessive grief, especially public ones. There's some merit in keeping your feelings private. However, if you're so in need of sympathy from others... You insufferable swine, she hissed, more angry than she could ever remember being in her life. How dare he accuse her of using mourning merely as a way of gaining public sympathy for herself? How dare he imply that her grief for George was not sincere? Rage sent the blood rushing to her face until she was hot and crimson. She wanted to hit him, hurt him, but she saw that her anger pleased him for some unfathomable reason. The cool satisfaction in his black eyes was unmistakable. Just a few minutes ago, she had taken such pride in his gentlemanly appearance, but now she almost hated him. How could you know anything about mourning? she said, her voice unsteady. She could not bring herself to look at him as she spoke. You could never love someone the way I did, George. It's not in you to surrender any part of your heart. Perhaps you think that makes you superior. But I feel sorry for you. Unable to tolerate his presence a moment longer, she strode away rapidly, her stiffened petticoat batting at her legs. Ignoring Paula's and Elizabeth's worried, questioning voices, she churned up the stairs as quickly as her heavy skirts would allow, while her lungs worked like leaky bellows. Zachary stood exactly where she left him, stunned by the argument that seemed to have flared out of nowhere. He hadn't planned to start it, had even felt a surge of pleasure the first instant he had seen Holly, until he had realized that her dress was grey, grey like a shadow, a pall cast by George Taylor's ever-present memory. He had known at once that every moment of Holly's evening would be given over to regret that her husband was not with her, and Zachary would be damned if he would spend the next several hours trying to win her away from George's ghost. The silvery grey gown, pretty as it was, had taunted him like a banner before a bull. Why couldn't he have her for just one evening without her grief being wedged so insistently between them? And so he had spoken carelessly, perhaps even cruelly, too wrapped up in his own annoyance and disappointment to care about what he was saying. Zachary, what did you tell her? Paula demanded. Congratulations, came Elizabeth's sarcastic voice. Only you could ruin the evening for everyone in a mere thirty seconds, Zach. The few servants who had witnessed the scene suddenly busied themselves with meaningless, self-appointed tasks, clearly not wanting to fall victim to his evil temper. However, Zachary was no longer angry. The moment Holly left his side, he had been flooded with a strange, sick feeling. He analysed the sensation, unlike anything he had experienced before. Somehow, he felt worse at this moment than he had after the worst beating of his prize-fighting days. There was a huge block of ice in his stomach, the coldness spreading until it reached his fingers and toes. He was suddenly afraid he had made Holly hate him, that she would never smile at him or let him touch her again. I'll go up to her, Paula said, her tone motherly and calm. But first, I wish you would tell me what was said between you, Zachary. Don't, Zachary interrupted softly. He held up his hand in a swift, restraining gesture. I'll go to her. I'll tell her. Pausing, he realized that for the first time in his life, he was ashamed to face a woman. Hell, he said savagely. He, who had never cared for anyone's opinion of him, had been utterly cowed by the words of a small woman. It would have been far better if Holly had cursed him, thrown something, slapped him. That he could have survived, but the quiet contempt in her voice had devastated him. I just want to give her a minute or two to calm herself before I approach her. The way Lady Holly appeared, Elizabeth remarked sourly, it will take at least two or three days before she's ready to set eyes on you. Before Zachary could respond with an appropriately sarcastic rejoinder, Paula took her disgruntled daughter's arm and tugged her away toward the family parlour. Come, Lizzie, we'll both have a relaxing glass of wine. Heaven knows we both need it. Heaving a sigh, 
Elizabeth followed her, stomping away in her ball gown with all the grace of an infuriated eight-year-old. Were it not for his own turbulent emotions, Zachary would have smiled at the sight. He went to the library for a drink, stopped at the sideboard, and poured something from a decanter. Downing the stuff without even tasting it, he poured another. However, the spirits failed to warm his frozen insides. His mind sorted busily through a deluge of words, grasping for an apology that would make everything right again. He could tell Holly anything but the truth, that he was jealous of George Taylor, that he wanted her to stop mourning for her husband when it was clear that she had dedicated the rest of her life to his memory. Setting his glass down with a groan, Zachary forced himself to leave the library. His shoes felt as if they had been made with lead soles as he hoisted his feet up the grand staircase toward Holly's private rooms. Holly nearly stumbled in her eagerness to step over the threshold of her private apartments and close herself inside. Mindful of Rose, sleeping peacefully just two rooms away, she tried not to slam the door. She stood very still, with her arms tightly bunched around herself. Her mind rang with echoes of every word she had just exchanged with Zachary Bronson. The worst part was, he hadn't been entirely wrong— the grey gown had seemed exactly right for this occasion, for just the reason he had suggested. It was elegant and stylish, but not so very different from the circumspect half-mourning garments she had worn during the third year after George's death. No one could find fault with it, not even her own beleaguered conscience. She was more than a little afraid of fully rejoining the world without George, and this was her way of reminding everyone, including herself, of what she had once had. She didn't want to lose the last vestige of her past with George. There were already too many days that slipped by without her having thought of him. There were too many moments when she felt a heady attraction to another man, when she had once thought that only George could stir her senses. It was becoming terribly easy to make decisions for herself, on her own, without first considering what George would have wanted or approved of and that independence frightened her fully as much as it pleased her. Her actions of the past four months had proved that she was no longer the sheltered young matron or the virtuous, circumspect widow that family and friends had approved of. She was becoming another woman entirely. Stunned by the thought, Holly didn't notice her servant Maud's presence until she spoke. Milady, is something amiss? A Button loose or a trimming? No, nothing like that. Holly took a deep breath, and then another, anchoring her roiling emotions. It appears that my grey gown displeases Mr. Bronson, she informed the servant. He wants me to wear something that looks less like mourning. He? Dared? Maud began in astonishment. Yes, he dared, Holly said dryly. Milady, you're not going to oblige him, are you? Holly stripped off her gloves, threw them to the floor, and kicked off her silver slippers. Her heart was pounding with the remnants of fury, and a nerve-rattling excitement like nothing she had ever felt before. I'm going to make his eyes fall out, she said curtly. I'm going to make him sorry that he ever said one word about my attire. Maud stared at her strangely having never seen such an expression of feminine vengeance on Holly's face. Milady, she ventured cautiously, you don't seem quite yourself. Holly turned and went to the closed armoire, turning the small key in the door and opening it. She extracted the red gown and shook it briskly, giving it a quick airing. Hurry, Maud, she said, turning her back and indicating the row of buttons that needed to be unfastened. Help me out of this thing quickly. But, but... Maud was dazed. You want to wear that gown? I haven't had a chance to wear it properly and press the wrinkles. It seems to be in good condition, actually. Holly inspected the billows of glowing red silk in her arms. But I wouldn't care if it was one big ball of wrinkles. I'm going to wear the blasted thing. 
recognizing her determination, though clearly not approving, Maud sighed gustily and set to work on the back of the grey gown. When it became apparent that Holly's prim white chemise would peek out over the low-cut bodice of the red silk, Holly stripped off her top undergarment. You're going without your chemise? Maud gasped, thunderstruck. Although the servant had already seen her in every stage of undress, Holly blushed all over, until even her bare breasts were pink. I don't have any chemises cut low enough to fit beneath this. She struggled to pull the red gown over her torso, and Maud hastily moved to assist her. When the gown was finally fastened, and the red velvet sash was tied neatly at her waist, Holly went to the mahogany framed looking glass. The succession of three mirrored ovals joined together afforded a complete view of her appearance. Holly was startled by the sight of herself clad in such rich color, the red strikingly vivid against her white skin. She had never worn anything quite as bold as this for George, a style that displayed the snowy curves of her breasts and the top third of her back. Her skirts moved in a fluid, rippling mass with each step she took, with each breath she drew. She felt vulnerable and exposed, and at the same time strangely free and light. This was the kind of gun she had worn in all her forbidden daydreams, when she had longed to escape the dullness of her ordinary life. At the last ball I attended, she commented, studying her reflection, I saw ladies wearing gowns much more daring than this. Some of them were practically backless. This looks almost modest by comparison. Tisn't the style, milady, Maud replied flatly. Tis the color. Continuing to stare at herself in the mirror, Holly realized that the gown was too spectacular to require further ornamentation. She removed all her jewelry. The diamond bracelet George had given her upon the birth of their child, the glittering earbobs that had been a wedding present from her parents, and the sparkling clips that adorned her upswept hair. Everything except the simple gold band of her wedding ring. She handed the items to the maid. There's a flower arrangement in the upstairs family parlor, she said, and I believe it has some fresh red roses in it. Would you fetch me one, Maud? Maud paused before complying. Milady, she said quietly, I hardly recognize you. Holly's smile wavered, and she took a deep breath. Is that a good thing, or a bad thing, Maud? What would my husband have said if he had ever seen me like this? I think Master George would have loved to see you in that red gown, Maud replied thoughtfully. He was a man, after all. Chapter 11 Approaching Holly's door, Zachary knocked gingerly with two knuckles of his right hand. There was no sound or response from within. Sighing, he wondered if she might have already retired to bed. It was only to be expected that she would not want to see him tonight. Silently he berated himself, wondering why he hadn't been able to keep his own damned mouth shut. While he wasn't necessarily a ladies' man, he had a certain way with women, and he had known better than to make a negative comment about Holly's appearance. Now she was probably weeping by herself in a corner of her room, too hurt and furious to even consider attending. The door swung gently open, leaving Zachary's hand suspended in midair as he began to knock once more. Holly stood there, alone, wearing a gown that looked as if it were made of liquid flame. Zachary gripped the doorframe with his hand to keep from falling backward. His gaze travelled over her, greedily absorbing every detail. The way her white breasts were pushed together and upward by the red silk bodice, the delicate angle of her collarbone, the soft shape of her throat, so enticing that his mouth watered in response— the startlingly simple red gown was elegant but provocative, displaying just enough of Holly's pale skin to threaten his sanity. He had never seen a woman more vibrantly, unreasonably beautiful in his life. The ice in his stomach dissolved as he was filled with a raging inferno of desire. 
and like a glass vessel that had been exposed to a radical change in temperature, his self-control threatened to shatter. He stared into her velvety brown eyes. For once, he couldn't read her mood. She looked warm, utterly inviting, but when she spoke, her voice was crisp. Does this meet with your approval, Mr. Bronson? Unable to speak, Zachary managed a single nod. She was still angry with him, he thought numbly. Just why she had put on the red gown was a mystery. Perhaps she had somehow guessed that it was the worst possible punishment she could devise. He wanted her so badly that it hurt. A physical pain he felt everywhere in his body, and in one area especially. He longed to touch her, put his hands and mouth on her soft skin, bury his nose in the little valley between her breasts. If only he could take her to bed this very moment. If only she would let him worship her, pleasure her the way he longed to. Holly's gaze swept over him in feminine assessment, lingering on his face. Come in, please, she said, gesturing for him to enter the room. Your hair is disheveled. I'll repair it before we leave. Zachary obeyed slowly. She had never invited him inside her room before. He knew it wasn't right, wasn't proper, but somehow the evening had become topsy-turvy. As he followed her trim, silk-covered form into the perfume-scented room, his brain rekindled sufficiently for him to remember his apology. Lady Holly, he began, his voice cracking. He cleared his throat and tried again. What I said to you downstairs, I shouldn't have. I regret... Indeed, you should regret it, Holly assured him, her voice tart but no longer outraged. You were arrogant and presumptuous, though I don't know why I should have been surprised by such behavior coming from you. Usually Zachary would have responded to such an admonition with a playful retort. Now, however, he agreed with a humble nod. The sound of her skirt swishing, the movement of her legs beneath the masses of silk, filled his mind with a hot, intoxicating fog. Sit there, please, Holly said, gesturing to a tiny chair next to her dressing table. She picked up a silver-backed brush. You're too tall for me when you stand. He complied immediately, although the spindly little chair wobbled and creaked under his weight. Unfortunately, his line of vision was now perfectly level with her breasts. He closed his eyes to keep from staring at the lush mounds, but nothing would still the writhing images in his head. It would be so easy to reach out and catch her body in his hands and bury his face between her soft breasts. He began to perspire profusely. He was in a fever, burning for her. When she spoke, the sweet sound of her voice seemed to collect at the back of his neck and in his groin. I regret something as well, Holly said quietly. What I told you, that you were unable to love, I was wrong. I only said it because I was upset. I have no doubt that someday you will indeed lose your heart to someone, although I can't imagine to whom. You he thought with an inescapable stab of longing. You! Couldn't she see it? Or did she assume she was merely the target of his random lust, and no more special to him than any other woman? In the taut silence, Zachary opened his eyes and watched as Holly picked up a glass bottle and shook a few drops of some clear liquid into her palm. What is that? he asked. Pomade. I don't like pomade, he muttered. Yes, I'm aware of that. There was a touch of amusement in her voice. She rubbed her hands together, distributing the stuff evenly over her fingers and palms. I'll only use a bit, but you can't go to a formal occasion with your hair falling over your forehead. Resigned, he sat still beneath her ministrations. He felt her damp fingers moving through his hair, gently rubbing the hot scalp beneath smoothing the pomade through his rebellious black locks. Everyone in your family has the same hair, Holly commented, a smile lingering in her voice. It has a will of its own. We had to use two entire racks of pins to make Elizabeth's hair behave. Racked with pleasure and exquisite tension, Zachary couldn't reply. The feel of her hands on his head, 
the soft massage of her fingertips was nothing less than torture. She combed his hair neatly, guiding it back from his forehead, and by some miracle it stayed in place. There, Holly said in satisfaction. Very gentlemanly indeed. Did you ever do this for him? Zachary heard himself ask hoarsely. For George. Holly went still. When their gazes met, he saw the surprise in her warm brown eyes. Then she smiled faintly. Well, no. I don't believe George ever had a hair out of place. Of course, Zachary thought. Among George Taylor's many other perfections, he'd had gentlemanly hair as well. Forcing his aching, stiff body to move, he stood and made certain his coat was buttoned to conceal the evidence of his arousal. He waited while Holly washed the traces of pomade from her hands and donned a pair of long, blinding white gloves that extended past her elbows. Such lovely elbows she had. Not knobby or pointy at all, just a bit plump, perfect for nibbling. He wondered if this was what married men did if they were allowed to watch their wives' last preparations before going out for the evening. The scene felt cosy and intimate, and it made him hollow with yearning. Suddenly he heard a gasp. Glancing in the direction of the sound, Zachary saw Holly's blonde maid standing in the open doorway, her blue eyes as large and round as dinner plates. A lush red rose fell from her nerveless grasp onto the carpeted floor. Oh, I didn't... Come in, Maud, Holly said calmly, as if Zachary's presence in her room were an everyday occurrence. Recovering herself, the maid scooped up the fallen rose and brought it to her mistress. They conferred for a moment, and then the maid deftly pinned the fragrant blossom amid Holly's gleaming dark curls. Satisfied with the results, Holly glanced into the looking glass, touched the rose lightly, then turned toward Zachary. Shall we go, Mr. Bronson? He was both sorry and relieved to escort her from the room. It was a continuing struggle to master his raging desires, especially with her gloved hand tucked neatly in his arm and the damned teasing swishing of her silk skirts around his legs. She was not an accomplished temptress, and he was well aware that her experience with men was limited. But he wanted her more than he had ever wanted a woman. If having her were a mere question of money he would have purchased entire countries for her. Unfortunately, matters were not that simple. He could never offer her the genteel life she deserved and needed, the kind of life she'd had with George. If by some miracle she ever did accept him, Zachary knew that he would disappoint her time and again, until she finally grew to hate him. She would discover all the coarseness of his nature. She would find him increasingly repellent, she would find excuses to keep him from coming to her bed. No matter how well the union might begin, it would end in disaster. Because, as his mother had correctly pointed out, one did not mate a thoroughbred with a donkey. Better to leave her alone and fix his attentions on some other, far more appropriate woman. If only he could. Stopping Holly midway down the grand staircase... Zachary descended two steps without her and turned so their faces were level. My lady, he said seriously, the things I said about your morning gowns, I'm sorry. I had no right to make such comments. He paused with a hard, uncomfortable swallow. Am I forgiven? Holly studied him with a faint smile. Not yet. Her gaze was teasing, almost flirtatious, and Zachary realized with a sudden rush of delight that she enjoyed having the upper hand over him. She was so pert and adorable that it took all his power not to snatch her in his arms and kiss her senseless. Then what will you have me do? He asked softly, and for the most delicious moment of his life they stood smiling at each other. I'll let you know when I think of something, Mr. Bronson. She walked down to his step and took his arm once more. Only to herself would Holly admit that she was surprised by the amount of eager attention her protégés were receiving at the Plymouth Ball. She was thrilled by their success 
and especially by the fact that they seemed to mix easily with the crowd. It seemed that her social instructions had made them more comfortable in their interactions with the Tom, and the Tom was appropriately impressed. That Mr. Bronson, she overheard one dowager saying to another, seems to have improved somewhat. He is rising in the world, but I had not thought until tonight that his manners could keep pace with his advancement. Surely you don't mean to say you would consider him for your daughter, came her companion's astonished reply. I mean, he is quite common, after all. Indeed I would, came the emphatic reply. He has clearly taken it upon himself to study polite accomplishments, and the results are rather pleasing. And although the man may be a bit common, his fortune is quite uncommon. True, true, the other dowager agreed distractedly, as they stared at Bronson's distant figure from behind their fans, like soldiers sighting a military target. While Bronson mingled among the crowd, Polly kept company with Elizabeth and Paula. Even before the dancing had begun, Elizabeth had been introduced to at least a dozen young men, all of whom apparently found her sufficiently dazzling to merit their notice. Her dance card, tucked into a paper-thin silver case that tied around her gloved wrist with a pink ribbon, would have been completely filled, except that Holly had cautioned her to reserve a few. "'You'll want to rest every now and again,' Holly had murmured into the girl's ear. "'And besides, you might encounter a gentleman that you will want to save an extra dance for.' Elizabeth had nodded obediently, appearing a bit dazed by the scene. Lord and Lady Plymouth's cavernous drawing-room accommodated at least three hundred guests, with a good two hundred more milling in the surrounding circuit of rooms and galleries. The home was called Plymouth Court, as it was constructed around a spectacular stone and marble courtyard filled with fruit trees and exotic flowers. It was an old, settled residence, formerly a defensive castle, that had progressively been expanded during the last century into a large and luxurious home. In the drawing-room, pools of abundant light from the overhead chandeliers and the open fire in the great marble hearth combined to reflect off the apricot-painted walls. The crowd was bathed in a glow that caused a king's ransom worth of jewellery to sparkle madly. Dowagers and nervous young girls sat on gilt-framed furniture covered with figured silk upholstery, while groups of friends stood together against a backdrop of faded but priceless Flemish tapestries. Holly's nose tingled pleasantly with the familiar, unique smell of a ball. It was a mixture of scents, predominantly the tang of the waxed and milk-washed dance floor and the perfume of flowers, mixed with traces of cologne, sweat, pomade, and lit beeswax candles. During her three years' absence from all social events, she had forgotten this smell, but it brought back a hundred pleasant memories of herself and George. It all seems unreal, Elizabeth whispered, after another gentleman had introduced himself and requested a place on her dance card. The ball is so beautiful, and everyone is being so nice to me. I can't believe how many destitute young men want to put their hands on a share of Zack's fortune. Do you think that's the reason they all want to dance and flirt with you? Holly asked with a fond smile. Because of your brother's money? Of course. Some of the gentlemen that have approached you are hardly destitute, Holly informed her. Lord Woolwich, for example, or that nice Mr. Barkham. They both come from families of considerable means. But then why have they asked me to dance? Elizabeth muttered, clearly perplexed. Perhaps because you're pretty and intelligent and spirited, Holly suggested, and laughed as the girl rolled her eyes in disbelief. Another man approached, this time someone familiar. It was Holly's cousin, Mr. Jason Summers, the architect that visited Zachary Weekly to consult about plans and materials for the planned country estate. During these visits, Elizabeth often attended the meetings to give her unsolicited opinions regarding Summer's work, and he always responded with appropriate sarcasm. Holly had been privately amused by the encounters, suspecting that the pair's bickering concealed an underlying attraction. 
she wondered if Bronson had arrived at the same conclusion, but she had not yet mentioned the subject to him. Although Bronson appeared to have respect and appreciation for Summer's architectural talents, he had not yet expressed any opinions on the young man's character. Was Jason Summers the kind of man Bronson would welcome as a brother-in-law? Holly couldn't see why not. Jason was handsome, talented, and from a good family. However, he was a professional man and not possessed of a great fortune, yet. It would take time and many sizable commissions before he gained the wealth that a man of his gifts deserved. Jason greeted Holly, Paula, and Elizabeth with a courtly bow, but his gaze lingered on Elizabeth's suddenly flushed face. He was strikingly handsome in his black dress coat, his lanky form elegant in the crisp evening clothes, his chestnut hair gleaming with brown and gold lights beneath the bright chandeliers. Although his alert green eyes gave nothing away, Holly noted the faint tide of colour that touched the crests of his cheeks and the bridge of his nose as he stared at Elizabeth. He was fascinated by the girl, Holly thought, and she glanced at Paula to see if she, too, had noticed. Paula returned the glance with a faint smile. "'Miss Bronson,' Jason said to Elizabeth with extreme casualness, "'are you enjoying the evening so far?' Elizabeth fiddled with the silver dance card and made a show of adjusting the ribbon around her wrist. "'Very much, Mr. Summers.' Staring at Elizabeth's down-bent head, with all the silky dark curls confined with pins, Jason spoke a bit gruffly. "'I thought I should approach you before every place on your dance card was filled. Or is it already too late?' Hmm. Let me see.' Elizabeth flipped back the silver lid and consulted the tiny pages, deliberately drawing out the moment. Holly bit back a smile, knowing that Elizabeth had followed her advice and saved a few spaces for just an occasion such as this. "'I suppose I could squeeze you in somewhere,' Elizabeth said, pursing her lips thoughtfully. "'The second waltz, perhaps?' "'The second waltz it is,' he said. I'll be interested to discover if your dancing skills are more advanced than your architectural taste. Elizabeth responded to the little jab by turning to Holly and adopting a look of round-eyed puzzlement. Is that an example of witty repartee, my lady? she asked. Or is he by chance saving that for later? I believe, Holly said with a soft laugh, that Mr. Summers is attempting to provoke you. Really? Elizabeth turned back to Jason. Does that technique usually attract many girls, Mr. Summers? I'm not trying to attract all that many, he said with a sudden grin. Only one, in fact. Smiling, Holly watched as Elizabeth clearly wondered if she was the one he wished to attract. Jason turned to Paula and inquired if he might procure her some refreshment. When Paula refused with a shy smile, Jason looked back at Elizabeth. Miss Bronson, may I escort you to the refreshment table for a cup of punch before the dancing begins? Elizabeth nodded, a pulse beating visibly in her throat as she took his arm. As the pair walked away, Holly thought that they were an exceedingly well-matched pair, both of them attractive, tall and slim. It was possible that Jason with all his youthful energy and self-confident manliness, was the perfect foil for Elizabeth. The girl needed to be courted and charmed and swept off her feet. She needed someone to banish the streak of cynicism and self-doubt that kept her from feeling worthy of a man's love. Look at them, Holly murmured to Paula. A handsome pair, are they not? Paula managed to look both worried and hopeful at the same time. My lady... Do you think a man as fine as that would ever want to marry a girl like Lizzie? I would hope, expect that any man of good sense would want someone as special as Elizabeth. And my cousin is no fool. Lady Plymouth, a heavy-set, cheerful woman with a florid complexion, approached them with a delighted exclamation. My dear Mrs. Bronson, she said, taking Paula's hands in her plump ones and pressing warmly. 
I have no wish to rob Lady Holland of your company, but I simply must steal you away for a little while. I have some friends I would like to introduce you to. And then, of course, we must visit the refreshment table. These events become so fatiguing unless one has sufficient sustenance. Lady Holland, Paula said, helplessly looking back over her shoulder as she was dragged away. If you don't mind, go on, Holly urged with a smile. I'll watch over Elizabeth when she returns. She felt a rush of gratitude toward Lady Plymouth, having privately asked her to introduce Paula to a few ladies who would be most likely to receive her. Mrs. Bronson is quite shy, Holly had confided to Lady Plymouth, but she is the most pleasant-natured lady in the world, full of common sense and goodwill. If only you might take her under your wing and show her around. Her appeal had apparently touched Lady Plymouth's kind heart. Also, Lady Plymouth was hardly averse to receiving the gratitude of a man like Zachary Bronson for being kind to his mother. Seeing that Holly was unescorted, at least three men rapidly headed toward her from different parts of the room. It was not lost on Holly that her wine-red gown was attracting more attention than she had ever received in her life. No, thank you, she said repeatedly, as she was beset with requests for various dances. She displayed her gloved wrist and its lack of a dance card. I'm not dancing this evening. Thank you so much for asking. I'm truly honoured, but no. The men did not leave, however, no matter how firmly she refused. Two more appeared, bearing cups of punch to assuage her thirst, and another came with a plate of tiny sandwiches to tempt her appetite. Their efforts to capture her interest escalated rapidly, men elbowing and jostling each other in an effort to stand closer to her. Holly's surprise at the flood of attention became tempered with a bit of alarm. She had never been so besieged. When she had been a young, white-gowned girl, her chaperones had carefully supervised all interactions with males, and as a married matron she had been protected by her husband. But her appearance in the red gown, and no doubt the rumours and insinuations about her presence in the Bronson household, had combined to attract a great deal of masculine interest. Only one man could have cut through the mob. All of a sudden, Zachary Bronson shouldered his way into the tightly packed crowd, looking impossibly large and dark, and a bit irate. It was only now, when she saw Bronson standing amid so many other men, that Holly realised how he was able to intimidate them all by sheer virtue of his size— she felt an inappropriate but delicious thrill as he took her arm possessively and glared at the horde around them. "'My lady,' he said brusquely, his cold gaze continuing to survey the group, "'may I have a word with you?' "'Yes, certainly.' Holly gave a sigh of relief as he drew her aside to a relatively private corner. "'Jackals,' Bronson muttered. "'And people say I'm not a gentleman.' At least I don't pant and slobber over a woman in public. I'm sure you're exaggerating, Mr. Bronson. I hardly saw anyone slobbering. And the way that bastard Harrowby was staring at you, Bronson continued irritably. I think he sprained his damn neck trying to get a look down the front of your dress. Your language, Mr. Bronson, Holly said tartly, though inside she felt a bubbling of laughter. Was it possible he was jealous? She knew she should not be pleased by such a thought. And I needn't remind you that my choice of attire is entirely your fault. The musicians in the upstairs bower began to play, the bright, lively music filling the air. The dancing will begin soon, Holly said, adopting a businesslike air. Have you been writing your name on various young ladies' dance cards? Not yet. Well, you must apply yourself to it at once. I will suggest a few that are well worth approaching. Miss Eugenia Clayton, for one, and by all means Lady Jane Kirkby. And that girl over there, Lady Georgiana Brenton. She's the daughter of a duke. Do I need a third party to make the introductions? Bronson asked. At a public ball, yes. However, this is a private ball, and the fact that you were invited is sufficient testament to your respectability. 
remember to make conversation that is neither too serious nor trivial. Talk about art, for example, or your favourite periodicals. I don't read periodicals. Then discuss prominent people whom you admire, or social trends you find interesting. Oh, you know very well how to make small talk. You do it with me all the time. That's different, Bronson muttered. Staring with barely concealed alarm at the flocks of white-gowned virgins that filled the room, you're a woman. Holly laughed suddenly. And what are all those creatures if not women? I'll be damned if I know. Do not swear, she said, and do not say anything indelicate to one of those girls. Now go dance with someone, and bear in mind that a true gentleman would approach one of the poor girls sitting in the chairs against the wall. Instead of heading for the most popular ones, staring at the row of disconsolate wallflowers, Zachary heaved a sigh. He couldn't fathom why it had once seemed like a good idea to marry some unformed fledgling and mould her to his liking. He had wanted a trophy, an upper-class broodmare to lend some prestige to his common bloodline, but the idea of spending the rest of his life with one of these well-bred girls. Seemed appallingly dull. They all look the same, he muttered. Well, they're not, Holly reproved. I remember full well how it felt to be cast out into the marriage market, and it's terrifying. I had no idea what kind of husband I might end up with. She paused and touched his arm lightly. There, do you see that girl seated at the end of the row, the attractive one with the brown hair and the blue trim on her gown? She is Miss Alice Warner. I am well acquainted with the family. If she is anything at all like her older sisters, she will be a delightful partner. Then why is she sitting alone? He asked darkly. She is one of a half dozen daughters, and the family can offer practically nothing in the way of a dowry. That is off-putting to many enterprising young men, but it won't matter to you. Holly gave him a quick, subtle push in the back. Go ask her to dance. He resisted her prodding. What will you be doing? I see your sister being escorted to the refreshment room, where I believe your mother is heading as well. Perhaps I'll join them there. Now go. He gave her an ironic glance and went off like a reluctant cat being prodded to hunt. When it became apparent that Holly was unattended once again, several men started toward her. Realizing she was about to be mobbed once more, Holly decided instantly on a strategic retreat. Pretending not to see any of the gentlemen who were headed in her direction, she sailed toward the entrance of the drawing room, hoping to find refuge in one of the surrounding galleries and parlors. She was too intent on her escape to notice the large shape that crossed her path. Suddenly, she walked directly into a man's solid body. A surprised gasp escaped her. A pair of gloved hands caught her elbows, restoring her uncertain balance. "I'm so sorry," Holly said in a rush, glancing up at the man before her. "I was in a bit of a rush. Forgive me. I should have been." But her voice faded into stunned silence as she realized whom she had walked into. "Varden," she whispered. The very sight of Varden, Lord Ravenhill. Caused memories to come over her in a heady rush. For a moment, her throat tightened too much to allow speech or breath. It had been three years since she had seen him, not since the funeral. He looked older, more serious, and there were lines at the corners of his eyes that had not been there before. Yet he looked more handsome, if possible, maturity lending him a look of ruggedness that saved him from what might have otherwise been bland attractiveness. His wheat blond hair was cut the same, and his grey eyes were just as she remembered, so cool and incisive, until he smiled. Then his gaze was warm and silvery. Lady Holland, he said quietly. A thousand memories bound them together. How many lazy summer afternoons had the three of them spent together? How many parties and musical evenings had they attended at the same time? Holly remembered how she and George had laughingly offered advice to Varden on what sort of girl he should marry. 
or George and Barden attending boxing matches, then coming home as drunk as parents, or the grim evening when she had broken the news to Varden that George had contracted typhoid fever. Varden had been a steady support for Holly all through his friend's illness and eventual death. The two men had been as close as brothers, and in that light Holly had regarded Varden as a member of the family. Now, seeing Varden like this, after he had been absent from her life for so long, brought back a sweet, intoxicating sense of what it had been like when George was still alive. Holly half expected to see George trailing after him with a ready joke and a merry smile. But George was not there, of course. Only she and Varden were left. The only reason I came here tonight is because Lady Plymouth told me that you would be attending, Ravenhill said quietly. It's been so long, I... Holly broke off, her mind blank as she filled her gaze with him. She longed to talk to him about George and about what had transpired for both of them during the past years. Ravenhill smiled, his white teeth gleaming in his golden face. Come with me. Her hand slipped naturally into his arm, and she went without thinking, feeling as if she had stepped into the middle of a dream. Wordlessly, Ravenhill led her from the ballroom and through the entrance hall to a long row of French doors. He guided her through the doors and out into the house's central courtyard, where the air was heady with the scent of fruit and flowers. Outside lamps adorned with festoons of lacy wrought iron shed light over the abundant greenery and illuminated the sky above until it resembled the exact colour of black plums. Seeking a measure of privacy, they walked to the edge of the courtyard, which opened onto a great formal garden at the back of the house. They found a circle of small stone benches, half concealed by a row of hedges, and they sat together. Holly stared into Ravenhill's shadowed face with a tremulous smile. She sensed that he felt the same way she did, awkward but eager, two old friends anxious to renew their acquaintance. He looked so dear, so familiar, that she experienced a strong urge to hug him, but something held her back. His expression contained some secret knowledge that seemed to cause him discomfort, uneasiness, shame. He started to reach for her gloved hand, then drew back, resting his palms on his spread knees instead. Holland, he murmured, his gaze sweeping over her. You're more beautiful than I've ever seen you. She studied Ravenhill as well, struck by how much older he seemed, his golden handsomeness tempered by a bitter awareness of the grief that life sometimes held in store for the unsuspecting. He seemed to have lost the supreme self-assurance that had come with his privileged upbringing, and strangely he was all the more attractive for it. How is Rose? he asked softly. Happy? Beautiful, bright. Oh, Varden, how I wish George could see her. Ravenhill seemed unable to reply, staring hard at some distant point of the garden. His throat must have pained him, for he swallowed several times. Varden, Holly asked after a long silence, do you still think of George often? He nodded, his smile edged with self-mockery. Time hasn't helped nearly as much as everyone assured me it would. Yes, I think about him too damn often. Until he died, I'd never lost anyone or anything that mattered to me. Holly understood that all too well. For her as well, life had been almost magically perfect. As a young woman, she had been untouched by loss or pain, and she had been so certain that things would always be wonderful. In her immaturity... It had never occurred to her that someone she loved could be taken away from her. Since boyhood, everyone thought of George as a prankster, and I was the responsible one, Ravenhill said. But that was only the appearance of things. In truth, George was the anchor. He had the deepest sense of honour, the greatest integrity that I've ever known. My own father was a drunkard and a hypocrite. And you know that I don't think much better of my brothers. 
and the friends I made at school were nothing but dandies and wastrels. George was the only man I've ever truly admired. Filled with a wistful ache, Holly reached for his hand and squeezed it hard. Yes, she whispered with a smile of tender pride. He was a fine man. After he passed away, Ravenhill said, I nearly went to pieces. I would have done anything to dull the pain, but nothing worked. His mouth twisted in self-disgust. I started drinking and drinking. I became an unholy mess, and I went away to the continent to spend some time alone and clear my head. Instead, I did even worse things, things I'd never imagined myself doing before. If you had seen me at any time during the past three years, Holland, you wouldn't have recognized me. And the longer I stayed away, the more ashamed I was to face you. I abandoned you. After I had promised George, suddenly... Holly's gloved fingertips touched his lips lightly, stilling the flow of wretched words. There was nothing you could have done for me. I need a time alone to mourn. She stared at him compassionately, scarcely able to imagine him behaving in ways that were less than proper and honourable. Ravenhill had never been one to indulge in reckless behaviour. He had never been a drunkard or a skirt chaser, had never gambled or fought, or done anything to excess. She couldn't begin to understand what his activities had been during his long absence from England, but it didn't matter. It occurred to her that there must be many different ways of mourning. While she had turned inward in her sorrow, perhaps Ravenhill's grief over George had turned him a bit mad for a while. The important thing was that he was back home now, and she took great pleasure in seeing him again. Why haven't you come to visit me? she asked. I had no idea you had returned from the continent. Ravenhill flashed her a self-deprecating smile. So far, I haven't kept any of the promises I made to my best friend on his deathbed. And if I don't start to make good on them, I won't be able to live with myself any longer. I thought the best way to begin was to ask your forgiveness. There is nothing to forgive, she said simply. He smiled and shook his head at her answer. Still every inch a lady, aren't you? Perhaps not quite as much a lady as I once was, she replied with a note of irony. Ravenhill stared at her intently. Holland, I've heard that you are employed by Zachary Bronson. Yes, I am acting as a social instructor for Mr. Bronson and his delightful family. That is my fault. Ravenhill did not appear to receive the news with the same pleasure she took in imparting it. You would never have been driven to such lengths had I been here to fulfill my promises. No, Varden, Holly said hastily. It has truly been a rewarding experience. She fumbled for words, wondering how on earth she could explain her relationship with the Bronson family to him. I am better for knowing the Bronsons. They have helped me in ways I can't easily explain. You were never meant to work, Ravenhill pointed out quietly. You know what George would have thought. I am well aware of what George wanted for me, she agreed. But, Varden... There are things we have to discuss, Holland. Now isn't the time and place. But there is one thing I must ask you. The promise we gave George that day. Is it still something you would consider? At first... Holly could find no breath to answer. She had a dizzying sense of fate rolling over her in an irresistible tide, and with it came the strangest mixture of relief and dullness, as if all she had to do was accept a circumstance that she had no control over. Yes, she said softly, of course I would still consider it. But if you have no desire to be bound by it... I knew what I was doing then. His purposeful gaze held hers. I know what I want now. They sat together in a silence that required no words, while the ache of regret swirled around them. In their world, one did not seek happiness for its own sake, but received it, sometimes, as a reward for behaving honorably. 
Often doing one's duty brought pain and unhappiness, but one was ultimately sustained by the knowledge that he or she had lived with integrity. Then let us talk later, Holly eventually murmured. Call on me at the Bronsons' home if you wish. Shall I take you back to the ballroom? She shook her head hastily. If you wouldn't mind, please leave me here. I just want to sit alone and think quietly for a moment. Seeing the objections in his gaze, she gave him a coaxing smile. I promise, no one will accost me in your absence. I'm only a stone's throw from the house. Please, Varden. He nodded reluctantly and took her gloved hand, pressing a kiss to the back of it. When he had left her, Holly heaved a sigh and wondered why she was so confused and unhappy about fulfilling the last promise George had ever asked of her. Darling, she whispered, closing her eyes, you always knew what was right for me. I trust you now as much as I ever did, and I see the wisdom in what you asked of us. But if you could give me a sign that it is still what you want, I would gladly spend the rest of my life as you wished. I shouldn't see it as a sacrifice, I know, but... Her soulful ponderings were suddenly interrupted by an irate voice. What the hell are you doing out here? Being thoroughly a man, one whose nature was rooted in competition, Zachary had experienced jealousy before, but nothing like this. Not this mixture of rage and alarm that shredded his insides. He was no idiot. He had seen the way Holly was looking at Ravenhill in the ballroom, and he had understood it all too well. They were cut from the same cloth, and they shared a past that he'd had no part of. There were bonds between them, memories, and even more the comfort of knowing exactly what to expect from each other. All of a sudden, Zachary hated Ravenhill with an intensity that approached fear. Ravenhill was everything he was not, everything he could never be. If only this were a more primitive time, the period of history when simple brute force overrode all else, and a man could have what he wanted merely by staking his claim. That was how most of these damned blue bloods had originated, in fact. They were the watered-down, inbred descendants of warriors who had earned their status through battle and blood. Generations of privilege and ease had tamed them, softened and cultured them. Now these pampered aristocrats could afford to look down their noses at a man who probably resembled their revered ancestors more than they themselves did. That was his problem, Zachary realized. He had been born a few centuries too late. Instead of having to mince and prance his way into a society that was clearly too rarefied for him, he should have been able to dominate, fight, conquer. As Zachary had seen Holly leave the ballroom, her small hand tucked against Ravenhill's arm, it had required all his will to appear collected. He had nearly trembled with the urge to snatch Holly into his arms and carry her away like a barbarian. For a moment, the rational part of his brain had commanded him to let Holly go without a struggle. She had never been his to lose. Let her make the right decisions for herself— the comfortable decisions. Let her find the peace she deserved. The hell I will, he had thought savagely. He had followed the pair, intent as a prowling tiger, letting nothing stand in the way of what he wanted. And now he found Holly sitting here alone in the garden, looking dazed and dreamy, and he wanted to shake her until her hair cascaded loose and her teeth rattled. What's going on? he demanded. You're supposed to be smoothing the way for Lizzie and telling me which girls to dance with. And instead I find you in the garden making calf eyes at Ravenhill. I was not making calf eyes, Holly said indignantly. I was remembering things about George and... Oh, I should return to Elizabeth. Not yet. First, I want an explanation of what is going on between you and Ravenhill. Her small, pale face wore an expression of consternation. It's complicated. Use very small words, he suggested acidly, and I'll try to follow along. 
I'd rather discuss it later. Now. He caught her gloved elbows as she rose from the bench and glared into her moonlit face. There's no need to be upset. Holly gasped a little at the rough way he handled her. I'm not upset, I'm... Realizing he was holding her too tightly, Zachary let go of her abruptly. Tell me what you and Ravenhill were talking about, damn it! Although his grip couldn't possibly have hurt her, Holly cupped her hands around her elbows and rubbed them gently. Well, it concerns a promise that I made long before you and I met. Go on, he muttered as she paused. On the day George died, he expressed his fear over what was going to happen to Rose and me. He knew he wasn't leaving us very much to live on, and although his family reassured him that they would take care of us, he was terribly troubled. Nothing I said would comfort him. He kept whispering that Rose needed a father to protect her, and that I... Oh, dear. Shivering at the bleak memory, Holly sat on the bench once more, and blinked hard against the rising pressure of tears. Ducking her head, she used the tips of her gloves to blot the rivulets that leaked from her eyes. Zachary swore and rummaged through the innumerable inside pockets of his coat for a handkerchief. He found his pocket watch, his extra pair of gloves, wads of money, a gold tobacco case and a small pencil, but the handkerchief proved elusive. Holly must have realized what he was searching for, as she suddenly choked on a watery giggle. I told you to bring a handkerchief, she said. I don't know where I put the damn thing. He gave her one of his extra gloves. Here, use this. She dabbed at her wet cheeks and nose, then held the object tightly in her hand. Although she hadn't invited him to sit beside her, Zachary straddled the bench and faced her, staring at her down-bent head. Go on he said gruffly. Tell me what George said. Holly sighed deeply. He was afraid of what would happen to me, that without a husband I would be lonely, that I needed a man's guidance and affection. He was afraid I would make ill-advised decisions and that others would take advantage of me. And so he asked for Varden, uh, Ravenhill. He trusted Ravenhill more than anyone in the world, and had faith in his judgment and sense of honour. Although Ravenhill might seem a bit cold on the surface, he is a kind man, and very fair and generous. Enough about the wonders of Ravenhill. Renewed jealousy fermented inside him. Just tell me what George wanted. He... Holly took a deep breath and exhaled sharply, as if it were difficult to force the words out. He... Asked us to marry each other after he was gone. A scalding silence ensued, while Zachary wondered wildly if he had heard correctly. Holly refused to look at him. I didn't want to be thrust upon Ravenhill as an unwanted obligation, she finally whispered. But he assured me that the match was sensible and much desired on his side, that it would serve to honour George's memory and at the same time secure a good future for all three of us, me, Rose, and himself. I've never heard of such a damned foolish arrangement, Zachary growled, rapidly revising his opinion of George Taylor. Obviously you both recovered your senses and broke off the agreement, and a good thing too. Well, we haven't exactly broken it off. What? Unable to stop himself, Zachary grasped her jaw in one hand and forced it upward, revealing her face. Her tears had dried, leaving her cheeks moist and flushed and her eyes glittering. What do you mean you haven't broken it off? Don't tell me you have some idiotic notion of actually going through with it. Mr. Bronson! Holly squirmed away from him uncomfortably, seeming surprised by his reaction to the news. She handed back his wet glove which he shoved into a pocket. Let us return to the ball, and we'll discuss this matter at a more appropriate time. Damn the ball! We'll talk about this right now! Don't raise your voice to me, Mr. Bronson. Standing, she shook out her glimmering red skirts and adjusted her bodice. The moonlight played over the pearly skin of her bosom, 
and sent coy shadows chasing down the lush valley between her breasts. She was so beautiful and infuriating that Zachary had to clench his hands to keep from grabbing her. He rose to his feet, swinging one long leg over the bench in an easy move. He had never been angry and aroused at the same time before. It was a novel sensation, and not a pleasant one. Apparently, Ravenhill didn't want the match as much as he indicated, he pointed out in a low, grating voice. It's been three deuced years since George died, and there's been no wedding. I'd say that's a damn clear sign of unwillingness. I thought so too, Holly confessed, rubbing her temples. But when I spoke with him tonight, Varden said that it has taken him a long time to sort out things in his mind, and he still wants to honor George's wishes. No doubt he does, Zachary snapped, after having a look at you in that red dress. Holly's eyes widened, and her cheeks colored with annoyance. I take offense at that remark. Varden is not at all that kind of man, isn't he? Zachary felt his face pulling into a ferocious sneer. You have my guarantee, milady, that every man in that ballroom, including Ravenhill, would be damned happy to get under your skirts. Honor has nothing to do with what he wants from you. Horrified by his crudity, Holly skittered to the other side of the bench and glowered at him. Her gloved fingers twitched as if she were tempted to slap him. Is it Ravenhill we're speaking of, or you? Suddenly realizing what she had said, she clapped her hand over her mouth and stared at him speechlessly. Now we're getting somewhere. He started after her in a slow, deliberate stride. Yes, Lady Holly. By now it's no great secret that I want you. I desire you. I understand you. Hell, I even like you, which is something I've never said to a woman before. Clearly alarmed, Holly turned and fled down a path leading through the garden, not toward the house, but deeper toward the darkened lower lawns, where there was little chance of being seen or overheard. Good, Zachary thought in primitive satisfaction, abandoning all rationality. He followed her with no great haste, his long strides easily keeping pace with her short, frantic ones. You don't understand me at all, Holly said over her shoulder, her breath coming in rapid bursts. You don't know a thing about what I need or want. I know you a thousand times better than Ravenhill ever will. She gave a disbelieving laugh, speeding through the entrance to a sculpture garden. I've known Varden for years, Mr. Bronson, whereas you and I have been acquainted for a matter of four and a half months. What could you possibly claim to know about me that he doesn't? For one thing, you're the kind of woman who would kiss a stranger at a ball. Twice. Holly stopped dead in her tracks, her small body as straight and stiff as a ramrod. Oh, he heard her say softly. Zachary came up behind her and stopped, waiting for her to gather the nerve to face him. All this time, she said in a trembling voice, you've known that I was the woman you kissed that night, and yet you've said nothing. Neither have you. Holly turned then, forcing herself to look up at him, her face scarlet with shame. I hoped you wouldn't recognize me. I'll remember it until my dying day. The feel of you. The smell and taste of you. Don't, she said with a horrified gasp. Hush, don't say such things. From that moment on, I've wanted you more than I've ever wanted anyone. You want every woman, she cried. Evidently deciding on a strategic retreat, she backed away from him and edged around a white marble statue. Zachary pursued her steadily. What do you think has been keeping me home every evening of late? I get more satisfaction from sitting in the damn parlor and listening to you read poetry than I do from spending a night with the most skilled whores in London. Please, she said scornfully, spare me your sordid compliments. Perhaps some women may appreciate your depraved charm, but I do not. My depraved charms are not all lost on you, he countered, reaching her just as she stumbled on a bit of gravel. He caught her from behind, his hands closing around her upper arms. 
I've seen the way you look at me. I've felt the way you react when I touch you. And it's not disgust. You kissed me back that evening in the conservatory. I was caught off guard. I was surprised. Then if I kissed you again, he said in a low voice, you wouldn't respond. Is that what you're claiming? Although he couldn't see her face, he felt the tension in her muscles increase as she realized the trap she had just walked into. Take my word for it, Mr. Bronson, she said unsteadily. I would not respond. Now please let me. He spun her around and locked her against his body and bent his head. Chapter 12 Holly made a startled sound and went utterly still, paralyzed by the sensations that swept over her. Bronson kissed her in the shocking way she remembered from before, whole-mouthed, hungry, with a raw desire that made it impossible for her to withhold a response. The night seemed to close around them, the marble statuary standing like silent sentinels to ward away intruders. Bronson's dark head moved over hers, his mouth gentle but urgent, his tongue searching her in deep, hot sweeps. Her entire body seemed to burn. Suddenly, she could not seem to press close enough to him. She reached inside his coat, where the heat of his body had collected, and the layers of linen were warm and male-scented. The smell of him was the most compelling fragrance she had ever encountered. Salt and skin, cologne and the tang of tobacco— Stirred and excited, she pulled her lips from his and pressed her face into his shirt front. She breathed raggedly while her arms clutched around his hard waist. Holly, he muttered, sounding as shaken as she was. My God, Holly. She felt his big hand close around the back of her neck, flexing slowly. He tilted her head back and his mouth covered hers once more. It wasn't enough to merely let him explore her mouth. She wanted to taste him in return. She pushed her tongue into his hot, brandy-flavoured mouth. Not enough. Not nearly enough. Moaning, she stood on her toes, pushing herself up at him. But he was too big for her, too tall, and she gasped in frustration. Scooping her up into his arms as if she weighed nothing, Bronson carried her father into the sculpture garden where there was something round and flat, a stone table, perhaps, or a sundial. He sat with her in his lap, one immense arm braced behind her shoulders and neck, while his mouth continued to devour hers in delicious forays. She had never experienced such raw physical pleasure before. Compelled to touch him, she tore frantically at her right glove until it fell away. Her shaking hand groped for his hair, and slid into the thick waves at the back of his neck. His muscles jumped and flexed beneath her bare fingers, his nape turning rock-hard, and he groaned into her mouth. Breaking the kiss, Bronson bent over her, nuzzling the tender skin beneath her jaw, finding the vulnerable areas along the side of her throat. She felt his tongue touch her skin, and the sensation caused her to squirm and shiver in his lap. His mouth lingered at the hollow at the very base of her neck, where a pulse throbbed wildly. Her gown had become disarranged, the bodice slipping so that it barely covered the tips of her breasts. Feeling the perilous downslide of red silk, Holly came to her senses with a startled murmur, crossing her gloved arm over her nearly exposed breasts. Please! Her lips felt hot and swollen, making it difficult to speak. I shouldn't! We must stop this. He seemed not to hear her, his lips beginning a searing sojourn over her chest. He nibbled and licked at the edge of her collarbone, moving to the plump valley between her breasts. Closing her eyes in despair, Holly bit back a protest as she felt him tug at her bodice, his strong fingers working at the fabric. She would stop him soon, soon, but for now the moment was unbearably sweet and neither shame nor honour could influence her. She gasped as her breast popped free of the red silk covering, the nipple budding at the caress of the cool midnight breeze. Bronson ripped off his glove, 
and his large, bare hand cupped tenderly around the soft mound, his thumb passing over the hardening crest. Holly kept her eyes closed, unable to believe what was happening. She felt his mouth touch her, kissing all around the sensitive nipple, circling and teasing, but avoiding the center, until finally she groaned and arched to push it into his mouth. His lips closed around her, tugging, his tongue stroking the aching tip with delicate skill. Writhing upward, she held his dark head in her arms, while erotic sensation pulsed in every tender place of her body. Her breath came in strange little sobs, her lungs straining against the compression of her stays. Her clothes seemed to bind her too tightly. She wanted to feel his skin against hers. She wanted his taste, his touch, as she had never wanted anything before in her life. Zachary, she gasped in his ear. Please stop, please. His hand returned to her breast, covering and gently shaping the fullness, his palm rough against her skin. He rubbed his mouth over hers in fierce half-kisses, until her lips were soft and wet and pliant beneath his. Then he raised her enough to whisper in her ear, and while his voice was tender, his words were savage. You're my woman, and no man or god or ghost will ever take you from me. Anyone who had the slightest knowledge of Zachary Bronson and what he was capable of would have been alarmed. Holly went rigid with terror, not just at the prospect of being claimed so utterly, but by the flicker of fiercely joyous response she felt inside. She had striven her entire life to be moderate, reasonable, civilized, and she had never dreamed it possible that this could happen to her. She struggled from his lap in such a panicked flurry that he was forced to release her. Her feet gained purchase, and she stood unsteadily. To her surprise, her legs were so weak that she might have fallen, had Bronson not stood and caught her waist in his hands. Blushing furiously, she restored her bodice, hiding the naked flesh that gleamed in the moonlight. I suspected this might happen, she said, struggling to regain some form of composure. Knowing of your reputation with women, I knew you might someday make an advance to me. What just happened between us was not an advance, he said thickly. She did not look at him. If I am to remain as a guest in your household, we must forget this incident. Incident? he repeated scornfully. This has been building between us for months, since the first time we met. It has not she countered, while her heart hammered in her throat, nearly choking her into silence. I won't deny that I find you attractive. I... any woman would. But if you are under the misconception that I would become your mistress... No, he said, his huge hands coming to the sides of her face, fingers curving around the back of her skull. He urged her face upward, and Holly quailed at the look in his dark, passionate eyes. No... I never thought that, he said, his voice turning raspy. I want more from you than that. I want... Don't say anything else, Holly begged, closing her eyes tightly. We've both gone mad. Let me go this instant. Now, before you make it impossible for me to stay at your estate any longer. Although she hadn't expected the words to affect him, they seemed to make great impact. There was a long taut silence. Slowly, his hands eased their possessive grip and dropped away. There's no reason for you to leave my home, he said. We'll handle this however you like. The clutch of panic began to ease from her throat. I... I want to ignore this as if it never happened. All right, he said at once, although his gaze was frankly skeptical. You set the rules, my lady. He stooped and retrieved her discarded glove and handed it to her. Flushing, she fumbled to pull it back over her arm. You must promise not to interfere in the matter between Ravenhill and me, she managed to say. I invited him to call on me. I do not wish for him to be turned away or treated rudely when he visits. I will make all decisions about my future and Rose's without any help from you. 
she saw from the hard flexing of his jaw that he was gritting his teeth. Fine, he said evenly. But I want to point something out. For three years, Ravenhill has gallivanted around Europe, and don't try to claim that his infernal promise to George was uppermost in his mind then. And what about your actions? You weren't thinking about the damn promise when you agreed to work for me. You know George wouldn't have approved. Hell, you and I both know he probably rolled over in his grave. I accepted your offer because I didn't know if Ravenhill still desired to uphold his vows to George. I have Rose and her future to consider. When you appeared, and Ravenhill was nowhere to be found, it seemed the best choice at the time. And I don't regret it. When my employment with you is concluded, I will then be free to fulfill my obligations to George, if that turns out to be the best course of action. All very sensible, he observed in a soft but stinging tone. Tell me this. If you decide to marry Ravenhill, will you let him share your bed? She coloured at the question. You have no right to ask such a thing. You don't want him that way, he said flatly. There is far more to a marriage than what occurs in the conjugal bed. Is that what George told you? He shot back. I wonder, did you ever respond to him the way you do with me? The question filled her with outrage. Holly had never struck anyone in her life, but her hand moved of its own accord. As if she stood outside the scene, she watched the white flash of her glove as she slapped his face. The blow was pitifully soft, insignificant, except as a gesture of rebuke. It didn't seem to bother Bronson in the slightest. In fact, she saw the satisfied gleam in his eyes, and she realized in a flash of despair that she had given him his answer. With a sob of distress, she sped away from him as fast as her feet would take her. After a while, Zachary returned to the ball, doing his best to appear composed, while his body ached with frustrated desire. At last he knew what it was like to hold her in his arms and feel her mouth work sweetly under his. At last he knew the taste of her skin, the throb of her pulse against his lips. Absently taking a cup of some noxiously sweet liquid from a passing servant, Zachary stood at the side of the room and stared at the crowd until he located Holly's vivid red dress. She appeared miraculously carefree and self-possessed, chatting lightly with his sister Elizabeth and making introductions to the would-be suitors that approached them. Only the arcs of bright colour at the crests of her cheeks betrayed her inner turmoil. Zachary tore his gaze from her, knowing it would cause comment if he continued to stare at her so openly. But somehow he knew that she was aware of him, despite the fact that they were separated by a room full of people. Blindly, he turned his attention to the cup of punch in his hand. He drank it in a few impatient gulps, finding the taste to be cloying and medicinal. Various acquaintances came to stand next to him, most of them partners in business ventures, and he obligingly made polite conversation, smiled at jokes he only half heard, ventured opinions when he was barely aware of the subject matter. All his attention, his thoughts, his willful soul were focused on Lady Holland Taylor. He was in love with her. Every dream, hope and ambition of his life combined was a tiny flame in comparison to the great conflagration of emotion that burned inside him. It terrified him that she held such immense power over him. He had never wanted to love anyone this way. It brought him no comfort or happiness, only the painful knowledge that he was almost certain to lose her. The thought of not having her, relinquishing her to another man, to the wishes of her departed husband, nearly brought him to his knees. Wildly, he considered ways to lure her. There were things he could offer. Hell, he would personally build a great marble monument to the memory of George Taylor, if that was her price for accepting him. Occupied with his frantic thoughts, Zachary didn't immediately notice the nearby presence of Ravenhill. Gradually, 
he became aware of the tall, blonde man standing only a few feet away, a handsome, solitary figure amid the vibrant clamor of the ball. Their gazes met, and Zachary stepped closer to him. Tell me, Zachary said softly, what kind of man would ask his best friend to marry his wife after he died? And what kind of man would inspire two seemingly sensible people to agree to such a damned stupid plan? The man's grey eyes surveyed him in a measuring stare. A better man than you or I will ever be. Zachary couldn't stop himself from sneering. It seems that Lady Holland's paragon of a husband wants to control her from the grave. He was trying to protect her, Ravenhill said without apparent heat, from men like you. The bastard's calmness infuriated Zachary. Ravenhill was so damned confident, as if he had already won a competition that Zachary hadn't even known about until it was over. You think she'll go through with it, don't you? Zachary muttered resentfully. You think she'll sacrifice the rest of her life simply because George Taylor asked it of her? Yes, that's what I think, came Ravenhill's cool reply. And if you knew her better, you'd have no doubt of it. Why? Zachary wanted to ask, but he couldn't bring himself to voice the painful question. Why was it a foregone conclusion that she would go through with her promise— had she loved George Taylor so much that he could influence her even in death? Or was it simply a matter of honour? Could her sense of duty and moral obligation really impel her to marry a man she didn't love? I warn you, Ravenhill said softly, if you hurt or distress Lady Holland in any way, you'll answer to me. All this concern for her welfare is touching— a few years late in coming, isn't it? The comment seemed to rattle Ravenhill's composure. Zachary felt a stab of triumph as he saw the man flush slightly. I've made mistakes, Ravenhill acknowledged curtly. I have as many faults as the next man, and I found the prospect of filling George Taylor's shoes damned intimidating. Anyone would. Then what made you come back? Zachary muttered wishing there was some way to forcibly transport the man back across the channel. The thought that Lady Holland and her daughter might need me in some way. They don't. They have me. The lines had been drawn. They might as well have been generals of opposing armies, facing each other across a battlefield. Ravenhill's thin, aristocratic mouth curved in a contemptuous smile. You're the last thing they need he said. I suspect even you know that. He walked away. Zachary stood watching him, stone-faced and still, while inside he writhed in anguished fury. Holly needed a drink, a large glass of brandy, one that would calm her overwrought nerves and allow her a few hours of sleep. She had not needed to take spirits since the first year of mourning George. The doctor had prescribed a nightly glass of wine in those days of turmoil, but it had not been enough. Only strong spirits had been sufficient to calm her, and so she had sent Maud on secretive missions to fetch her glasses of whiskey or brandy when the household had settled for the night. Knowing that George's family would not approve of a lady drinking— and also aware that they would be able to detect the lowering levels of liquor in the sideboard decanters, Holly had decided to smuggle a bottle to her own room. Using Maud as intermediary, Holly had gotten a footman to purchase brandy for her, and she had stored it in the drawer of her dressing table. Now thinking longingly of that long-ago brandy bottle, she dressed for bed, and waited impatiently for the Bronson household to retire. The carriage ride back home from the ball had been nothing short of hellish. Fortunately, Elizabeth had been too excited by her own success and the flattering attentions paid her by Jason Summers to notice the seething silence between Holly and her brother. Paula had been aware of the tension, of course, and she had sought to cover it with a stream of light chatter. Holly had forced herself to ignore Bronson's brooding stare and had made small talk with Paula 
smiling and joking, while inside her nerves were shattering. When there wasn't a sound or movement to be detected in the cavernous house, Holly took a candle in a small, jeweled holder and crept from her room. As far as she knew, the easiest place to find Brandy was in the library sideboard, where Bronson always kept a supply of excellent French vintage. Descending the grand staircase in her bare feet, Holly held the candle high, starting a little as the tiny flame cast eerie shadows on the gilded walls. The large house, always so busy and bustling in the daytime, resembled a deserted museum at night. Cool draughts curled around her ankles, and she shivered, grateful for the warmth of the ruffled white pelisse that fastened over her thin nightgown. Entering the library, Holly inhaled the familiar smell of leather and vellum, and passed the huge gleaming globe on her way to the sideboard. She set the candle on the polished mahogany surface and opened a cabinet door in search of a glass. Although there wasn't a sound or movement in the room, something alerted her to the fact that she wasn't alone. Uneasily, she turned to survey her surroundings and gasped as she saw Bronson seated in a deep leather armchair, his long legs stretched before him. He stared at her intently, his ophidian eyes unblinking. He was still dressed in his evening clothes, though his coat had been removed and his waistcoat and necktie hung loose. His white shirt was unbuttoned to the middle of his chest, revealing a wealth of thick black hair. An empty brandy snifter was held loosely in his fingers, and she surmised that he had been drinking for some time. Holly's heart jerked violently. Air left her lungs in a swift rush, making it impossible for her to speak. Unsteadily, she leaned back against the sideboard, gripping the edge with her hands for support. Slowly, Bronson rose to his feet and approached her. He glanced at the open door of the sideboard, understanding immediately what she wanted. Allow me he said, his voice a velvety rumble in the stillness, and he pulled out a snifter and a brandy decanter. Pouring until the snifter was a third full, he held it by the stem and used the candle flame to warm the glass bowl. An expert swirl or two, and he handed the warmed vintage to her. Holly took the snifter and drank at once, wishing that her hand wasn't trembling visibly. She couldn't help staring at the place where his shirt hung open. George had a smooth chest, which she had always found attractive, but the sight of Zachary Bronson in an unbuttoned shirt filled her mind with lurid, disquieting thoughts. She wanted to rub her mouth and face amid those springy, dark curls, wanted to press her bare breasts against them. A flaming blush covered her from head to toe, and she gulped brandy until it made her cough. Bronson returned to his chair and sat heavily. Are you going to marry Ravenhill? The brandy snifter nearly fell from Holly's hand. I asked you a question, he said thickly. Are you going to marry him? I don't know the answer to that. Of course you do. Tell me, damn you. I... Her entire body seemed to wilt in defeat. It is possible I will. Bronson did not seem surprised. A soft, ugly laugh broke from him. You'll have to explain why. I'm afraid that common bruisers like myself have trouble understanding these upper-class arrangements. I promised George, Holly said carefully, feeling no small amount of apprehension as she stared at him. Bronson looked so, well, malevolent, as he sat there in the darkness. Handsome, black-haired, and larger than life, he could have been Lucifer seated on his throne. If you find anything about me that is worthy of admiration or affection, then you would not wish me to behave in a way that is less than honorable. I have been raised never to break my word once it has been given. I know that some people think a woman's sense of honor is not as strong as a man's, but I have always tried... My God! I don't doubt your honour, he said roughly. What I'm saying 
what should be clear to everyone is that George should never have asked for such a promise. But he did, and I gave it. Just like that. Bronson shook his head. I wouldn't have believed it of you. You, the only woman I've ever known who is willing to stand up to me in a temper. George knew what would happen to me without him, she said. He knew I would never willingly marry again. He wanted me to have the protection of a husband, and more importantly for Rose to have a father. And Ravenhill's values and beliefs were similar to his, and George knew that Rose and I would never be mistreated by his best friend. Enough! Zachary interrupted harshly. I'll tell you what I think about good old St. George. I think he didn't want you to ever fall in love again. And locking you into a marriage with a cold fish like Ravenhill was George's way of making certain that he would remain your one and only love. Holly whitened at the accusation. What a horrible thing to say. You are completely wrong. You know absolutely nothing about my husband or his friend. I know you don't love Ravenhill. I know you never will. If you're so intent on marrying a man you don't love, then take me. Of all the things she might have expected him to say, that was the biggest surprise of all. Clumsy with astonishment, Holly finished her brandy and set the empty snifter on the sideboard behind her. Are you proposing to me? she asked in a whisper. Bronson came to her, not stopping until he had crowded her against the sideboard. Why not? George wanted you to be protected and cared for. I could do that, and I could be a father to Rose. She doesn't know who the hell Ravenhill is. I'll take care of the two of you. He slid his hand beneath the sheath of her hair, sifting gently through the long brown locks. Holly closed her eyes and bit back a whimper of pleasure as she felt his fingers curve around the back of her neck. It seemed that her whole body responded to his touch. There was a mortifying, expectant twitch in the private place between her thighs, and she was shamed by the carnal need that pulsed so strongly inside her. She had never longed to be physically possessed by a man as much as she did this moment. I could give you things you never even thought to want before, Bronson whispered. Forget about your damned promises, Holly. That's all in the past. It's time to think of the future now. Holly shook her head and parted her lips to argue. His head lowered swiftly, and he took her mouth, making her groan in pleasure as his tongue sank deeply inside her. He kissed her with a passionate expertise that sent every rational thought scattering. His mouth teased and twisted over hers while she strained upward in helpless response. His warm hands, separated from her body by only thin layers of muslin, slid over her with shocking boldness, cupping over the shapes of her breasts, the slopes of her hips, even the full curves of her buttocks. She gasped as he squeezed her bottom gently, pulling her hips upward against his. As he kissed her, he rubbed her insistently against the rock-hard protrusion of his arousal, and Holly nearly swooned at the sensation. Not even her husband had dared to fondle her so blatantly. She dragged her mouth from his. You're making it impossible for me to think. I don't want you to think. He pulled her hand to the front of his trousers, fitting her lax fingers over the huge, hot ridge that arched against the taut fabric. Her eyes widened at the feel of him, and she dove her head against his chest to avoid his descending mouth. He kissed the frail skin beneath her ear instead, his lips roving downward to her throat. Although the rational part of Holly's mind, what was left of it, warned stridently against such reckless sensuality, she pressed her cheek to the intriguing curls on his chest. She was enthralled by his uncompromising masculinity, every powerful, coarse, thrilling detail of him. But he was not for her. Although opposites might attract, they did not make for good marriages. One's only chance for contentment was when like married like, 
and she had made a binding promise to her husband in the last minutes before he died. The thought of George abruptly sent her hurtling back to reality, and she wrenched herself free of Zachary Bronson's arms. She stumbled to a chair and sat down hard, her legs weak and trembling. To her relief, Bronson did not follow her. For a long time, the only sounds in the library were the sharp inhalations of their breathing. Finally, Holly found her voice. I can't deny the attraction between us. She paused and emitted a shaky laugh. But surely you must know that we would never suit. I am meant for a small, quiet life. Your way of living is too grand and fast for me. You would grow bored with me in a very short time, and you would long to be free of me. No. And I would find it such a misery, trying to live with a man of your appetite and ambition. One of us would have to change, and that would cause terrible resentment, and the marriage would come to a bitter end. You can't be certain of that. I can't take such a risk, she replied with absolute finality. Bronson stared at her through the shadows, his head tilted a bit, as if he were relying on some sixth sense to penetrate her thoughts. He came to her and sank to his haunches before the chair. He startled her by reaching for her hand, his fingers closing over her small, cold fist. Slowly, his thumb rubbed over her knotted knuckles. There is something you are not telling me, he murmured. Something that makes you anxious, even afraid. Is it me? Is it my past? The fact that I was a fighter? Or is it... No, she said, with a laugh that caught hard in her throat. Of course I'm not afraid of you. I know fear when I see it, he persisted. Holly shook her head, refusing to debate the comment. We must put this night behind us, she said or I will have to take Rose and leave right away. And I don't wish to leave you or your family. I want to stay as long as possible and fulfill our agreement. Let us agree not to speak of this again. His eyes gleamed with black fire. Do you think that's possible? It has to be, she whispered. Please, Zachary, tell me you'll try. I'll try he said tonelessly. She drew a trembling breath. Thank you. You'd better leave now, he said unsmiling. The sight of you in that nightgown is about to drive me mad. Were she not so miserable, Holly would have been amused by the remark. The tears of ruffles that adorned her nightgown and pelisse made the ensemble far less revealing than an ordinary daygown. It was only Bronson's inflamed state of mind that made her seem desirable. Will you be retiring now as well? she asked. No. He went to fill his glass and answered her over his shoulder. I have some drinking to do. Wrenched with unexpressed emotion, she tried to twist her mouth into a smile. Good night, then. Good night. He did not glance back at her. His shoulders held stiffly as he listened to the sound of her retreating footsteps. Chapter 13 For the next fortnight, Holly saw almost nothing of Bronson, and she realized that he was deliberately putting distance between them until they were both able to resume their previous friendship. He threw himself into his work all day, going to his town offices, rarely returning home for dinner. He stayed out late in the evenings and arose in the mornings with bloodshot eyes and lines of strain on his face. This ceaseless activity was not mentioned by the other members of the Bronson household, but Holly sensed that Paula understood its cause. I want you to be assured, Mrs. Bronson, Holly told her carefully one morning, that I would never deliberately cause discomfort or unhappiness to anyone in your family. My lady, it's not your fault, Paula responded with her customary frankness, reaching over to give Holly's hand an affectionate pat. 
You may be the first thing my son has ever truly wanted that he wasn't able to get. To my way of thinking, it's good for him to finally learn his limits. I've always warned him about reaching too high above his buttons. Has he spoken to you about me? Holly asked, flushing until even the tips of her ears felt hot. Not a word, Paula said, but there was no need. A mother always knows. He is such a wonderful man, Holly began to tell her earnestly, afraid that Paula might be under the misconception that she didn't think Zachary was good enough for her. Yes, I think so too, Paula said matter-of-factly. But that doesn't make him right for you, milady, any more than you were right for him. The reassurance that Bronson's mother did not blame her for the situation should have made Holly feel better. Unfortunately, it didn't. Each time Holly saw Bronson, no matter how brief or casual the encounter, she was filled with longing that threatened to overwhelm her. She began to wonder if she could really live like this for the remainder of her promised year at the Bronson home. Devoting herself to Rose and to the Bronson women, she kept herself as busy as possible. And there was much to do, especially now that Elizabeth had made her entrance into society. The great hall was filled with constantly arriving bowers of roses and spring arrangements, and the silver tray near the door was loaded daily with cards from hopeful suitors. As Holly had predicted, the combination of Elizabeth's beauty and fortune, not to mention her irrepressible charm, had attracted many men who seemed more than willing to overlook the circumstances of her birth. It required both Holly's and Paula's efforts to chaperone the daily visits and carriage drives and picnics as various gentlemen came to court Elizabeth. However, there was one caller in particular who seemed to capture the girl's interest most strongly. The architect, Jason Summers. There were callers with bluer blood and greater wealth, but none that possessed Jason's self-confidence and charm. He was a robust man, with more than his share of talent and ambition, a man not all that unlike Elizabeth's brother. From what Holly had observed, Jason was able to balance Elizabeth's exuberant spirit with his own steady strength. It was a good match, and promised to be a happy union, if all turned out as Holly hoped. During one of Jason's morning visits, Holly happened to see the pair as he and Elizabeth returned from a walk in the garden. Besides, you're not tall enough for me, Elizabeth was saying, her voice filled with effervescent laughter as they strode through the French doors and into a gallery of marble sculpture. Holly paused at the far end of the gallery where she happened to be walking. She was concealed by a towering winged rendition of some Roman god. Good God, woman! I'm hardly what anyone would call short, Jason retorted. And I'm a good two inches taller than you. You are not. And two, he insisted, and pulled her against him with an easy strength that made Elizabeth gasp. They were matched length to length, Elizabeth's slender form measured against Jason's larger one. See, Jason said, his voice suddenly husky. The amusement faded from the girl's face, and she fell abruptly silent, staring at the man who held her her eyes filled with shy apprehension. Holly briefly considered interrupting the scene, knowing that Elizabeth was unused to such attentions from a man. But there was a look on Jason's face that Holly had never seen before, utterly tender and desirous. He bent his head to murmur something in her ear, and Elizabeth turned pink, one of her hands creeping up to his shoulder. Holly's own face flushed a bit as she slipped away discreetly, allowing the two a measure of privacy. Oh, how long ago it seemed that she had been courted by George in the same manner, and how innocent and hopeful she had felt. But her memories were blurred now, and she no longer found pleasure in reminiscing. Her life with George had become a distant dream. Filled with wistfulness, Holly spent the rest of the morning playing with Rose, and then left her daughter in Maud's care. She declined lunch, as she was too dispirited to eat a bite. Instead, she selected a novel from the library and carried it with her on a walk through the gardens. The sky was overcast, 
and the breeze was infused with a cool mist that caused Holly to shiver and pull her brown cashmere shawl more closely around her shoulders. Pausing first at a stone table and then at a bench sided by flower-filled urns, she finally found a spot for reading, a summer house about twelve feet wide. The windows were covered in little wooden shutters, and inside it was lined with cushioned benches. The seats and backs of the benches were covered with a heavy, twilled green fabric that held a faintly musty but not unpleasant scent. Curling up on one of the cushions and drawing her feet up beneath her, Holly leaned back and began to read. Soon lost in the tale of a doomed love affair, was there any other kind, Holly failed to notice the rumblings of thunder in the sky. The light darkened from silver white to grey, and rain began to patter heavily on the lawn and paved walkway outside. A few errant drops blew through the shutter and fell to Holly's shoulder, finally alerting her to the worsening weather outside. Looking up from the novel, she frowned. Bother, she muttered, realizing that her novel reading was coming to an end. It was definitely time to return to the main house. But the rain was already heavy, and she wondered if the storm might lessen in a few minutes. Sighing, she closed the book in her lap and leaned her head against the wall as she watched the rain pelt the grassy earth and hedges. The vibrant smell of a heavy spring shower filled the summer house. Her melancholy thoughts were soon interrupted as someone opened the door roughly and shouldered his way inside. She was startled to see Zachary Bronson, his large form shrouded in a sodden greatcoat. He brought a gust of fresh, rain-laden wind with him, then closed the shutter door with the back of his shoe. Swearing beneath his breath, he struggled with a huge, dripping umbrella. Retreating back against a cushion, Holly watched him with a growing smile as he endeavoured to fold the ungainly contraption. He was a handsome devil, she thought, with a flicker of pleasure, her gaze drinking in the sight of his rain-washed face and his coffee black eyes and his gleaming dark hair plastered to his well-shaped skull. I thought you were in town, she said, raising her voice above a long rumble of thunder. Came back early, he replied shortly. I managed to stay just ahead of the storm until it reached the estate. How did you know I was out here? Maud was worried. She said you were in the garden somewhere. Triumphantly, he closed the umbrella with a snap. It was easy enough to find you. Not many places to take shelter. His dark gaze settled on her face, and he returned her smile with a flashing grin. So, I'm here to rescue you, milady. I didn't even realize I needed rescuing, Holly said. I was completely absorbed in my book. Perhaps the rain will ease soon. As if in sarcastic response, the sky turned several shades darker, and ear-splitting thunder accompanied a streak of lightning as it scored across the burgeoning sky. Holly laughed suddenly and glanced at Bronson, who was smiling. Let me take you back to the house, he said. Holly shivered, staring at the torrential downpour. It seemed a very long way back to the house. We'll be soaked, she said, and the lawn has undoubtedly turned to mud. Couldn't we just wait until it stops? Extracting a dry handkerchief from her sleeve, she stood on her toes and dabbed at the rivulets of rain on Bronson's face. Suddenly he was expressionless, standing still beneath her ministrations. It won't stop for hours, and I don't trust myself to be alone with you for more than five minutes. He removed his greatcoat and hung it around her shoulders. The garment was ridiculously large on her. So unless you want to be ravished in the summer house, he said brusquely, staring into her upturned face, let's go. But neither of them moved. Holly raised the handkerchief to his jaw, drying a few last drops of water that clung to his clean-shaven skin. She crushed the damp, lace-trimmed linen in her fist and clutched at the greatcoat to keep it from falling to the floor. She did not comprehend why being alone with him gave her such intense pleasure, why the sight of him and sound of his voice should be so comfortable and yet so stirring. 
The knowledge that their lives were only entwined for a temporary time caused her heart to ache. He had become important to her so quickly, so effortlessly. I've missed you, she whispered. She had not intended to speak the words aloud, but they pressed forth of their own accord, hanging gently amid the splashing staccato of rain. She felt almost maddened by a yearning that was deeper than hunger, sharper than pain. I had to stay away, Bronson said gruffly. I can't be around you without... Falling silent, he stared at her in grim misery. He did not move when Holly pushed the coat off her shoulders, or when she brought her body against his, or even when she slid her arms around his neck. She rubbed her face against the damp collar of his shirt and hugged him fiercely. It seemed that for the first time in days she was able to breathe fully, the dull ache of loneliness finally lifting from her chest. A muffled groan escaped him, and he turned his head to fit his mouth against hers. His arms went around her, holding her securely. The summer house dissolved in a blur around her, and the smell of rain was replaced by the masculine scent of Zachary's skin. She put her hands on his hot cheeks, his neck, and his grip tightened just short of crushing her, as if he were trying to pull her inside him. Just this once. The wicked thought seized her and would not let go. Just once. She would live on it, remember, savor when the days of her youth were long past. No one would ever know. The storm pounded on the wooden structure around them, but its force was nothing compared to the violent beating of her own heart. Frantically she pulled at the knot of his necktie, tugging it loose, then worked at the buttons of his waistcoat and shirt. Zachary held still, though his powerful chest moved in deep, labored breaths. Holly, his voice was low and unsteady, do you know what you're doing? Recklessly she pushed the shirt open, bearing him from neck to navel, and her breath stopped at the sight of him. He was a magnificent creature, his body a tightly knit masterpiece of muscle and sinew. Holly touched him in awed wonder, spreading her hands on his furry chest, sliding her fingertips through to the tough muscle beneath, then stroking the hard, rippled surface of his stomach. She found the sprinkling of hair around his navel, her fingertips investigating gently, and he made a sound of pained pleasure. Catching her wrist, he pulled her hand away, holding it to the side as he stared at her. If you touch me again, he said raggedly, I won't be able to stop. I'll take you right here, Holly. Do you understand? She moved toward him, pressed herself to his bare skin, buried her face amid the thick black curls on his chest. She felt his resistance break, his large body shuddering as he wrapped his arms around her. His mouth sought hers urgently, extracting sensations that were indecent in their sheer sweetness. A series of swift, light tugs, and the carved bone buttons of her bodice were released, the garment sagging to her elbows. After unhooking her stays, Zachary took hold of the tape that fastened the top of her chemise, wound it around his finger and pulled. Her breasts spilled free, white and pink, the tips already contracted from the coolness of the summer house. Filling his hands with the round, soft weights, Zachary cradled the sensitive peaks within his palms. Hurry, she said in agitation. Zachary, please, I, I need you. Now that she had abandoned herself in passion, she had lost all shame, all restraint. She wanted him over her, inside her, the heat of him couched between her legs. Hushing her with his mouth, Zachary shrugged off his shirt and waistcoat, bearing his gleaming, sculptured shoulders. He sat on the green cushions and pulled her to his lap. Reaching beneath her skirts, he spread her knees apart and guided them to either side of his hips. Holly turned scarlet with excitement and apprehension as she settled onto his loins and felt the swollen hardness of his erection straining beneath his trousers. She could feel the immense shape of him burning against the delicate veil of her drawers. Hooking his hands beneath her arms, Zachary brought her forward, 
and kissed the space between her breasts. She cradled his dark head in her arms and gasped as she felt his mouth close around a tender, peaked nipple. The strokes of his tongue were soft and hot. He moved to her other breast, and she felt the gentle pressure of his teeth as he tugged at her aching flesh. Quiet, incoherent sounds filtered from her throat, and she slid lower on his body, thrusting her damp breasts into the wiry curls of his chest. The coarse, silken hair teased her, stimulated her, and she rubbed herself against him with a moan of pleasure. Later she would be mortified at her own wanton actions. Much later. For now there was only Zachary, his sleek, muscled body, his amorous, marauding mouth, and she was going to savour every moment with him. His hands slipped beneath her skirts, and he fondled the round curves of her bottom. His touch became gentle, almost lazy, drifting over her body with maddening slowness. Shakily, she urged him once more to hurry, while in the back of her mind she was appalled by her own desperate need. Suddenly, Zachary laughed, the sound soft and low in his throat. He untied the tape of her drawers and pulled the garment down her hips. She moved awkwardly to help him, feeling light-headed as the drawers were stripped away. T Tell me what to do, she begged, anxiously aware of her lack of knowledge. This reckless encounter in the midst of an afternoon storm was entirely different from the peaceful nighttime interludes she had shared with George. Zachary Bronson was so terribly experienced, jaded even, that there seemed no possible way she could satisfy him. Are you asking how to please me? His lips moved tenderly over the rim of her ear. You don't even have to try. She pressed her red face against his shoulder, breathing fitfully as he widened the spread of her legs over his hips. Peals of thunder continued to rip across the sky, but the noise had lost the power to startle her. All her being was focused on the man who held her, his hard body beneath her, the masculine hand that fondled her so gently. His fingertips drew across the fragile crease of her thigh, where it met the softer skin of her groin. He stroked the feathery whirls of hair, searching for the place where her intimate flesh parted. He found the small, secretive cove that moistened eagerly at his touch. All her muscles tightened, and she sat suspended over him in trembling astonishment. Her forehead dug into the sinewy surface of his shoulder, and she groaned his name. She had never been taught any sort of bedroom etiquette, but she and George had both shared the same instinctive understanding that most married couples did. A gentleman accorded his wife the highest respect at all times, even in the conjugal embrace. He would refrain from touching her in indecent ways, and he would not seek to encourage her passions. Her character was to be kept untainted, and though a man should make love to his beloved with kindness, he should never touch or speak to her lewdly. Apparently, no one had ever informed Zachary Bronson of these facts. He whispered words of love and lust in her ear while he played with her unmercifully, his fingertips circling the tiny, sensitive peak hidden between the folds of her sex. Aroused and perspiring, she pushed herself farther into his hand, and she gasped as she felt his finger slip inside her. A strange, burning agitation spread throughout her body, and she twisted against him, her hands opening and closing against his shoulder, her open mouth pressing to his neck in beseeching kisses. His throat hummed with a crooning noise, and she felt the incredible tautness of his body, his muscles tightly bunched with compressed energy. Slowly, as if he were wary of frightening her, he drew away his hand and tugged at the fastenings of his trousers. She felt the hard, heavy spring of his released flesh, and her body jerked as she felt the first scalding touch of him. He positioned her wider and wedged himself against her damp opening. Holly quivered as she felt him ease inside her, stretching her delicate flesh. She let out a faint, whistling breath through her teeth. Am I hurting you? His gaze, dark as midnight, raked over her face. 
His hand slipped between their bodies, stroking and adjusting, spreading her so that he rubbed directly against the aching nub hidden amid the damp curls. The moment was so astonishingly intimate that she nearly wept. Her body relaxed to accommodate him, the pinching tightness easing, and suddenly there was no pain in his possession, only pleasure. Abandoning herself completely, she wrapped herself around him, her legs clamping on his hips. Zachary's eyes closed, his brow furrowing. He took the back of her head in his hand and brought her forward, his mouth claiming hers hungrily. His other hand splayed over her hips, urging her against him in an insistent rhythm, thrusting in deep nudges that made her squirm and writhe helplessly. He kept kissing her all the while, his mouth offering, taking, consuming her with feverish heat. She fought against the tangle of clothing between them, longing to be completely rid of her gown, wanting to feel his bare legs against hers instead of the textured broadcloth trousers. Voluptuous tension gathered inside her, while cries of need broke from her throat. A strange, wild fever had overtaken her, and she couldn't stop herself from writhing harder against him. She loved the rough, dense texture of his body, the thrusting length of him inside her, the big hands that cupped her breasts as she rode him. Then suddenly she couldn't move at all, her muscles locking as burning pleasure blossomed in her loins and spread all through her body. Paralyzed, she bit her lip and moaned as her nerves caught fire and her senses exploded. Although she didn't entirely understand what was happening, Zachary did, for he murmured softly and cradled her in his arms, his hips continuing their steady upward drives. She began to shudder, her body tightening in delicious spasms around his invading shaft, and that was enough to send him over the edge as well. He shivered and sighed and buried himself in one last thrust. His hands gripped her buttocks, pulling her hard against his loins as he impelled himself as far inside her as possible. Feeling drunk, Holly relaxed heavily against his chest, while the place where they were joined still glowed and throbbed. She wanted to laugh and cry at the same time, and eventually a nervous, giddy sound escaped her. Zachary rubbed her bare back soothingly, and she pressed her cheek against his shoulder. That never happened to you with your husband, he whispered. It was a statement, not a question. Holly nodded in perplexed wonder. It was hard to believe they could have a conversation this way, with the heat of him still lodged deep within her. But the storm was still beating outside, surrounding them in dark, rain-swept privacy, and she heard herself reply in a drugged voice, I liked making love with George. It was always pleasant. But there were things he never... And I wouldn't, because it isn't right, you see. What isn't right? Zachary pulled a few pins from her hair and unraveled the warm coil of shining brown locks, spreading them in a curtain over her naked back. She spoke slowly, searching for the right words. A woman should tame a man's bestial nature, not encourage it. I told you once before what lovemaking should be. An elevated expression of love, he said, playing with her hair. A communion of souls. Holly was surprised that he had remembered. Yes, exactly. It should not descend into lewdness. She felt him smile against the side of her head. I see nothing wrong with a little lewdness now and then. Of course you wouldn't, she said, hiding a smile in the thick carpet of curls on his chest. So now, you probably think your character has begun to degenerate, he mused, and her smile faded. I've just had illicit relations with my employer in the summer house. I don't think anyone would claim that as evidence of a sterling character. She tried to move off of him, gasping as the heavy length of him was pulled from inside her. Unbearable mortification swept over her as she felt the abundance of moisture seeping between her thighs, and she groped for something to blot it with. Zachary reached for his discarded coat, 
and for once he was able to find a handkerchief. He gave it to her, and spoke with a thread of tender amusement in his voice. I've never seen a woman blush from head to toe before. Glancing down, Holly saw that she had turned varying shades of pink and red over every exposed inch of skin. Snatching the handkerchief from him, she turned away from him as far as possible as she used it. I can't believe what I've done, she said in a suffocated voice. I'll cherish this afternoon for the rest of my life, Zachary replied. I'm going to have this summer house gold-plated and a plaque hung over the door. Holly whirled to face him, horrified that he might be serious, and saw the shimmering laughter in his eyes. Oh, how can you joke about this? She jerked and pulled at her gown. Great masses of fabric wadded and crumpled around her waist. Here, <laughs> hold still. Deftly he pulled up her undergarments and hooked her stays and helped her slide her arms back into her sleeves. The evidence of his expertise with women's clothing was disheartening. There was absolutely no doubt that he had trysted like this with many paramours. She was the latest in a very long line. Zachary, she began, closing her eyes as he gathered the locks of her hair in one hand and lowered his mouth to the side of her throat. His lips moved in a velvet slide across her skin, causing goose flesh to rise. She made a despairing sound and leaned back against his solid chest. I'm appalled by my weakness of character where you're concerned, she said. No doubt many other women have said that to you. I don't remember any other women, he said. She gave a disbelieving laugh, but he turned her to face him, his big hands moving possessively over her waist and sides and back. What we just shared, Holly. I don't know if it was a communion of souls, but it was the damn closest I'm ever going to get. It was a moment out of time. She kept her gaze on his bare chest, her hand moving with a will of its own, and stroking the hard, sleek muscles, the thick covering of hair. It has nothing to do with our real lives. I shouldn't have. It's just... I wanted to be with you at least once. I wanted it so badly that I didn't care about anything else. And now you think we're going to carry on as if nothing has happened? He asked incredulously. Holly swallowed and shook her head, fighting the urge to curl up against his half-naked body and cry like a child. Well, no, of course not. I, I can't stay after this. Holly, sweet darling, you can't possibly think I'm going to let you go. He gathered her against him, besieging her with kisses. Holly had never known before that joy and pain could mingle like this. She clung to him and briefly let herself respond, kissing him with fierce adoration, clutching him tightly for all the times she would never be able to hold him. Finally, she tore herself away and stood, pulling at the bunched fabric of her skirts until they settled into place. She hunted for her discarded shoes, finding one in the center of the summer house, the other beneath a bench. Zachary moved behind her, searching for his own clothes and putting them on. Sighing, Holly stared hard at some point far outside the rain-splattered window, where the tall hedgerows dissolved into a watery blur. I knew before today that I would have to leave, she said, keeping her back to Zachary. Now, after this, I certainly can't live beneath the same roof with you. I don't want you to leave. My feelings for you don't change what I must do. I've already explained why. He was silent for a full minute, grasping the full significance of her words. You're still planning to marry Ravenhill, he said tonelessly. Even now? No, it's not that. Holly felt very cold, all the pulsing warmth of their encounter finally draining away. She tried to examine her choices, but all of them left her feeling empty and strangely fearful. It was all too natural to retreat back into the habits of a lifetime, 
to follow the paths that had been chosen for her long ago, first by her father and then by George. I don't know what will happen with Ravenhill. I don't even know if he'll still have me. Oh, he'll have you. Zachary spun her around to face him. He was huge and dark, staring at her with a sort of resigned fury. I've had to fight for everything I've ever gotten, but I won't fight for you. You'll come to me because you want me. I'll be damned if I'll bully or beg you to have me. I suppose in the Tons view, a Ravenhill is worth about a hundred Bronsons. No one will blame you for marrying him, especially when it comes out that George wanted the match. And you might even be happy for a while. But someday you'll realize it was a mistake, when it's too late for either of us to do a damned thing about it. Holly turned white, but managed to reply calmly. Our agreement. I'll return the money. Keep the money for Rose. There's no reason for her trust to be cut in half, simply because her mother is a coward. She lowered her watery gaze to the level of his third shirt button. You're being cruel now, she whispered. I think I could be a gentleman about almost anything, except for losing you. Don't expect me to take it with good grace, Holly. Swiping her hand across her eyes, she managed one last whisper. I want to go back to the house. Despite the cover of Zachary's greatcoat and the shelter of the umbrella, Holly was thoroughly soaked by the time they reached the house. Zachary brought her in through the French doors, connecting to a gallery filled with sculpture. The long, rectangular space was shadowed and streaked with silver from the patterns the rain had made on the window. Statues were dappled and painted with grey rivulets. Dripping, his hair clinging to his head, Zachary stared down at the obdurate woman before him. She was shivering and tense, so closed away from him by her obligations and promises that they might as well have been separated by a granite wall. Her small, pale face was surrounded by streaming tendrils of brown hair, making her look like an unhappy mermaid. He yearned to carry her upstairs and strip away her cold, wet clothes and warm her with the heat of a fire, and then with his own body. I'll talk to your mother and sister tomorrow, Holly said unsteadily. I'll tell them that my work here is done, and there's little reason to stay. Rose and Maud and I will be packed and gone by the end of the week. I'm leaving for Durham tomorrow, Zachary muttered. I'll fry in hell before going through some shame of seeing you off and wishing you well and pretending there's nothing wrong between us. Yes, of course. She stood before him, her small frame held stiffly. She was so damned elusive, wounded, regretful, intractable, and so clearly in love with him. Zachary was furious that honour and common sense meant more to her than he did. She forced herself to return his gaze, and there was a perplexing glint of fear in her eyes. She was afraid to trust in any kind of future with him. He knew how to coax and badger and entice people into doing things they were reluctant to do, but he would not use those skills on her. She would have to choose him willingly, and it was clear that this was something she would never bring herself to do. Charged with bitter defeat, Zachary longed suddenly to be away from her, before he did or said something they would both regret for eternity. Just one more thing, he said, his voice coming out far more harshly than he had intended. If you leave me now, don't come back. I don't give second chances. Tears dropped from her eyes, and she turned away hastily. I'm sorry, she whispered, and fled the gallery. Chapter 14 I don't understand, Elizabeth said unhappily. Is it because of something I've done, or have you finally decided I'm unteachable? I'll try much harder, my lady, I promise. It has nothing to do with you, Holly rushed to assure the girl, reaching out to hold her hand tightly. After a sleepless night, she had arisen with bleary eyes, 
more resolved than ever to follow the course she had decided on. She had to, before she did things even more ill-advised than she already had. Her body felt unfamiliar to her, filled with sensations that lingered from the encounter in the summer house yesterday afternoon. She had never known the lure of fornication until now, never understood the power it had to ruin people's lives and break apart families and dissolve sacred vows. Now she knew why men and women had affairs and why they would risk everything for the sake of them. George wouldn't have recognized his loving, virtuous wife in the woman who had abandoned herself with Zachary Bronson. George would be horrified at what she had become. Ashamed and afraid, Holly had instructed Maud to start packing all their possessions as soon as possible. She had tried to explain to Rose, as gently as possible, that the time had come for them to return to the tailors. And, of course, the little girl had been upset by the news. But I like it here, Rose had cried angrily, her brown eyes flooding with tears. I want to stay, Mama. You go back and Maud and I will stay here. We don't belong here, Rose. Holly had replied. You know very well that we weren't planning to stay forever. You said it was for a year, Rose argued, snatching up Miss Crumpet and holding the doll protectively. It hasn't been a year yet, not nearly, and you were supposed to teach Mr. Bronson his manners. He's learned everything he needed to from me, Holly said firmly. Now stop making a fuss, Rose. I understand why you're unhappy, and it grieves me terribly. But you're not to trouble the Bronsons about this. After Rose had stormed away and disappeared somewhere in the huge house, Holly had reluctantly asked the Bronson women to meet with her in the family parlor after breakfast. It was not easy to tell them that she would be leaving the estate in a day or two. To her surprise, she realized that she would miss Elizabeth and Paula more than she would have ever expected. It must be Zack, the girl exclaimed. He's been horrid lately, as bad-tempered as a baited bear. Has he been rude to you? Is he to blame for this? I'll go see him this minute and knock some sense into him. Hush, Lizzie. Paula's compassionate gaze rested on Holly's distressed face as she spoke. You won't solve anything by charging about and making things more difficult for Lady Holly. If she wishes to leave, she will go with our affection and gratitude. And we won't repay all her kindness by tormenting her. Thank you, Mrs. Bronson, Holly whispered, unable to look the mother of her lover in the eyes. She had the awful suspicion that Paula, intuitive soul that she was, had guessed what had occurred between she and Zachary. But I don't want you to leave, Elizabeth said stubbornly. I'm going to miss you so awfully. You're the dearest friend I've ever had, and... Oh, what shall I do without little Rose? You'll still see us. Holly smiled warmly at the girl, while her eyes stung with tears. We'll remain dear friends, Lizzie, and you are welcome to visit me and Rose whenever you wish. Feeling a choking wave of emotion rising inside, she stood and wrung her hands nervously. If you'll excuse me, I have so much packing to do. She left hastily, before they could see her tears, and the two women began to talk animatedly just as she reached the threshold. Did Lady Holly have some sort of falling out with Zack? She heard Elizabeth ask. Is that why he's nowhere to be found and she's planning to leave? It's not quite that simple, Lizzie, came Paula's careful reply. No, it was not simple at all. Holly tried to consider what it would be like to marry Zachary, to become his wife and plunge into his ostentatious, fast-paced life, to leave behind everything she had known, to become a different woman, really. She ached with bitter longing, wanting him with all her being, but something inside her recoiled and shrank from the prospect. She searched blindly for the reason why, to make sense of her own fear, but somehow the truth refused to crystallize. It remained diffused and chilling inside her. Zachary had never accepted defeat before. 
He'd tolerated it in small doses, perhaps, always knowing that in the larger scheme of things he would have what he wanted. But he'd never been truly vanquished, never known a real loss. Until this, the biggest loss of all. It made him feel vicious and a bit crazed. He wanted to kill someone. He wanted to weep. Most of all, he wanted to laugh at himself for being a big, sodding fool. In the nonsensical stories that Holly read aloud some evenings about Greeks and their amorous, carelessly cruel gods, mortals were always punished for reaching too high. Hubris, Holly had once explained, too much prideful ambition. Zachary knew he had been guilty of hubris, and now he was paying the price. He should never have let himself want a woman who was clearly not meant for him. What tormented him the most was the suspicion that he might actually still be able to obtain her if he bullied and tormented and bribed her into it, but he wouldn't do that to her or to himself. He wanted her to love him as willingly and joyously as she had loved George. The very idea would have made most people laugh. It even amused him. What must Holly think when she compared him to her saintly husband? Zachary was a scoundrel, an opportunist, a rough-mannered scavenger, the definite opposite of a gentleman. Clearly, Ravenhill was the right choice, the only choice, if she wanted a life similar to the one she'd had with George. Scowling, Zachary strode to the library in search of a packet of files and letters he intended to bring with him to Durham. A flurry of packing was going on upstairs— as Maud and the housemaids stuffed clothes and personal belongings into trunks and valises, and as Zachary's valet packed suits and neckties in preparation for his trip. Zachary would be damned if he would watch Holly leave the estate. He would go first. Reaching his desk, he began to rifle through piles of paper, not noticing at first that someone else was there. A little peep came from the depths of his big leather chair, and Zachary swung around sharply, a question on his lips. Rose was sitting there with Miss Crumpet, the two of them nearly lost in the deep upholstery. With a sinking heart, Zachary saw that the child's face was splotched and red, and her nose needed wiping. It seemed that the tailor females required an unending supply of handkerchiefs. Cursing beneath his breath, Zachary valiantly searched for one in his coat, but found nothing. He untied his linen cravat, jerked it from his neck, and held it to Rose's nose. Blow, he muttered, and she complied gustily. She giggled, evidently entertained by the novelty of using a necktie as a nose wipe. You're being silly, Mr. Bronson. Zachary squatted down before her, staring at her eye to eye, and an affectionate grin tugged at his lips. What's the matter, princess? he asked gently, although he already knew. Rose unburdened herself eagerly. Mamma says we have to go away. We're going to live at my uncle's house again, and I want to stay here. Her little face crumpled with childish sorrow, and Zachary nearly staggered from the impact of an invisible blow to his chest. Panic, love, yet more anguish. Although saying goodbye to Holly hadn't quite killed him, this would certainly finish him off. Somehow, during the past months, he had begun to love this enchanting child, with her sugar-sticky hands, her jangly button string, her long, tangled curls, her brown eyes so like her mother's. No more tea parties. No more sitting in the parlour before the hearth and spinning tales of bunnies and cabbages dragons and princesses. No more miniature hands that clung to his so trustingly. Tell Mamma that we must stay here with you, Rose commanded. You can make her stay. I know you can. Your Mamma knows what's best for you, Zachary murmured, smiling faintly, though he was dying inside. You be a good girl and do as she says. I am a good girl always. Rose said, and began to sniffle again. Oh, Mr. Brunson, what will happen to my toys? 
I'll send every last one to you at the tailor's. They won't all fit. She used a chubby hand to smear a teardrop across her cheek. Their house is much, much littler than yours. Rose. He sighed and pressed her head against his shoulder, his huge hand engulfing the entire top of her skull. She stayed against him and snuggled close, patting his scratchy jaw. After a while, she wriggled away. You're squashing Miss Crumpet. Sorry, he said contritely, reaching out to straighten the doll's little blue bonnet. Will I ever see you and Lizzie again? Rose asked woefully. Zachary couldn't bring himself to lie to her. Not very often, I'm afraid. You'll miss me awfully, she said, heaving a sigh, and she began to fumble for something in the pocket of her pinafore. Something went wrong with Zachary's eyes, some odd blurring and stinging that he couldn't seem to blink away. Every day, princess. Rose extracted a small object from the pocket and handed it to him. This is for you, she said. It's my perfume button. When you get sad, you can smell it and you'll feel better. It always works for me. Princess, Zachary said, making his voice soft to keep it from cracking. I can't take your favorite button. He tried to give it back to her, but she pushed his hand away. You need it, she said stubbornly. You keep it, Mr. Brunson. And don't lose it. All right. Zachary closed his fist over the button and bowed his head over it, struggling with his unruly emotions. He had done this to himself, he thought. He had schemed and manipulated until he had gotten Lady Holland Taylor to live in his home. But he had never anticipated the consequences. If he had only known. Are you going to cry, Mr. Bronson? The child asked in concern, coming to stand beside his knees, staring into his downturned face. He managed to smile at her. Just a little on the inside, he said raspily. He felt her little hand on his cheek, and he held utterly still as she kissed him on the nose. Goodbye, Mr. Brunson, she whispered. And she left with her button string trailing dolefully behind her. It was still morning when his carriage was finally prepared for his departure, and there was nothing keeping him at the estate, nothing but his own tormented heart. Pondering all that had been said between he and Holly, he realized that there was nothing to be gained by further conversation. The choices had been set out. And Holly would either go or stay according to her own desires, with no interference from him. However, there was one bit of unfinished business remaining. Ascertaining that Holly had taken Rose out to the garden, Zachary went up to her bedroom. The blonde maid Maud was there, her arms stacked high with folded garments, as she walked from the armoire to the bed. She jumped a little as she saw him standing at the entrance to the room. Sir, she questioned warily, setting the folded clothes in the corner of a trunk. I have something to ask of you, he said curtly. Clearly puzzled as to what he wanted, Maud turned to face him. He sensed her discomfort at being alone in the same room with him. This room particularly, with Holly's clothes and possessions spread everywhere. There was a pile of objects on the bed, a hairbrush, a set of combs. An ivory box, a small frame covered in a leather case. He would have thought nothing of the frame, except that Maud discreetly tried to nudge it out of sight as she approached him. Is there a chore I might do for you, sir? The maid asked uneasily. Something I can fetch or mend or no, nothing like that. His gaze strayed to the frame case. What is that? Oh, it's. Well, something personal to Lady Holly, and Sir, she wouldn't like it if you. Maud spluttered with dismayed protests as Zachary reached over and plucked the frame case from the pile. A miniature, he asked, deftly shaking the object from its leather casing. Yes, sir, but 
You shouldn't really. Oh, dear. Maud's pudgy cheeks reddened, and she sighed in patent discomfort as he stared at the little portrait. George, Zachary said quietly. He had never seen a likeness of the man, had never wanted to before. It was only to be expected that Holly should carry a portrait of her late husband, for Rose's benefit as well as her own. However, Zachary had never asked to view a likeness of George Taylor, and Holly had certainly never volunteered to show him. Perhaps Zachary had expected that he would feel a pang of animosity at the sight of Taylor's face, but as he stared at the miniature... He was conscious only of a surprising feeling of pity. He had always thought of George as a contemporary, but this face was impossibly young, adorned with sideburns that amounted to a bit of peach fuzz on either side of his cheeks. Zachary was startled by the realization that Taylor couldn't have been more than twenty-four when he died, almost a full ten years younger than Zachary was now. Holly had been wooed and loved by this handsome boy, with his golden blonde hair and untroubled blue eyes, and a smile that hinted of mischief. George had died before he'd barely tasted of life, widowing a girl who had been even more innocent than he. Try as he might, Zachary couldn't blame George Taylor for trying to protect Holly, arrange things for her, ensure that his infant daughter was taken care of, no doubt George would have been anguished at the thought of his wife being seduced and made miserable by the Zachary Bronsons of the world. Damn it, Zachary whispered, shoving the miniature back into its leather sheath. Scowling, he set the object on the bed. Maud stared at him warily. Is there aught I can do for you, sir? He gave a single nod and reached inside his coat. I want you to have this, he muttered, extracting a small bag weighted with gold coins. To a servant of Maud Station, it amounted to a fortune. Take it, and promise me that if there is ever anything Lady Holland needs, you'll send for me. The maid's face was blank with surprise. She took the bag, felt its weight in her hand, and stared at him with wide eyes. You don't need to pay me to do that, sir. Take it, he insisted brusquely. A reluctant smile curved her lips, and she dropped the little bag into her apron pocket. You've been a good master, sir. Don't fret about Lady Holland and Miss Rose. I'll serve them faithfully, and send for you if any trouble arises. Good, he said, and turned to leave. He paused and looked back at her as a question occurred to him. Why did you try to hide the miniature from me, Maud? She blushed a little, but her gaze was direct and honest as she replied, I wished to spare you the sight of him, sir. I know how you feel about Lady Holland, you see. You do, he said neutrally. The maid gave a vigorous nod. She's a dear, gentle lady, and a man would have a heart of stone not to care for her. Maud lowered her voice confidentially. Betwixt ye and me, sir, I think that if my lady were free to choose any man for herself, she might well have set her cap for ye. Tis plain as day that she's fair taken with ye, but Master George took most of her heart with him to the grave. Does she look at his miniature often? Zachary asked, keeping his face expressionless. Maud's round face puckered thoughtfully. Not so often since we came to live on your estate, sir. To my knowledge, she hasn't taken it out at all in the past month or so. Why, there was even a bit of dust that settled on it. For some reason, the information comforted him. Farewell, Maud, he replied, taking his leave. Good luck to you, sir, she said softly. Returning from the garden, Holly went to her room and found her maid sorting through a pile of carefully folded stockings. What progress you've made, Maud, she commented with a wan smile. I'm a lady. I'll be even further along except that the master came to the room and interrupted my chores. 
The words were spoken casually, and Maud continued busily with her task. Holly felt her jaw slacken with surprise. He did? she asked faintly. Whatever for? Was he looking for me? Nay, my lady. He only bade me to take care of you and Miss Rose, and I promised him I would. Oh. Holly reached for a linen underskirt and attempted to fold it efficiently, but it ended up in a wadded bundle that she clutched against her midriff. How kind of him, she whispered. Maud slid her an amused, vaguely pitying glance. I don't think it was kindness that moved him, my lady. He looked as lovesick as a green lad. In fact, he wore the same expression as you this very moment. Seeing the damage that Holly's clutching fingers were inflicting on the neatly pressed underskirt, she clucked and reached out to rescue it. Holly surrendered the garment without protest. Do you have any notion where Mr. Bronson might be right now, Maud? On his way to Durham, I would guess. He seemed in no mood to tarry, my lady. Holly flew to the window, which afforded a view of the front of the mansion. She made a small sound of distress as she saw Bronson's huge, black, lacquered carriage rolling away along the sprawling, tree-lined drive that led to the main road. Her hand flattened on the pane of glass, palm pressed hard against the coolness. Her mouth trembled violently, and she fought to contain her emotions. He was gone, she thought, and soon she would be too. It was all for the best. She was doing the right thing for herself and for him too. Best to let him start a marriage with a young, unspoiled girl with whom he could share all the firsts, the first vows, the first wedding night, the first child. And as for herself, she knew very well that once she returned to the tailors, it might well be her fate to stay there forever. She did not intend to hold Ravenhill to his promise to marry her. It was hardly fair to deny him all the chance of finding someone he truly loved. Back to where I started, Holly whispered with a wobbly smile, thinking of how it would be to resume her life with her husband's family. Except that now she was sadder and a bit wiser, no longer so assured of her own moral infallibility. She stared hard at the carriage until it reached the end of the drive and seemed to disappear in the mass of trees. All you need is a bit of time, my lady, came Maud's comfortingly matter of fact voice from behind her. As you well know, time takes care of per near everything. Holly swallowed and nodded wordlessly, but she knew that the maid was wrong in this instance. No amount of time would soften the passion she felt, a blinding need of body and soul, for Zachary Bronson.
Chapter 15 The tailors accepted Holly's return as a prodigal daughter being welcomed back into the fold. There were comments, of course, as none of them could resist airing their collective opinion that it had been a grave mistake for her to leave in the first place. She had left with a solid gold reputation, and the admiration and respect of their entire wide circle of acquaintances, and she had returned sporting a great deal of tarnish. Financially, the association with Zachary Bronson had done her a great deal of good, but morally and socially she had fallen. Holly didn't care. The tailors would be able to shield her from some, if not all, of the snubs that would come her way. And by the time Rose was eighteen, and possessing of an enormous dowry, there would be suitors aplenty for her, and the long-ago scandal involving her mother would have faded. Holly made no effort to contact Ravenhill, knowing that the rumours of her new location would reach him quickly enough. He came calling not a week after she had moved back to the Taylor home, and he was welcomed eagerly by Thomas and William and their wives. Tall and blonde and prosperous-looking, Ravenhill had the appearance of a knight coming to rescue a damsel in distress. As she joined him in the tailor's formal receiving room, Holly intended to tell him that she had no need of rescuing. However, he soon let her know in his to-the-point way that George's last wishes were also his own. So, you've left the den of iniquity, Ravenhill commented, his face serious, except for the teasing glint in his grey eyes. Holly couldn't suppress a sudden laugh as his irreverence caught her by surprise. Be careful in your association with me, my lord, she warned lightly. Your reputation might be damaged. After three years of unholy carousing in Europe, I assure you I have no reputation left to salvage. Ravenhill's expression seemed to soften as Holly smiled at him. I don't blame you for going to live with the Bronsons, he said. How could I, when it's my fault you were there? I should have come to you years ago and taken care of you as I promised George I would. Varden, regarding that promise... Holly stopped and stared at him helplessly, her cheeks reddening as her thoughts became too entangled to voice. Yes, he prompted gently. I know we agreed to discuss it, she said, distressed. But now I think there's no need. After all, you and I... Ravenhill hushed her gently, his long fingers touching her lips in a feather-light caress. Stunned, Holly did not move as he took her hands in a firm, warm grip. Think of a marriage between intimate friends, he said, who have an agreement to always communicate honestly with each other. A couple who have the same ideals and interests, who enjoy each other's company and treat each other with respect. That is what I want. There is no reason we can't have it together. But you don't love me, Varden, and I don't... I want to give you the protection of my name, he interrupted. But it's not enough to wash away the scandal and the rumours. It's better than what you've got now, he pointed out reasonably. Besides, you're wrong about something. I do love you. I've known you since before you and George were married. I've never respected and liked a woman more. Furthermore, I believe the maxim that a marriage between friends is the best kind of all. Holly understood that he was not referring to the kind of love she'd had with George. Neither was he offering the passionate attachment she shared with Zachary Bronson. This was truly a marriage of convenience, one that would serve both their needs and satisfy George's last request. What if that is not enough for you? she asked quietly. You'll meet someone, Varden. It could be weeks after we are married, or years. But you will some day. A woman you would gladly die for, and you'll want to be with her desperately, and I'll be nothing but a millstone around your neck. He shook his head immediately. I'm not made that way, Holly. I don't believe there's just one person or one true love for each of us. I've had love affairs, three years of them, 
and I'm damn tired of all the histrionics and obsessions and ecstasy and melancholy. I want some peace. A self-mocking smile touched his lips. I want to be a respectable married man, though God knows I'd never imagined myself saying that. Barton. She stared down at the brocade of the settee, using a fingertip to trace the fleur-de-lis pattern worked in gold and burgundy threads. You haven't asked why I left Mr. Bronson's employ so abruptly. A long speculative silence passed before he answered. Do you want to tell me? He didn't seem particularly eager to know the answer. Holly shook her head, while a huff of laughter caught painfully in her throat. Not really. But in light of your proposal, I feel obligated to confess something. I don't want to lie to you, and I don't need to hear your confessions, Holly. Ravenhill caught at her hand and squeezed, his grip steady and comforting. He waited until she brought herself to look into his regretful, brooding grey eyes. I don't want to hear them, he continued, because then I'd have to give you my confessions in return. It's not necessary or productive. So you keep your past, and I'll keep mine. Everyone's allowed to have one or two secrets. Holly felt a warm surge of liking for him. Any woman would be fortunate to have such a husband. It was even possible for her to envision a marriage between them. They would be a bit more than friends, albeit a good deal less than lovers. But the situation felt odd and manufactured, and she frowned as she stared at him. I want to do the right thing. If only I knew what it was, she said. What would feel right to you? Nothing, she confessed, and Ravenhill laughed quietly. Let me court you for a little while, then. We can afford a bit of time. I'll wait until you're convinced this is the best choice for both of us. He paused and then pulled her hands to his shoulders, giving her a faint half-smile, as if daring her to leave them there. She did, although her heart pounded in sudden, panicked awareness of what he was going to do. Ravenhill leaned forward and brushed a light kiss on her lips, lingering only a moment. There was nothing demanding in his kiss, but she sensed the wealth of sexual experience and self-assurance he possessed. She wondered if George would have matured into a man like this, if he would have acquired the same polished worldliness, if his eyes would have acquired the same faint laugh lines at the corners, if his form would have relinquished the lankiness of youth for the same solid, seasoned strength. Ravenhill drew back, his slight smile remaining as Holly withdrew her hands hastily. May I see you tomorrow morning? he asked. We'll go riding in the park. All right, she whispered. Her thoughts were swamped in confusion and she went through the motions of bidding him goodbye and seeing him out. Thankfully, Ravenhill resisted the tailor's attempts to invite him to supper, and he gave Holly a briefly ironic smile that betrayed his thoughts on her in-laws obvious meddling. Olinda, Thomas's tall, elegant, blonde wife, came to stand beside Holly as she remained in the entrance hall. What a handsome man Lord Ravenhill is, she exclaimed admiringly, one never really noticed his looks when compared to George, but now that he is no longer in George's shadow. Suddenly realizing that her remarks might be construed as tactless, she fell silent. He is still in George's shadow, Holly said softly. After all, wasn't this entire situation of George's making? It was all going according to his design. The thought should have been reassuring but it only chafed and annoyed her. Well, Alinda said thoughtfully, I suppose to you every man in the world is inferior to George. He was so remarkable in every way. No one could eclipse him. There was a time, not long ago, when Holly would have agreed automatically. Now, however, she bit her lip and remained silent. 
Sleep was elusive that night. When Holly did finally relax into slumber, it was light and restless, and she was troubled by vivid dreams. She walked through a rose garden, her feet crunching on graveled paths, her eyes squinting from the glare of harsh sunlight. Enchanted by the lush, red blossoms that surrounded her, she reached for one, cupped her hand around the velvety petals, and bent to inhale its fragrance. A sudden, stabbing pain in her finger startled her, and she drew back hastily. There was a bleeding wound at the base of her finger, inflicted by a hidden thorn. Catching sight of a nearby fountain that splashed cool water into a marble basin, she went to soak her injured hand. But the rose bushes gathered and grew around her in a strange, living mass. The blossoms withered and dropped, and all that was left was a wall of sharp, brown thorns imprisoning her on every side. Crying out in distress, Holly shrank into a ball on the ground, while the thorny branches continued to grow around her, and she held her wounded hand against the crashing, agonized beat of her heart. The dream changed then, and she found herself lying on a thick patch of green grass, while something, someone, blocked her view of the sky and clouds overhead. Who is it? Who is it? She begged to know, but the only reply was a soft, low laugh that curled around her like smoke. She felt a man's hands on her, gently lifting her skirts, sliding up her stiff legs, while a hot, delicious mouth pressed over hers. Moaning, she relaxed beneath him, and her sun-dazzled gaze cleared enough to reveal a pair of wicked black eyes staring into hers. Zachary, she gasped, her legs and arms and body opening to receive him, and she twisted in pleasure as she felt his weight lower over her. Oh, Zachary, yes, don't stop. He smiled and covered her breasts with his hands and kissed her, and she groaned in excitement. Zachary! Suddenly Holly jerked awake, startled from sleep by the sound of her own voice. Breathing fast, she stared dizzily at her surroundings. She was alone in bed, pillows heaped around her, sheets tangled around her knees and ankles. Sickening disappointment swept over her, as the last wisps of the dream faded away. She clutched a pillow to her midriff and lay on her side, shaking and burning. Where was Zachary at this very moment? Was he sleeping and dreaming in his solitary bed? Or was he sating his desires in the arms of another woman? Poisonous jealousy engulfed her. She pressed her hands to either side of her head, trying to block the images that crowded her mind. Some other woman might be holding his powerful body against hers, tangling her fingers in his thick, dark hair, feeling him shudder as he took his pleasure within her. It doesn't matter now. I've made my choice, Holly whispered to herself agitatedly. And he said not to come back. It's over. It's over. True to his word, Ravenhill did come to court Holly, calling nearly every day. He accompanied her on rides through the park, picnics with the tailors, and water parties with close friends. Thanks to the tailors' determined protection, these gatherings were fairly uneventful, and Holly was sheltered from blatant snubs. One had to give her late husband's family a great deal of credit for loyalty. They closed ranks around her and defended her zealously, in spite of their own disapproval of her past actions. They did approve of her keeping company with Ravenhill, however. Having known of George's last wishes for Holly and Ravenhill to marry, the family did its best to ensure that there were no impediments to the match. When you and Ravenhill are wed, William, the head of the family, told Holly matter-of-factly, it will put to rest a large measure of the speculation concerning you and Bronson. I should do my best to hurry the procedure along if I were you. I understand, William, Holly replied, though her insides had boiled in rebellion at the unwanted advice. And I thank you for sharing your wisdom. However, 
It is not altogether certain that Ravenhill and I will marry. What? William's blue eyes narrowed in a forbidding skull. Is he showing reluctance to come up to scratch? I'll have a talk with him and sort things out. Don't fret, my dear. He'll march to the altar with you if I have to prod him at gunpoint. No, no, Holly said hastily, her mouth quivering in sudden amusement. There's no need, William. Ravenhill is showing no sign of reluctance. I am the reluctant one, and he is allowing me the time I require to make the decision. What decision is there? What possible reason do you have for dragging your feet? William stared at her impatiently. Let me assure you, if not for this family, you would be a pariah by now. You're treading on the edge of ruin. Marry Ravenhill for God's sake, and preserve what little social standing you have left. Holly contemplated him thoughtfully, her heart softening, as she saw the resemblance he bore to George, though his once thick blonde hair was thinning on top and his blue eyes were stern rather than merry. Taking him by surprise, Holly approached him and kissed his cheek affectionately. You've been very kind to me, my lord. You will have my everlasting gratitude for harboring such a disreputable character as myself. You're not disreputable, he grumbled. You're merely misguided. You need a man, Holland. Like most women, you require the good judgment and common sense that a husband provides. And Ravenhill's a steady sort. Oh, I know about his wild ways in Europe, but every fellow has to sow his oats at one time or another, and that's all in the past. Holly smiled suddenly. Why is it that my association with Mr. Bronson is called scandalous, and Ravenhill's even worse behaviour is merely labelled as sowing oats? This is no time to discuss semantics, William said with an exasperated sigh. The fact is, Holland, that you need a husband if you're to remain in good society, and Ravenhill is an appropriate and willing candidate. Moreover, he is the candidate that my dear brother George recommended, and if George thought that well of him, then so do I. Reflecting on the conversation later, Holly admitted herself that William made sense. Life as Ravenhill's wife would prove far more pleasant than life as a scandal-tainted widow. Her feelings for Varden were clear. She liked and trusted him, and they had an affinity that had been born of long acquaintance with each other. Their companionable relationship was being cemented daily by long walks and lazy afternoons, and suppers at which they jested and confided and smiled at each other over the rims of sparkling crystal wine-glasses. But Holly waited in vain for some inner signal that would let her know it was time. Time to banish Zachary Bronson from her mind and heart, and proceed with George's wishes. However, her longing for Zachary did not fade. It became even more intense, if that was possible, until she found it difficult to eat or sleep. She had not been this acutely miserable since George's death. It seemed that her vision was covered in a dull, grey film, and aside from reading and playing with Rose, there was little purpose to her days. One week passed, and another, until a full month had gone by since she had left the Bronsons. Holly awakened early after yet another sleepless night and went to the window. She pushed aside the heavy velvet drapes and stared at the street below, illuminated by the lavender light of dawn. Coal smoke drifted over the city in a gentle fog, softening the jagged horizon of buildings and homes. Inside the house, early morning noises began. Maids opening shutters, lighting fires, laying the hearths and preparing breakfast trays. Another day, she thought, and felt unaccountably weary at the prospect of bathing, dressing and arranging her hair, and picking listlessly at a breakfast she had no desire to eat. She wanted to crawl back into bed and pull the covers over her head. I should be happy, she said aloud, puzzled by her own inner emptiness. The kind of well-ordered life she had always expected and planned for and enjoyed was easily within her reach. 
but she didn't want it any longer. A brief memory flashed through her mind of the occasion when she and Rose had gone to the shoemakers for a fitting, and Holly had tried on a pair of exquisite new custom-made walking shoes. Although the shoemaker had used the same pattern as always, something about the stitching or the stiff new leather had made the shoes pinch unbearably. Ah, they're too tight, Holly had commented ruefully, and Rose had exclaimed with delighted pride, "That means you're growing, Mamma." Returning to this life with the Taylors and contemplating marriage with Varden was exactly like trying on those tight shoes. For better or worse, she had grown out of this particular life. All those months with the Bronsons had made her, if perhaps not a better woman, at least a different one. What to do now? By force of habit, Holly went to the night table and picked up her miniature of George. The sight of his face would give her the comfort and strength, and perhaps a bit of guidance. However, as she stared at her husband's serene young features, a startling realization came over her. The sight of George did not bring her peace. She no longer yearned for his arms, his voice, his smile. Incredible as it seemed, she had fallen in love with another man. She loved Zachary Bronson as deeply as she had ever loved her husband. Only with Zachary did she feel alive and whole. She missed his provocative, earthy conversations, and the dark-eyed glances that contained sardonic amusement, or anger, or knee-weakening lust. She missed the way he had seemed to fill a room with his charismatic presence, the torrent of plans and ideas that flowed from him. The boundless energy that had swept her along in a fast-moving current. Life without him was slow and dark and unbearably dull. Realizing that she was breathing in strange little gasps, Holly put her hand over her mouth. She loved him, and it terrified her. For months, her heart had resisted the inexorable pull of her growing feelings. She had been desperately afraid to have her soul torn apart by loss once again. And so it had been easier and safer not to let herself fall in love. That had been the real obstacle between herself and Zachary, not her promise to George, not the differences in their backgrounds, not any of the inconsequential issues she had thrown between them. Setting down the miniature, Holly unbraided her hair and dragged a silver-backed brush over the rumpled locks in frantic, ruthless strokes. The urge to run to Zachary was overwhelming. She wanted to dress and have a carriage readied and go to him this very minute and try to explain why she had made such a mess of things. But was it really the best choice for them to join their lives together? Their pasts, their expectations, their very natures were so radically different. Would any rational person advise them to marry? The notion that love would make everything all right was a ridiculous cliché, an overly simplified answer to a complicated problem, and yet. Sometimes the simple answers were the best ones. Perhaps the small issues could be sorted out later. Perhaps all that really mattered was the truth that existed in her heart. She would go to him. She decided resolutely. She only feared that she had burned her bridges where Zachary was concerned. He had made it clear that she should not try to come back to him. He would not welcome her. Replacing the brush on the dressing table with great care. Holly stared into the looking glass. She was pale and tired looking, with smudges beneath the eyes. Hardly a face to compare with the alluring beauties that Zachary was undoubtedly surrounded with. However, if there was a chance that he still wanted her, it was worth the risk of rejection. Her heart pounded violently, and she felt weak all over. She went to the armoire and searched for one of the guns he had bought her. One of the vibrant creations she had never worn. If he took her back, she vowed silently, she would never wear a grey dress again. Finding the jade green Italian silk with its stylish pointed cuffs, she shook out the gleaming skirts and laid the gown carefully on the bed. Just as she began to rummage for fresh linen undergarments, there came a quiet tap on the door, and it clicked open. Milady, Maud called softly, entering the room. She seemed surprised yet relieved to see that Holly was awake. 
Oh, my lady, I'm glad to see you're already up and about. The housekeeper came to fetch me not five minutes ago. It seems there's someone here to see you, and she insists on staying till you come down. Holly frowned curiously. Well, who is it, Maud? Tis Miss Elizabeth Bronson, my lady. She wrote here herself from the Bronson estate. Why, it must be seven miles at least, and her without a groom for company. Help me dress quickly, Maud. Oh, something must be wrong for Elizabeth to come here at such an hour by herself. Hurriedly she sat on a chair and began to jerk on a stocking, not bothering to keep the seam straight. In her impatience it seemed to take forever to dress and pin her hair up. She hastened downstairs to the tailor's receiving room, where a maid had already set out a little coffee tray for the visitor. The rest of the family had not yet arisen, for which Holly was grateful. If any of the tailors were awake, it would have been impossible to keep them from meddling. She felt a rush of gladness as she saw Elizabeth's tall, striking figure striding back and forth in the receiving room. She had missed the girl terribly. Lizzie, she exclaimed. As vibrant and beautiful and impetuous as always, Elizabeth turned and strode toward her. My lady! She seized Holly in a spontaneous hug, and the two of them laughed together. Lizzie, you look so well, Holly said, drawing back to view the girl's sparkling dark eyes and pink-cheeked face. Elizabeth was dressed in the height of fashion, a stylish blue riding habit with a white gauze scarf at her throat and a little velvet hat trimmed with blue dyed feathers. She seemed as robustly healthy as ever, but there was a pinched look of unhappiness around her eyes, and her barely suppressed frustration was almost palpable. I'm not, Elizabeth said, clearly eager to unburden herself. I'm not well at all. I'm unhappy and sour and ready to murder my brother and... Her gaze swept over Holly. Oh, my lady, you look so tired. And you've lost weight, at least half a stone. It's because I no longer have your brother ordering plates of cakes for me at every turn, Holly replied with forced lightness. She gestured for the girl to join her on the settee. Sit with me, and tell me what has impelled you to ride across town alone. You remember how often I told you that a young lady must not travel without a companion. Oh, damn propriety, Elizabeth exclaimed passionately, her eyes flashing. I was thinking more of your safety, Holly said dryly. If your horse picked up a stone or stumbled, you would be forced to request the help of strangers who might... Damn safety, the girl interrupted. Everything is dreadfully wrong, and I don't know how to fix things. You're the only one I have to turn to. Holly's pulse surged in an anxious, unsteady rhythm. Is it Mr. Bronson, or your mother? It's Zack, of course. Elizabeth scowled and fidgeted on the settee, clearly desiring to jump up and pace around the room again. I don't believe I've seen him sober for the past month. Since you left... He's turned into a selfish monster. He hasn't a kind word to say to anyone, and he's demanding and impossible to please. He spends every night with wastrels and demi-mondaine, and he spends all day drinking and sneering at everyone who crosses his path. That doesn't sound at all like your brother, Holly said quietly. I haven't even begun to describe the situation. He doesn't seem to care about anyone. Not me or Mama, not even himself. I've tried to be patient with him, but then this last thing happened, and now I don't... What last thing? Holly asked, trying to make sense of the rapid stream of words. Suddenly, a smile broke through Elizabeth's gloomy report. Your cousin, Mr. Summers, proposed to me. He did? Holly smiled in immediate pleasure. So you brought him up to scratch, did you? Yes, I did. The girl crowed, wriggling in joy and triumph. Jason loves me, and I return his feelings a hundred times over. I never thought love would be so glorious. My dear Lizzie, I'm so happy for you, as I'm certain your family must be. The comment seemed to bring Elizabeth plummeting back to unpleasant reality. There is one member of my family who is not happy, she said grimly. Zack has forbidden the match. 
He says under no circumstances will he support a union between Mr. Summers and I. He did what? Holly shook her head incredulously. But why? My cousin is a perfectly respectable man with excellent prospects. What reason did your brother give for his objections? Zack said that Jason isn't good enough for me. He said I must marry a man with a title and a fortune, and I can do better than a mere architect from a family of mediocre origins. It's the most appalling piece of snobbery I've ever witnessed, and from my brother of all people. Holly stared at her in bewilderment. How did you respond, Elizabeth? The girl's face hardened with resolve. I told Zack the truth, that it doesn't matter whether he approves the match or not. I intend to marry Jason Summers. I don't care if Zack comes forth with a dowry or not. Jason says he will be able to provide for me, and it doesn't matter to him if I'm an heiress or a pauper. I don't need a carriage or jewels or a large house to be happy. But my lady, what kind of beginning to a marriage is this? My mother is distraught. My brother and fiancé are enemies. The family is being torn apart, all because of... She stopped and buried her face in her hands, on the verge of frustrated tears. Because of what? Holly prompted softly. Elizabeth glanced through her fingers, dark gaze glimmering. Well, she mumbled, I suppose I was going to say because of you, although that sounds like an accusation, and I certainly don't mean it that way. But my lady, it's a fact that Zack changed when you left. I suppose I was too self-absorbed to notice what was happening between the two of you, but now I realise. My brother fell in love with you, didn't he? And you wouldn't have him. I know you must have had good reason for leaving us. You were so clever and wise, and you must... No, Lizzie, Holly managed to whisper. I'm not clever or wise, not in the least. And I know you're accustomed to a very different sort of man than Zack which is why I would never dare presume that you might care for him in the same way. But I've come here to ask you something. Elizabeth bent her head and blotted a few leaking tears with her sleeve. Please go to him, she said huskily. Talk to him. Say something to bring him to his senses. I've never seen him behave like this, and I think you may be the only person in the world he might listen to. Just make him reasonable again. If you don't, he's going to ruin himself and drive away everyone who cares for him. Oh, Lizzie. Compassionately, Holly slid her arm around the girl's narrow back and held her close. They sat together for at least a minute. Finally, Holly spoke in a quiet voice. He won't want to see me. No, Elizabeth agreed with a sigh. Zack doesn't allow your name to be spoken. He pretends you don't exist. The words made Holly feel hollow and afraid. All I can promise you is that I will try. He may refuse to speak with me, however. Elizabeth sighed and glanced out the window at the approaching daylight. I must be off. I have to return home before breakfast. I don't want Zack to suspect where I've been. You'll allow one of the tailor's grooms to escort you back home. Holly said firmly, it's too dangerous to ride by yourself. Elizabeth hung her head with a wobbly, repentant smile. All right, my lady. I'll let him come with me to the very end of the drive, as long as he takes care not to be visible from the main house. She glanced at Holly hopefully. When will you go to see Zack, my lady? I don't know, Holly confessed, while excitement and fear and hope meshed inside her. I suppose, when I can summon the nerve. Chapter 16 In the whirlwind of her thoughts, Holly had forgotten that she had agreed to go riding with Ravenhill, her would-be fiancé, that morning. Long after Elizabeth Bronson had departed, Holly sat in the receiving room with a lukewarm cup of tea in her hand. She stared into the tepid, milky liquid and groped for words, the right words to convince Zachary to forgive and trust her once more. It seemed there would be no graceful way to address the subject. She would simply have to throw herself on his mercy 
and hope for the best. A bleak, ironic smile curved her lips as she reflected that her own social training had included a hundred polite ways to rebuff a gentleman, but no instruction on how to win one back afterward. Knowing all about Zachary's fierce pride and his formidable defences, she knew he would not succumb to her easily. He would make her pay for the way she had fled from him. He would demand unconditional surrender. Good Lord! What thoughts are putting such a dour expression on your lovely face? Barden, Lord Ravenhill, advanced in the room, his tall, athletic form dressed in a dark riding habit. Golden-haired, quietly dashing, his movements spare and confident, he was any woman's dream of the perfect man. Staring at him with a wistful smile, Holly reflected that it was time to begin burning bridges. Good morning, my lord. She gestured for him to sit beside her. You're not dressed for riding, he observed. Am I too early? Or have you changed your mind about this morning? I've changed my mind about a good many things, I'm afraid. Ah, I sense you're leading into a gravely important discussion. He gave her a teasing smile, but the grey eyes turned watchful. Varden... I'm so afraid I'll lose your friendship after you hear what I wish to say. Gently he took her hand, turned it and bent his head to press a kiss to her palm. When his gaze returned to hers, it was serious, kind and steady. Darling friend, you won't ever lose me, no matter what you do or say. A month of companionship had built a great sense of trust between them, allowing Holly to speak with a blunt honesty that Ravenhill deserved. I've decided that I don't want to marry you. He did not blink or exhibit any flicker of surprise. I'm sorry to hear that, he said softly. You deserve nothing less than a love match, she continued in a rush, a true, passionate, wonderful love with a woman you cannot live without, and I... And you, he prompted retaining her hand in a careful grip. I'm going to somehow gather the courage to go to Mr. Bronson and ask him to take me as his wife. A long, thoughtful silence ensued as he absorbed the words. You realize that if you join with him, many in the town will deem it a complete fall from grace. There are circles that will no longer accept you. It doesn't matter... Holly assured him with a choked laugh. My perfect, sterling reputation was cold comfort in the years after George passed away. I'll trade it gladly for the chance to be loved. I'm only sorry that it's taken me so long to realize what is truly important. Since George, I have been terrified to risk my heart again, and because of that I've lied to myself and everyone. Then go to Bronson and tell him the truth. She smiled at him, astonished by the simplicity of the answer. Varden, you were supposed to tell me about my duty, about honour and what I owe to George. Darling Holland, he said, you're facing an entire lifetime without George. Use your God-given sense to decide what is best for you and Rose. If you decide to cast your lot with Bronson, I'll accept your choice. You surprise me, my lord. I want you to be happy. There are few enough chances in life for that, and I wouldn't be chill enough to stand in your way. Ravenhill's matter-of-factness, his gentlemanly acceptance of her wishes, seemed to ease the painful vice that had clamped around her heart. Holly threw him a brilliant smile of gratitude. I wish everyone would react the same way you have. They won't, he assured her dryly and they both smiled at their joined hands before Holly gently drew hers away. Would George have liked Mr. Bronson, do you think? she heard herself ask. A glint of laughter appeared in his silver-grey eyes. Well, no, I don't think they would have had enough in common for that. Bronson is a little too raw and unprincipled to have suited George's taste. But does that really matter to you? No, she confessed. I still want Mr. Bronson. Taking her hands, 
Ravenhill pulled her to her feet. Then go to him. But before you leave, I want a promise from you. No more promises, she said with a groaning laugh. They cause me such misery. This one I'll have from you, though. Promise me that if something goes wrong for you, ever, you'll come to me. Yes, Holly said, closing her eyes as she felt his warm lips touch her forehead. And Varden, you must believe me. In my view, you have completely fulfilled the vow you made to George. You were a good, true friend to him, and an even better one to me. He slid a strong arm around her and hugged her tightly for answer. Holly's nerves were shredded by the time her carriage rolled to a halt at the crown of the Bronson estate drive. The footman opened the door and assisted her to the ground, while another went to knock at the door. Mrs. Burney's face was visible at the front door, and Holly suppressed a shaky laugh as she reflected that she would never have expected to feel such gladness at the sight of the housekeeper. The house and every servant in it seemed wonderfully familiar. She felt as if she were returning home. However, her stomach tightened with a fearful pang as she considered the possibility that Zachary Bronson might dispatch her from the estate as soon as he saw her. The housekeeper wore a distinctly uncomfortable expression as Holly approached her. She curtsied, and then stood with her hands twisted together. My lady, she said, it is good to see you. Mrs. Burney, Holly replied pleasantly, I trust you were doing well. The housekeeper gave her an evasive smile. Well enough, although, her tone lowered, nothing has been quite the same since you left. The master. She fell abruptly silent, clearly recalling that a servant must respect the privacy of the family she or he served. I've come to see Mr. Bronson. In Holly's anxiety, she flushed and stammered like a girl in her teens. I... I'm very sorry not to have given advance notice of my arrival, and for coming at such an early hour, but it's rather urgent, you see. My lady, Mrs. Burney said softly, regretfully, I don't know how to tell you this, but the master saw your carriage from the window, and he, well, he is not receiving visitors. Her voice dropped to a whisper, and her wary gaze flickered to the footman waiting in the distance. He is not well, my lady. Not well? Holly was startled. Has he fallen ill, Mrs. Burney? Not precisely. The housekeeper must mean that he had been drinking then. Perturbed, Holly considered the situation. Perhaps I should return another time, she said softly, when Mr. Bronson is a bit more clear-headed. Mrs. Burney's expression was brittle with distress. I don't know when that will be, my lady. Their gazes met. Although the housekeeper would never dare express her own opinions or wishes, Holly had the feeling Mrs. Burney was silently urging her to stay. I would not wish to disturb Mr. Bronson, of course, Holly said. But I fear that during my previous residence here... I may have left a few uh, odds and ends in my room. Would you have any objections if I went to search for them? The housekeeper was clearly relieved by the suggestion. No, my lady, she said at once, seizing on the excuse. No objections at all. Of course you must find your belongings if you've left them here. Shall I accompany you, or are you able to remember the way? I remember the way. Holly gave her a brilliant smile. I'll just slip upstairs unaccompanied. Please, would you tell me where Mr. Bronson is, so that I may be able to avoid disturbing him? I believe he is in his room, my lady. Thank you, Mrs. Burney. Holly walked into the house, which had the atmosphere of a mausoleum. The massive central hall, with its towering gold columns and silver-coffered ceiling and flower-scented air, was gleaming and dark. Not a single soul was visible amid the opulent gloom. Afraid that she might encounter Paula or Elizabeth and be distracted from her mission, 
Holly ascended the great staircase as rapidly as her feet would allow. The exertion, not to mention her own trepidations, caused her heart to pound wildly in her chest until she felt its reverberations in every limb. The thought of seeing Zachary again caused such excitement inside her that she nearly felt ill. Trembling all over, she went to his door, which had been left slightly ajar. She considered knocking, then decided against it, as she did not want to give him the opportunity of shutting her out. Gently, she pushed the door open, and it gave a faint, almost unnoticeable squeak. She had never actually stepped inside Zachary's bedroom during the period of her residence at the estate. Rich blue brocade and velvet draped the massive mahogany bed. Dark cherry wood panelling gleamed from the light shed by the row of four towering rectangular windows. Zachary was standing at one of the windows, having parted a fringed velvet curtain to stare down at the front drive. He held a glass of liquor in his hand. His hair was still wet and gleaming from a morning bath, and the scent of shaving soap lingered in the air. He was dressed in a plum silk robe that reached nearly to the floor, bare feet protruding from beneath the hem. Holly had forgotten how impossibly large he was. She was glad his back was still turned, so he wouldn't see the yearning shiver that ran through her. What did she say? he asked in a low growl, evidently thinking she was Mrs. Burney. Holly fought to keep her voice steady. I'm afraid she insisted on seeing you. Zachary's broad back stiffened, muscles bulging beneath the thin covering of silk as he realized the identity of the intruder. It seemed to take him a moment to find his voice. Get out, he said quietly, without heat. Go back to Ravenhill. Lord Ravenhill has no claim on me, she whispered, her throat clenching. Nor I on him. Slowly, Zachary turned around. There was a slight tremor in his fingers that sent the amber liquid in his glass sloshing against the sides. He took a deep swallow of the liquor, his cold, black gaze never leaving her. He looked composed, though his face was undeniably haggard. There were circles beneath his eyes, and the healthy bronze colour of his skin had turned ashen from too much time spent drinking indoors. Holly's gaze swept over him hungrily, and she ached to run to him, stroke and soothe and hold him. Please, God, don't let him send me away, she thought desperately. She hated the way he looked at her. The black eyes that had once been filled with teasing warmth and passion, now so flat and indifferent. He regarded her as if she were a stranger, as if he had no feeling left for her. What does that mean? He spoke in a monotone, as if the subject held no interest for him. Marshalling her courage, Holly closed the door and approached him, then stopped a few feet away. Lord Ravenhill and I agreed to remain friends, but there will be no wedding. I told him that I could not keep my promise to George because... She paused and nearly shriveled from dismay as she saw Zachary's complete lack of reaction to the news. Because, he prompted in a monotone. Because my heart is otherwise engaged. A long, nerve-wracking silence followed her admission. Oh, why didn't he say something? Why did he look so callous and indifferent? That was a mistake, he finally said. No, she stared at him beseechingly. My mistake was in leaving here, leaving you, and I've come to explain things and ask you. Holly, don't. Zachary let out a taut breath and shook his head. You don't have to explain a damned thing. I understand why you left. A self-deprecating smile touched his lips. After a month of reflection and swilling like a pig at his trough, I accepted your decision. You made the best choice. You were right. It would have come to a bad end between us. 
God knows it's better to preserve a few enjoyable memories and leave things as they are. The finality in his voice stunned Holly. Please, she said unsteadily, don't say another word. Just listen to me. I owe you the complete truth, and after you hear it, if you still want to send me away, then I will go. But I won't leave until I've said my piece, and you'll stand right there and listen, and if you don't... If I don't, he asked with a ghost of his old smile, then I'll never let you have a moment's peace, she threatened in suppressed panic. I'll follow you everywhere. I'll shout at the top of my lungs. Zachary finished his drink and went to the night table, where a bottle of brandy awaited. The sight gave Holly a tiny thrill of hope. He wouldn't still be drinking if he had lost all feeling for her, would he? All right, he said brusquely, refilling his glass. Say your piece. You have my attention for the next five minutes, after which I want your troublesome little ass off my estate. Agreed? Agreed. Holly bit her lip and lowered her hands to her sides. It was difficult to strip her soul bare before him, but that was precisely what was required if she was to win him back. I loved you from the beginning, she said, forcing herself to look directly at him. I can see that now, although at the time I didn't realize what was happening. I haven't wanted to face the truth, that I am exactly what you called me. A coward. Her gaze searched Zachary's dark face for a reaction to her admission, but there was no sign of emotion. He downed another two fingers of brandy, consuming the distillation with slow, deliberate swallows. When George died in my arms, Holly continued raggedly, I wanted to die too. I never wanted to feel such pain again and I knew the safest thing would be to never let myself love anyone that way. And so I used my promise to George as an excuse to hold you at bay. Holly paused uncertainly, realizing that for some reason her words had caused a flush to rise from Zachary's throat to his ears. Taking courage from that tell-tale wash of color, she forced herself to go on. I was willing to use any reason I could find to keep from loving you, and then, when you and I, in the summer house, too distraught to look at him any longer, Holly lowered her head. I had never felt that way before, she said. I was utterly lost. I had no control over my heart or my thoughts, and so I was frantic to leave you. Ever since then I've tried to step back into my old life, but the fit isn't right any more. I've changed. Because of you. Suddenly she could barely see him through a scalding rush of tears. I finally realized that there is something worse than possibly losing you. And that is never having you at all. Her voice cramped and faltered, and she could only whisper, Please let me stay, Zachary, on any terms you desire. Don't make me live without you. I love you so desperately. The room was as quiet as a tomb, with no sound or movement from the man standing several feet away. If he still wanted her, if he still cared, she thought, he would have taken her in his arms by now. The realization made her want to shrink into nothing. A dull, pervasive pain began to seep from her chest. She wondered what she would do after he sent her away, where she would go, how she would go about building a new life for herself and Rose, when all she wanted to do was draw into a ball and howl with bitter regret. Staring hard at the floor, she shuddered with the effort not to break into humiliating sobs. Zachary's bare feet came into her vision, and she started in surprise, for he had come to her as silently as a cat. He took her left hand, paused, and stared down at it wordlessly. Suddenly, Holly understood what he was looking at. The gold wedding band that she had never removed since the day her husband had placed it on her finger. Making a wretched sound, she snatched her hand from his and tugged at the ring. It was difficult to remove, 
and she twisted at it in a spasm of panic before it finally slid free. Dropping the circlet to the floor, she looked at the pale mark it had left on her finger and raised her tear-filled eyes to Zachary's blurred face. She heard him murmur her name, and then, to her utter astonishment, she saw him sink to his knees and felt his huge hands clutching the folds of silk at her hips. He buried his face against her midriff like an exhausted child. Shocked, Holly reached down to his dark hair. The thick, slightly curling strands were damp against her fingertips, and she stroked them lovingly. Darling, she whispered over and over, touching the hot nape of his neck. Suddenly, he rose in a fluid movement and stared into her upturned face. He wore the expression of a man who had journeyed through hell fire and been scorched in the process. Damn you, he muttered, wiping at her tears with his fingers. I could throttle you for putting a spoke through this. You told me not to come back, she sobbed in painful relief. I was so afraid to try. You sounded so final. I thought I was losing you. I didn't know what the hell I was saying. He crushed her against his pounding heart, running his hands over her hair and completely dishevelling it. You said no second chances. A thousand chances for you. A hundred thousand. I'm sorry, she wept. I'm so sorry. I want you to marry me, Zachary said in a guttural voice. I'm going to bind you with every agreement and contract and ritual known to man. Yes, yes. Eagerly she pulled his head down to hers, kissing him with all the aching longing she had felt the past month. He made a rough sound and savaged her mouth with brutal passion, hurting her a little, but she was too wild with emotion to mind. I want you in my bed, he said thickly. Now. A crimson flood of colour swept over her, and Holly barely managed to nod before he picked her up and carried her to the bed with the single-minded intensity of a starved jungle cat with its prey. It appeared she hadn't much choice in the matter, not that she had any thought of denying him. She loved him beyond propriety, beyond morals or ideals or sanity. She was his utterly, just as he was hers. He undressed her swiftly, pulling hard at rows of buttons and hooks, tearing cloth when it would not yield quickly enough to his plundering fingers. Gasping at his urgency, Holly tried to help him, sitting on the bed to unlace her shoes, peeling away her garters and stockings, lifting her arms as he tugged her chemise over her head. When she was completely naked, her blushing body reclining back on the mattress, Zachary shed his robe and lowered himself beside her, the sight of his magnificent body, long and powerful and supremely masculine, caused Holly's eyes to widen. Oh, Zachary, you are such a beautiful man. She gathered herself against the wonderful wealth of hair on his chest, playing with the dark curls, brushing her mouth and fingers through them. A faint groan came from over her head. You're the beautiful one. His hands moved gently over her back and hips, savouring the texture of her skin. I never recovered from my first glance at you, at the Belmont Ball. You saw me then, but it was dark outside. I followed you after I kissed you in the conservatory. He pushed her to her back, his gaze sweeping over her naked body. I watched as you went to your carriage, and I thought you were the loveliest thing I had ever seen. He pressed a kiss to her shoulder, his tongue touching the fragile curve, and Holly trembled. And you began to scheme, she said breathlessly. That's right. I thought of a hundred ways to get under your skirts, and I decided the best plan was to hire you. But somewhere in the middle of my efforts to seduce you, I fell in love with you. And your intentions became honourable, she said, pleased. No, I still wanted to get under your skirts. Zachary Bronson, she exclaimed, and he grinned, bracing his forearms on either side of her head. Holly felt her pulse quicken with anticipation, 
as the length of one hard, hair-dusted leg insinuated between her thighs, and the burning, silken weight of his sex pressed intimately against her hip. That afternoon in the summer house was the best damn thing that ever happened to me, he said. But the way you left me right afterward, it was like being cast from heaven straight to hell. I was afraid, she said remorsefully, pulling his head down and kissing his cheeks and brandy-flavoured mouth. So was I. I didn't know how I was going to recover from you. You make me sound like an illness, she said with a wavering smile. A hot glow appeared in his sable eyes. I've discovered there's no cure for you, my lady. I thought of going to another woman, but I couldn't. The hell of it is, you're the only one I want. Then you haven't. Holly was filled with relief. The thoughts of Zachary making love to other women in her absence had tormented her, and she was overwhelmed with gladness that he hadn't. No, I haven't, he informed her, his tone lowering to a growl that was only half feigned. I've gone a month without relief, and you're going to pay for it. Holly's eyes closed, and all her nerves sparked wildly as she heard his threatening whisper in her ear. For the next few hours, my lady, you're going to be damned busy taking care of my needs. Yes, she whispered. Yes, that's what I want to. Her words were cut short as Zachary bent his head over her breast. His hot breath fanned over the tender nipple until it contracted, and then he took it in his mouth. Holly's entire body tensed as he used the tip of his tongue to feather and tickle the sensitive peak. She put her arms around his shoulders, her fingers splayed wide over the hard slopes of muscle. He drew the taut nipple deeper into his mouth, suckling for long minutes, until he felt her thighs closing rhythmically on either side of his leg. His hand slid between her legs, expertly finding the touch of moisture hidden among the springy curls. Whispering softly, he parted the soft, feminine flesh to discover the peak that ached so sweetly. He teased her, sliding his fingertip around the tiny nub, but never quite touching it, until she gasped and lifted her hips beseechingly. Please, she whispered, through lips that felt swollen and hot. Please, Zachary. She felt his mouth brush hers, a delicious pressure that made her surge upward in an eager search for more. He kissed her again, his tongue exploring her mouth while she responded with utter abandon. His body shifted over hers, and she felt his sex nudge against her, the broad head nestling in the triangle of dark curls. Encouraged by his hoarse murmur, Holly reached down to the heavy shaft, her hand trembling a little as she closed it around the hardness. She stroked him hesitantly, and her face turned scarlet as his own hand covered hers, and moved it in a rougher, harder caress. Shouldn't I be more gentle with you? she asked, somehow mortified and excited at the same time. Men aren't like women, he said raspily. You prefer gentleness. All we require is enthusiasm. Wordlessly, Holly demonstrated her enthusiasm until he removed her hand with a curse and a groan. Enough! he managed to say. I don't want this to end too soon. I do. Holly threw her arms around him and spread kisses over his chest and throat. I want you. Oh, Zachary, I want... That feeling I gave you in the summer house, he whispered, his eyes gleaming with wicked knowledge. Holly nodded against his throat and spread herself beneath him, her body taut and trembling with the need to be taken, claimed, possessed... He drew his hand in a slow, searching path over her breasts, stomach, abdomen, and she made an excited sound as his palm brushed over the small, curly patch of hair at the apex of her thighs. His fingers were clever and maddeningly elusive, dipping into the curls with light touches, never quite reaching the place that had become hot and embarrassingly saturated. Her hips lifted urgently, searching for the stimulation he withheld, and then she felt his mouth slide over her skin in a trail from her breasts to her stomach. 
his hands closed over her hips, squeezing and steadying, and Holly jumped in surprise as she felt his mouth drift over the moist curls. She exclaimed something, an incoherent sound that could have been either protest or encouragement, and Zachary's dark head lifted as he glanced at her flushed face. My sweet, proper lady, he said softly, have I shocked you? Yes, she whimpered. Put your legs over my shoulders. She stared at him in helpless mortification. Zachary, I couldn't. Now. And he breathed between her thighs, making her entire body quiver. She closed her eyes and did it, resting her calves and heels on his muscled back. His fingers stroked and opened her, and then she felt his mouth, the slide of his tongue, and the pleasure of it seized her in a swift, scorching whirl. It did not seem possible that this could be happening to her, this terrible, sweet intimacy that threw her into utter confusion. She felt him nibbling, licking, and the sensation thickened and spread inside her until she made sounds she had never made before. Her mewling gasps and pleas seemed to excite her bold lover. He growled a little and gripped her buttocks with his hands, urging her higher against his mouth. His tongue swirled and teased until she felt the pleasure rushing too fast and hot to bear. She gave a wild cry, the torment flowing into quivering release. His mouth remained upon her until the last exquisite tremor had faded and she was left weak and dazed. Easing her trembling legs away from his back, Zachary moved over her, his powerful, sleek body settling into the cradle of her hips. She felt the big, insistent shape of his sex pressing against her. Zachary, have mercy, she whispered through dry lips. No mercy for you, my lady. He cupped her head in his hands, kissing her as he pushed inside her wet, swollen flesh. She inhaled sharply writhing to accommodate him, the plundering invasion stretching her tight. He spread her legs with his own and filled her more deeply, until she moaned into the depths of his mouth. The feel of him excited her, and despite her weariness, she arched in welcome. He began a steady rhythm, his hips delving into hers, the hair on his chest brushing over the hardened tips of her breasts, she tilted her head back in ecstasy as she felt him cover her neck with kisses and gentle bites. You're mine, he whispered, riding her faster, his rhythm turning impatient. You belong to me, Holly, forever. Yes, she moaned as he drove the sensation to another peak. Tell me. I love you, Zachary. Oh, I need you so much. Only you. He rewarded her with a thrust that reached the tip of her womb, and she convulsed with pleasure, shuddering, pulsing, overwhelmed by a physical joy that had been, until now, unimaginable. His body went incredibly taut over hers, muscles bunching into steely curves, his throat catching on a groan. Her flesh worked sweetly on his, closing around the invading hardness as he pumped and throbbed inside her. Sighing deeply, Holly wrapped her arms and legs around him, holding him tightly as the sensation subsided to a warm glow. She felt him try to move off her, and she murmured a protest. I'll crush you, he whispered. I don't care. Smiling, he moved to his side and kept her with him, their bodies still joined. That was even better than in the summer house, Holly said wonderingly. A quiet laugh rumbled in Zachary's chest. There are many things I'm going to enjoy teaching you. Her faint smile dissolved as she considered the prospect. Zachary, she said gravely, I can't help but wonder if a man like you will be content to stay with just one woman. He cupped her face in his hands and pressed his lips to her forehead. Drawing back, he stared into her questioning brown eyes. I've been searching for you my entire life, he said seriously. You're the only one I want, now and forever. If you don't believe me, I'll... I believe you, she said hastily, touching her fingers to his lips. 
She smiled into his dark face. There's no need for proof or promises. It would be no trouble to prove it again. He nudged deeper inside her, making her gasp a little, and she cuddled against him with a pleasured moan. No, I want to talk, she said breathlessly. I want to ask you something. Hmm? He stroked her buttocks, seeming to delight in the soft shapes in his hands. Why did you turn away Mr. Summers when he came to ask for Elizabeth's hand in marriage? The question distracted him, and he glanced alertly into her face. His black brows lowered in a slight scowl. How did you know about that? Looping her arms around his neck, she shook her head with a faint smile. Answer my question, please. He swore a little and dropped his head to the pillow. I turned him away because I'm testing him. Testing him? Holly repeated. Considering the words, she drew apart from Zachary, wincing a little as his heavy shaft slipped from her body. But why? You can't possibly think he only wants to marry Elizabeth because of her... your fortune. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Zachary, you can't manipulate people as if they're pawns in a chess game. Especially people in your own family. I'm only trying to protect Lizzie's interests. If Summers still wants her without my approval, and the dowry that comes with it, then he'll pass the test. Zachary. Holly shook her head with a disapproving sigh. She drew the bed linens over herself and contemplated him while he lounged unabashedly naked beside her. Your sister loves this man. You must respect her choice. And even if she and Mr. Summers do pass this test of yours, they will never forgive you for it, and you'll have caused an irreparable breach in the family. What do you want me to do? You know, she murmured. Cuddling closer to him, she blew gently into the curls on his chest. Damn it, Holly. I've spent my whole life doing things a certain way, and I can't change that. It's my nature to protect myself and my family from all the bastards who tried to take advantage of us. And I'll admit I've become set in my ways. If you're going to try and turn me into some kind of milk toast... Of course not. She drew her tongue over the jutting edge of his collarbone and delved into the hollow where his pulse beat strongly. I wouldn't want to change you in any way. Pressing her face against his throat, she let her long eyelashes tickle his skin... But I want so much for your sister to be happy, Zachary. Would you deny her the same joy that you and I have found? Forget this wretched test and send for Mr. Summers. She sensed his inner struggle, the desire to control the situation warring with the gentler side of his nature. As she continued to entreat and caress him, however, he gave a reluctant laugh. His hands came up to her soft, white shoulders, pressing her back to the flattened pillow. I don't like being managed, he grumbled. She smiled at him. I'm not trying to manage you, my darling. I'm only making an appeal to your higher nature. The endearment caused his expression to become hungry and absorbed, and the argument seemed to lose interest for him. As I once told you, my lady, I have no higher nature. But you'll send for Mr. Summers? she prompted, and settle things for Elizabeth. Yes. Later. He dragged away the layers of linen that covered her and settled a hand over her breast. But Zachary, she said, gasping a little as he spread her knees, you can't possibly do this again. Not so soon after. The feel of his hard length sliding inside her caused all words to fade into an astonished moan. Damned if I can't, he muttered tenderly against her breast, catching a flushed nipple between his teeth, and for a long time all conversation stopped. Holly held Zachary's hand as they wandered along the wilderness walk of his estate garden. Her skirts brushed clumps of purple and white crocuses, while a light spring breeze stirred through yellow irises and gleaming white snowdrops that were strewn along the borders of the grassy walk. 
Long, thick ribbons of fragile yellow aconites led to vast groves of honeysuckle and Japanese apricot. Breathing deeply of the fragrant air, Holly felt happiness welling in her chest until it spilled into an irrepressible laugh. <laughs> Your house may be an architectural horror, she said, but oh, this garden is a glimpse of heaven. Zachary's hand tightened on hers, and she saw a smile cross his face. The afternoon had been the most blissful either of them had ever known. The hours filled with lovemaking and soft laughter, and even a few tears as they shared the secrets of their hearts. Now that they had reconciled, it seemed there were a thousand things to discuss, and not nearly enough time. However, Holly was eager to return to the tailor's home and share with her daughter the news of her impending marriage. The Taylor family would be outraged, of course, and added to their unhappiness over the match would be the complete surprise of realizing that George's wife was rejecting his last wishes. They would hardly understand that the decision was not a cavalier one. She simply had no choice. The fact was, she couldn't live without Zachary Bronson. Stay with me, Zachary said quietly. I'll send for Rose, and you'll both live here while we arrange for the wedding. You know I can't do that. He frowned and guided her carefully around a small marble and brass sundial set in the ground. I don't want to let you out of my sight. Holly diverted his attention by bringing up the subject of the wedding ceremony, stressing that she wanted it to be accomplished with discretion and expediency. Unfortunately, it seemed that Zachary desired something far more grandiose. Upon hearing of his ideas for a large church, a thousand doves, a dozen trumpeters, a banquet for five hundred, and various other appalling schemes, Holly firmly stated that she would have nothing to do with such an event. We'll have something private and very quiet, and above all small, she said. It's the only choice, really. I agree, he said readily. On second thought, we don't need to invite more than three hundred guests. Holly gave him an incredulous glance. When I said small, I had a different number in mind. Perhaps half a dozen. His jaw set obstinately. I want all of London to know that I've won you. They'll know, she said dryly. I'm sure that Ton will talk of little else, and it's a certainty that none of my scandal avoiding former friends would attend the wedding, extravagant or otherwise. Nearly all of mine would, he said cheerfully. Undoubtedly, she agreed, knowing that he was referring to the crowd of ruffians, dandies and social climbers who ran the gamut from being bad ton to complete wastrels. Nevertheless, the wedding will be as discreet as possible. You can save the doves and trumpeters and such for Elizabeth's wedding. I suppose it would be faster that way, he said grudgingly. Holly stopped on the graveled path and smiled up at him. We'll keep our wedding small, then, and get on with it. She slid her arms around his lean waist. I don't want to wait a day longer than necessary to belong to you. Needing no further encouragement, Zachary bent his head to kiss her thoroughly. I need you, he muttered, pressing her against his aroused loins to emphasize the fact. Come back to the house with me now, sweet love, and let me— Not again until we marry— Breathing fast, she rested her ear against his thundering heart. Despite her own eagerness to make love with him, she wanted to wait until they were properly wed. I've been compromised quite enough today, I should think. Oh, no, you haven't. His hands wandered over the bodice of her gown, and he kissed the side of her throat. With a coaxing murmur, he led her to an old stone wall, covered with rare yellow camellias, and began to reach for the hem of her skirts. Don't you dare, Holly warned with an unsteady laugh, skittering away from him. A gentleman should treat his beloved with respect, and here you are. The size of this cock stand is ample proof of my respect for you, he interrupted, pulling her hand to his swollen crotch. Holly knew she should have rebuked him, but instead 
she found herself pressing close against his long, sturdy form. You're impossibly vulgar, she said against his ear. Zachary cupped her hand more tightly around himself. That's one of the things you lie best about me, he whispered, and she couldn't help smiling. Yes. He nuzzled into the little space between her lace-edged neckline and the soft, warm skin of her throat. Let me take you to the summer house, just for a few minutes. No one will know. Reluctantly, she wriggled away from him. I'll know. Zachary shook his head with a groaning laugh, turning to brace his hands on the flower-covered wall. Dropping his head, he breathed deeply, striving to master his rampaging desire. As Holly approached him hesitantly, he glanced sideways with smouldering black eyes. All right, then, he said in a softly threatening tone, underlaid with smoke. I won't touch you again until our wedding night. But you may be sorry you made me wait. I already am, she confessed, and their smiling gazes locked for a long moment. Although Zachary had intended to send for Jason Summers the very next day, the young man surprised him with an early morning call. Zachary had slept deeply for the first night in a month and awakened at the hour of eight, unusually late for him. He couldn't remember when he had felt so relaxed. It seemed that after decades of striving and struggling, he had finally reached the pinnacle he had sought. Perhaps for the first time in his life, he could truly be happy, and the reason was at once extraordinary and commonplace. He was in love. He had finally relinquished his heart to someone and found that she loved him in return. It seemed too miraculous to be true. In the midst of his solitary breakfast, the visitor was announced, and Zachary bade the housekeeper to show the young man in. Grim, handsome, pale, and dressed as if he were attending a funeral, Summers appeared as the tragic hero of some overblown romance. Zachary actually felt a prickle of something that might have been remorse, as he recalled his last meeting with the fellow during which he had met Summer's earnest request for Elizabeth's hand with a quiet, crushing denial. No doubt Summers remembered every detail of the unpleasant scene, which would account for his resolute expression. It was the expression, in fact, of a valiant knight daring to approach an evil dragon in his lair. Unshaven and still wearing his dressing robe, Zachary sat at a table in the breakfast room and gestured for Summers to join him. Pardon my appearance, he said mildly, but it is a bit earlier than the usual visiting hour. Or will you take some coffee? No, thank you. Summers remained standing. Relaxing in his chair, Zachary took a long, hot swallow of his coffee. Convenient that you should choose this day to call on me, he remarked, as I had planned to send for you this morning. Had you? Summer's green eyes narrowed intently. Why is that, Mr. Bronson? Something to do with the Devon estate, I suppose. No, actually. It concerns the matter we discussed the other day. As I recall, there was no discussion, Summers said flatly. I asked for your consent to marry Elizabeth, and you refused. Yes. Zachary cleared his throat gruffly. Well, I... You've left me no choice, sir. Although Summers flushed slightly with obvious nervousness, his voice was steady as he continued. Out of respect for you, I came to inform you in person that I intend to marry Elizabeth with or without your approval. And despite what you or anyone else thinks, I'm not doing it because I have an eye on your damned fortune. I happen to love your sister. If she'll have me, I'm going to provide for her. Work like hell for her and treat her with all the respect and gentleness a man can give his wife. And if you require more than that of any man, you can go to the devil. Zachary felt his brows lift slightly. He couldn't help but be impressed by the young man. It wasn't often that someone dared to stand up to him this way. If I may ask, he said quietly, why do you love Elizabeth? She's my perfect match in every way that matters. 
not socially, Zachary pointed out. I said, came the young man's calm reply, in every way that matters. I don't give a damn what her social status is. The answer satisfied Zachary. His instincts told him that Summers was a decent man who truly loved Elizabeth. Then you have my approval to marry Lizzie, if you'll do one thing for me. Summers seemed too stunned to reply at first. What is it? he eventually asked in a suspicious tone. I have another project for you. Summers shook his head immediately. I won't spend the rest of my career taking commissions from you and being accused of nepotism. I respect my own abilities too much for that. I'll do well enough designing for other men, and I'll recommend another architect to suit you. It's a humble project, actually, Zachary said, ignoring the refusal. I'm tearing down some tenement slums on a block of real estate I own on the east side of town. I want you to design a new one, like nothing that currently exists. A large building to house dozens of families, rooms with windows, decent housing where they can cook and eat and sleep, and a facade attractive enough that a man can enter or exit the place without shame. On top of all that, I want it to be economical, so that others will be inspired to imitate it. Can you do something like that? Yes, I could, Jason replied quietly, seeming to grasp the importance of the idea, the number of lives it could change. And I will, although I may not want my name attached to the project. You see, I understand, Zachary said without rancor. You'll never get commissions from the aristocracy if they perceive that you design for the commoners as well. Summers regarded him curiously, a strange expression entering his green eyes. I've never met a gentleman in your position who gave a damn about the living conditions of the ordinary man. I am an ordinary man, Zachary pointed out. I just happen to have had a bit more luck than most. A half-smile played on Summers' lips. I'll reserve opinion on that, sir. Taking it for granted that the arrangement was settled, Zachary unlaced his fingers and drummed them idly on the desk. You know, Summers, you could do worse than spend the rest of your career accepting my commissions. With your talent and my money? Oh, no! A sudden laugh escaped the younger man, and he regarded Zachary with the first flicker of real friendliness. I respect you, Bronson, but I won't be owned by you. I don't want your money. I just want your sister. A hundred admonitions came to Zachary's mind concerning how he wanted his sister to be treated, about all that Elizabeth needed and deserved, about the dire consequences if Summers ever disappointed her. But as he stared into Jason Summers' handsome, self-assured young face, the words remained locked inside him. Zachary realized he could no longer control every detail of his family's life or manage every minute of their days. It was time for each of them, including himself, to lead their own lives. A strange feeling came over him as he contemplated the novelty of handing his sister into someone else's care and trusting that she would be happy and loved. All right, he said rising from the desk and extending a hand. Take Lizzie with my blessing. Thank you. They shook hands heartily, and Summers seemed unable to repress a grin. Regarding the dowry, Zachary said, I would like to... As I told you, Summers interrupted, I don't want the dowry. It's for Elizabeth, Zachary said. A woman should have a bit of independence in a marriage... Not only was this his personal view, but he had witnessed such circumstances in Tom marriages, when wives who had come into the union with their own property and money were accorded far more consideration by their husbands. Moreover, women were legally entitled to keep their own property when their husbands died, regardless of what the deceased's will might stipulate. Very well. I want whatever is best for Elizabeth, naturally— if you don't mind, Bronson, I'll take my leave now. 
Regardless of the matters you and I should still discuss, I'd like to share the good news with your sister. Thank you, Zachary replied in a heartfelt tone. I'm damn tired of being painted as the unloving ogre she has accused me of being for the past few days. Zachary exchanged a bow with Summers and watched the architect stride toward the door. One last thought occurred to him. Oh, Summers, I trust you'll have no objections if I arrange the wedding. Arrange it however you like, Summers replied without breaking stride, clearly eager to find Elizabeth. Good, Zachary muttered in satisfaction and seated himself at his desk. Picking up his pen, he dipped it in an inkwell and began to make a list. One thousand doves for the church, five orchestras for the reception, fireworks, a dozen trumpeters. No, better make that two dozen. Chapter 17 As Holly had expected, none of the tailors could bring themselves to attend the small chapel wedding held on the Bronson estate. Understanding their feelings about her marriage to Bronson and their disappointment over her failure to carry out George's wishes, Holly did not blame them at all. In time, she thought, they might come to forgive her, especially when they saw how Rose would benefit from the alliance and Rose certainly had made little secret of her joy. Are you going to be my papa now? The child had asked Zachary, sitting with her arms looped around his neck. She had flown to him with shrill cries of delight when Holly had brought her to visit the estate, and he had swung her in the air until her little petticoats and white stockings had been a white blur. Touched by the obvious happiness of the pair, Holly had felt a great settling of comfort and peace inside. If she had had any lingering doubts about the rightness of this new life for her daughter, they dissolved at the sight of Rose's beaming face. The child would be spoiled, undoubtedly, but she would also be loved wholeheartedly. Is that what you'd like? Zachary said in answer to Rose's question. She wrinkled her face thoughtfully, and her doubtful gaze flickered to Holly before returning to Zachary. I should like very much to live in your big house she replied, with all the candor of a young child. And I don't mind that Mama will marry you, but I don't want to call you Papa. It would make my Papa in heaven sad, I think. The words stunned Holly, and she fumbled for a reply. Helplessly she watched as Zachary touched the little girl's round chin and turned her face toward him. Then call me whatever you like, he said matter-of-factly. But believe me, princess, I'm not going to replace your papa. I'd be a fool to try, fine man that he was. I just want to take care of you and your mother. I imagine, I hope, that your papa will be somewhat relieved to see that someone will be looking after you down here while he's unable. Oh, Rose said in obvious satisfaction. I think that's all right then, as long as we don't forget him. Isn't that right, Mama? Yes, Holly whispered, her throat tight with emotion, her cheeks flushed with happiness. She stared at Zachary with glittering brown eyes. You're absolutely right, Rose. On the day of the wedding, they were accompanied by Elizabeth, Paula, and Jason Summers, as well as Holly's own bewildered parents. They had travelled from Dorset for the occasion, and while they did not seem disapproving of the match, they were obviously astonished that their eldest daughter was marrying into a world so different from the one she had been destined for. Mr. Bronson appears to be a decent man, her mother whispered to her before the ceremony, and his manners are pleasing enough, though they may lack polish, and I suppose he is fine-looking, albeit a bit too coarse to be considered truly handsome. Mama. Holly asked with a wry smile, long accustomed to the woman's diffidence. Are you trying to say that you approve of him? I suppose I am, her mother admitted, although Mr. Bronson certainly bears no resemblance in appearance or character to your first husband. Mama, 
Impulsively, Holly embraced her and smiled against the feathery plumes of her mother's hat. In time you'll come to realize, as I have, that Mr. Bronson is a wonderful man in every regard. His character is a bit tarnished in some places, but in other places it shines more brightly than George's or my own. If you say so, her mother said doubtfully, and Holly laughed. As they gathered in the chapel, Holly being flanked by Elizabeth and Rose, and Zachary by Jason Summers, who had agreed to stand up for him. They were all surprised by a last-minute addition to the wedding party. Holly smiled brilliantly as she saw Lord Blake, the Earl of Ravenhill, enter the chapel. After stopping to make a precise bow, Ravenhill moved to stand beside Holly's parents. His warm grey eyes seemed to contain a quiet smile as he glanced at Holly and then at Zachary. What is he doing here? Zachary asked beneath his breath. Holly reached for his tense arm and held it lightly. It's a very great favour, she whispered back. By attending our wedding, Lord Blake is publicly showing his support of our marriage. Or likely taking his last opportunity to ogle you. Holly cast Zachary a shaming glance, but he seemed not to notice her disapproval as his gaze wandered avidly over her gown. She was dressed in pale yellow Gros de Naples, a finely textured silk with a tiny bouquet of spring flowers pinned at the centre of her straight banded neckline. The short puffed sleeves were overlaid with long transparent ones made of crêpe lisse. The effect was youthful and fragile, requiring no ornamentation, save a few orange blossoms pinned in her dark, upswept curls. The vicar began to speak. Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honour and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? Zachary's reply was quiet and steady. I will. And as the ceremony progressed, Holly was changed from a widow to a bride once more. They exchanged vows, placed rings on each other's fingers, and knelt together as the vicar began a lengthy prayer. Holly tried to focus on the vicar's words, but as she glanced into Zachary's serious face, it seemed the world had vanished except for the two of them. His grip on her hands was warm and strong as he pulled her to her feet, and hazily she realized that the vicar was finishing the ceremony. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They were married now, Holly thought in wonder, staring at her husband in the suspended silence, her fingers lacing tightly with his. Suddenly, Rose's voice broke through the stillness, as the little girl apparently felt moved to add to the vicar's closing words. Her tone exactly mimicked his grave monotone. And they lived happily ever after. Laughter rippled through the small gathering, and Zachary pressed a brief, hard kiss on Holly's smiling mouth. The wedding supper that followed was a light-hearted affair, with music supplied by violinists and conversation seasoned by flowing bottles of expensive wine. Rose was allowed to sit at the adults' table for a short time. She was clearly dismayed when Maud appeared at the hour of eight to take her up to the nursery, but her protests were forestalled when Zachary murmured quietly to her and placed some small object in her hand. Exchanging a good-night kiss with Holly, the child went happily upstairs with Maud. What did you give her? Holly asked Zachary, and his black eyes glinted with mischief. Buttons. Buttons? she whispered in surprise. From where? One from my wedding coat and one from the back of your gown. Rose wanted them to commemorate the occasion. You took a button from the back of my gown? Holly whispered, casting him a shaming glance as she wondered how he had managed to accomplish the small feat without her notice. Be thankful I stopped at just one, my lady, he advised. Holly did not reply, her blush heightening 
as she reflected that she was anticipating their wedding night fully as much as he. At last the long supper and the endless rounds of toasts came to a conclusion, and the men remained at the table to enjoy their port. Holly slipped upstairs to the bedroom adjoining Zachary's, and with Maud's help she removed her wedding clothes. She changed into a nightgown made of fine, thin white cambric that had been intricately pleated and ruffled at the bodice and sleeves. Dismissing the servant with a smile of thanks, Holly brushed out her hair until it fell in long, loose locks over her shoulders. It felt strange to once again be waiting for a husband's conjugal visit. Strange but wonderful. How fortunate she was to have been blessed with two loves in her life. Sitting at the dressing table, she bent her head to whisper a silent prayer of thankfulness. Eventually, the quiet click of the door interrupted the silence, and she glanced upward to find Zachary approaching her. Slowly, he removed his wedding coat and tossed it over the back of a chair. He came to her and settled his hands on her shoulders, while their gazes met in the mirror. No doubt I should have waited longer. His fingers slid over her shining hair, then lightly touched the sides of her neck. Holly shivered pleasurably at the gentle brush of his fingertips. But the more I thought of you up here, my sweet, pretty wife, the more impossible it became to stay away. Continuing to stare at her reflection, Zachary carefully unfastened the little covered buttons at her throat, working down the long row until the cambric sagged loosely over her chest. His dark hands slipped beneath the thin fabric, their shadowy outline visible as he fondled the round shapes of her breasts. Holly's breathing deepened as she leaned against her chair. Her nipples contracted from the sliding heat of his palms. He used his thumbs and forefingers to pull gently at the tips, until the sensation chased all the way down to her toes. Zachary, she said unsteadily, I love you. He knelt beside her chair and urged her forward, his mouth capturing the tip of one breast through the cambric and tugging urgently. She quivered, her hands coming to his head, and she rubbed her mouth over his thick, black hair. Releasing her breast, Zachary smiled and cupped her small face between his palms. Tell me, he said, do you still think the good wives pander to their husbands' desires, but should never encourage them? I'm sure I should think so, she said ruefully. That's too bad, he informed her, laughter shimmering in his eyes, because there's nothing I enjoy so much as watching you struggle with your improper desires. He picked her up easily, and she curled her arms around his neck as he carried her to the bed. A few flickering candles illuminated the room with soft pools of light, causing Zachary's skin to gleam like bronze as he removed his clothing. He tugged Holly's gown to her hips, spreading kisses on each newly revealed inch of her body, then pulled it off completely. She turned toward him, gathering herself against him with a sound of mingled greed and pleasure that made him laugh softly. But his flaring amusement dimmed as she touched him, her hands inexpertly searching his shoulders and back and smoothing over the hard slopes of muscle. His chest moved in uneven breaths, and he pressed his face in her hair. Zachary, she whispered near his ear, teach me all the things you like. Tell me what you want. I'll do anything for you. Anything. He lifted his head and looked into her warm, trusting brown eyes. His own expression became fierce with adoration, and he bent to take her mouth hungrily. Grasping her hand in his, he drew her fingers slowly over his body, lingering on the places that gave him pleasure, showing her ways to stroke and caress him that she had never imagined. Murmuring hotly against her throat, he spread her thighs and slipped his fingers inside her, and kissed her stomach and navel, and rested his thumb lightly on the peak, hidden in the damp, clustered curls between her legs. She strained upward with a smothered moan, and he circled his thumb once, twice, 
while his fingers flexed deeper inside her body. He bent his head over her loins and slid his tongue over her swollen flesh, and gnawed softly with his lips at the edge of his teeth, and her fingers went to the back of his neck in a frantic grasp. Please, she moaned, inflamed and ready, every muscle in her body tensing in anticipation. Now, Zachary! But he rolled off of her, and pulled her stiff limbs over his, and made her straddle his hips, so that his erection rubbed into the place he had made so wet and hot. Understanding what he wanted, Holly reached down with trembling hands and pushed the taut length of him into place. She tried to sink down on him, but in her inexperience she could not find the proper angle. He guided her to lean deeper, until her breast swayed over his face. The hard shaft slid more easily then, and she gasped at the luscious invasion. Rising upward on his elbows, Zachary caught one nipple in his mouth and then the other, taking little stinging bites that caused her hips to jerk against his. Holly pressed herself on him urgently, then rose and did it again, finding a rhythm that caused his powerful legs to quiver beneath hers. He gritted his teeth and grabbed huge fistfuls of the bed linens, while sweat beaded on his face. He did not reach for her or guide her, only let her do as she wished, until the pleasure in her core surged in a great throbbing tide. Letting out a low cry, Holly ground herself against him, crushed her mouth on his, fused her body to his, while the fiery delight raced through her. Only then did he touch her, gripping her buttocks in his hands to pull her down even harder as his own passion exploded. Holly rested against his shoulder for a long time afterward, occasionally reaching up to stroke his face with gentle fingertips. When Zachary's breathing returned to normal, he moved to blow out the candles, then returned to her arms. She didn't know whether they slept for minutes or hours, but she awakened in the darkness to feel his hands on her once more. He kissed her mouth and breasts, while his coaxing hand teased the tender place between her thighs until she was ready for him again. She gave a little start as he rolled her to her stomach and wedged a pillow beneath her hips. Trust me, came his devilish whisper against her ear. She relaxed and offered a moan of encouragement, opening herself completely to whatever he desired. She felt his leg slide between hers, and he took her from behind, fitting himself deeply into her body. She wondered dizzily if this was immoral, if she should allow it, and then soon she didn't care. His long thrusts caused guttural cries to rise from her throat, and she felt his teeth gently score the back of her neck as his climax followed hers. They made love once more as dawn approached, every movement languid and dreamy, their mouths clinging in unbroken kisses as Zachary cradled her in his arms. I never want to leave this bed, she whispered to him, stretching beneath the stroke of his hand on her lower back. I'm afraid you'll have to, my lady. But from now on, there's always another night for us. She trailed her fingers through his chest hair, found a little point of nipple and rubbed it gently. Zachary? Yes, my love. How often do you usually... Uh, that is, what do you prefer? Her attempts to phrase the question delicately seemed to entertain him. How often would you prefer? He parried, drawing a fingertip over her blushing cheek. Well, with George, I... That is, we... At least once a week. Once a week? he repeated, and beneath the laughter in his eyes there was a hot flicker that made her toes curl. I'm afraid I'll require your wifely compliance a great deal more often than that, Lady Holly. In a rush of tingling embarrassment, Holly reflected that he was a man of strong appetites. She should not have been surprised by his rampantly sexual nature, and the prospect of sharing most of her nights with him was not exactly a hardship. I've been taught my entire life to be moderate in all things, she said, 
and I have been, except when it comes to you. Well, Lady Holly, he murmured, his wide shoulders rising above hers, I think that bodes well for our future, don't you? And he kissed her before she could answer. Holly thought she had come to know and understand Zachary Bronson quite well after abiding beneath his roof for the better part of a season. However, she soon discovered the vast difference between simply abiding with him and living as his wife. As the first month of their married life passed, she gradually became accustomed to sharing astonishing intimacy with him. She learned many things about Zachary that although he could be callous or harsh toward those who displeased him, he was never completely without mercy, that he was not a religious man, nor was he particularly spiritual, yet he had a code of honour that led him to be unflinchingly honest, that he was embarrassed by open praise from others and made light of the favours that he did for them. Although Zachary tried mightily to conceal it, he possessed a vein of compassion, that led him to be kind to those he perceived as vulnerable or weak. He drove hard bargains in his business dealings, but he slipped lavish tips to street sweepers and match girls, and secretly funded a multitude of reformist causes. When any of his charitable impulses were discovered, he disclaimed any good motives and pretended that everything he did was for purely mercenary reasons. Perplexed by his behaviour, Holly approached him in the library on a day he had chosen to work at home. The pensions for your workers and the new safety standards at your factories and the working men's college you're funding, she mused aloud. These are all things you've done only because it will eventually bring you more profit. That's right. Making the employees intelligent and reasonably healthy will result in greater productivity. And the bill you're secretly sponsoring in Parliament to outlaw all employment of orphans in mills and factories, Holly continued. That is also purely for business reasons. How do you know about that? He asked with a faint scowl. I overheard you talking to Mr. Cranfield the other day, she said, naming one of his political friends. Sitting on his knee, Holly loosened his starched necktie and played with the dark hair at his nape. Why does it embarrass you for other people to know about your good works? She asked softly. He shrugged uncomfortably. It serves no purpose. You know what they say. Holly nodded thoughtfully, remembering the article published in the Times the previous day that had criticised Zachary's support of the Working Men's College. Mr. Bronson has made it his ambition to see that the middle and even lower classes are allowed to run the country. People who haven't the slightest understanding of responsibility or morality are to be given power over the rest of us. He wants the sheep to lead the shepherds, and in this pursuit he is actively working for uneducated brutes like himself to be elevated above men of intellect and refinement. Everything I do causes controversy, Zachary said matter-of-factly. In fact, there are times when my patronage almost becomes a liability for the causes I'm trying to help. I've been accused of everything short of trying to lead a great, lower-class conspiracy that will end up overturning the monarchy. It isn't fair, Holly murmured, feeling a wash of guilt, as she realized that there were respectable men of the upper circle she used to frequent— who were actively fighting against measures that would educate and protect people so much less fortunate than they. How strange that she and George had never discussed such problems, had scarcely been aware of them. It had never occurred to them to worry about children being forced to work in mines at ages three and four, that there were thousands of widows trying to support their families by selling matches or braiding straw, that there was an entire class of people who had no chance to rise above their circumstances unless someone fought for them. Sighing, she rested her head against her husband's shoulder. How selfish and blind I've been for most of my life, she murmured. You? Zachary sounded surprised. He bent to kiss the curve of her cheek. You're an angel. Am I? she asked wryly. 
It's becoming clear to me that I've done very little in my life to help other people. But you, you've done so much, and you're not being given any of the recognition you deserve. I don't want recognition. He shifted her in his lap and kissed her. What do you want? she asked softly, a smile playing on her lips. His hand curled around her ankle and began to roam farther beneath her skirts. I should think it's fairly clear to you by now. To be certain, Zachary was far from a saint. He was not above manipulating others to obtain the results he desired. Holly was both amused and appalled as she uncovered evidence of his manoeuvring, such as the invitation they received to the annual after-season country weekend party held by the Earl and Countess of Glintworth. The invitation was wholly unexpected, as Lord Glintworth was a member of high standing in the ton, and the Bronsons had earned too much notoriety to merit a place on the exclusive guest list. But once they were received publicly at a ball given by the Glintworths, it would be difficult for anyone in first society to cut them afterward. Holly brought the invitation to Zachary with a questioning frown on her face. He was lounging in the music room, while Rose plunked the keys of the gleaming little mahogany piano that had been installed specifically for her use. For some reason, Zachary claimed to enjoy hearing the child's efforts at learning scales, and he spent at least two mornings a week listening to her. A messenger just delivered this, Holly told him quietly, showing him the invitation while he listened to Rose's cacophony as if it were a performance of some heavenly choir. What is it? he asked, sprawling more comfortably in the chair near the piano, while Rose began yet another set of scales. An invitation to the Earl of Glintworth's country weekend. Holly stared at him suspiciously. Did you have something to do with it? Why do you ask? he countered a little too blandly. Because there is no reason we should be invited. Glintworth is the greatest snob in the civilized world— and he would never voluntarily condescend to invite us to anything, even if it were merely to watch his boots being shined. Unless, Zachary murmured, he wanted something I could do for him. Listen to this, Uncle Zach, Rose commanded. It's my best one. The piano fairly vibrated from her enthusiastic playing. I'm listening, Princess, Zachary assured her, then spoke to Holly in a soft undertone. I think you'll soon see, my love, that many in the ton will be forced to overlook our little transgressions. There are too many peers who are financially entangled with me, or would like to be, and friendship, like anything else, has a purchasing price. Zachary Bronson! Holly exclaimed in horrified disbelief. Do you mean to tell me that you've somehow coerced the Earl and Countess of Glintworth into inviting us to their weekend party? I gave them a choice, he said indignantly. The fact is, Glintworth is in debt up to his ears, and he's been after me for months to let him invest. He paused to applaud for Rose as she launched into an unsteady rendition of Three Blind Mice, then turned back to Holly. He's chased me like a dog after a rat about letting him invest in a rail line I'm planning. The other day I told him that in return for letting him have a piece of my business— I wouldn't mind a public demonstration of friendship from a man as estimable as himself. Evidently, Glintworth convinced his wife that it would be in their best interests to send us an invitation to her party. So you gave them the choice of entertaining us or facing financial ruin? I wasn't quite that blunt. Oh, Zachary, what a pirate you are. He grinned at her disapproving expression. Thank you. That was not intended as praise. I suspect if someone were drowning in quicksand, you would extort all manner of promises before throwing him a rope. He shrugged philosophically. My sweet, that's the entire point of having the rope. As it happened, they did attend the weekend party, and were received by the ton with a sort of grim courtesy that made one thing clear. They were not exactly welcome, but neither were they going to be excluded. Zachary's prediction had been correct. He had countless financial affiliations with ambitious peers who owed him favours, 
they would not dare to risk his wrath. A man could have fine heritage and a great deal of land, but if he had no money to maintain his estate and his lifestyle, he was eventually bound to lose everything. As the economy lurched slowly away from its agrarian roots, too many impoverished aristocrats had been forced to sell their property and ancient holdings for want of cash, and no associate of Zachary Bronson's cared to find himself in such a position. There was a time when Holly might have been distressed by the cool reception her former friends gave her, but she was surprised to find that now it did not matter to her at all. She knew the things that were being said about her, that she had been Zachary Bronson's paramour before their marriage, that the wedding had taken place as a result of pregnancy, that she had married him for mercenary reasons, that she had been brought low by association with a family of bad blood. But gossip and social disapproval and the taint of scandal affected her no more than harmless darts flung against a suit of armour. She had never felt so secure, so cherished and loved, and it seemed that her happiness only grew each day. To her relief, Zachary had slowed the reckless pace of his life, and although he was still constantly busy, his relentless energy did not exhaust her as she had once feared. Even Paula had remarked on the change in him, pleased that he now usually slept eight hours instead of five, and that he spent his evenings home instead of carousing in town. For years he had gone through life as if it were a battle, and now he had begun to regard the world around him with a new sense of comfortable ease. Zachary drank less and spent fewer hours indoors poring over contracts and figures, choosing instead to spend afternoons accompanying Holly and Rose on picnics or open carriage rides. He purchased a handsome yacht for them to enjoy at water parties, escorted them to pantomimes at Drury Lane, and bought a seaside cottage with a dozen bedrooms at Brighton for summertime trips to the shore. When friends joked about what a family man he had become, Zachary only smiled and replied that he found no greater enjoyment than spending time in the presence of his wife and daughter. Upper society was clearly puzzled by his behaviour. It was generally considered unmanly to dote so openly on one's wife, not to mention a child, and yet no one dared make a critical comment in Zachary's presence. His attitude was written off as yet another of his many idiosyncrasies. Holly herself was surprised by the extent of his devotion, but she couldn't help feeling a twinge of pleasure at the obvious jealousy of other women, who teasingly asked what magic potion she had employed to keep her husband so enthralled. Often Zachary brought friends home for supper, and their table was filled with politicians, lawyers, and wealthy merchants who were very different from the company Holly was accustomed to. They talked freely about money, trade, political issues, all the things that would never have been mentioned at aristocratic tables. These people were foreign to her, often rootless and rough-edged, and yet she found them fascinating. "'What a crowd of scoundrels!' she exclaimed to Zachary late one evening, after the last dinner guest had departed. She walked upstairs to their bedroom, while Zachary kept one arm loosely around her waist. That Mr. Crombie and Mr. Whitten are barely fit for decent society. I know. Zachary lowered his head repentantly, but she caught his sudden grin. Seeing them makes me realise how much I've changed since I met you. She let out a sceptical snort. You, sir, are the biggest scoundrel of them all. It's your job to reform me, he replied lazily, stopping just one step beneath her so that their faces were level. Holly linked her arms around his neck and kissed the end of his nose. But I don't want to. I love you just as you are, wicked, scoundrelly husband. He caught her mouth with his, kissing her deeply. Just for that, I'm going to be especially wicked. His lips roamed across her soft cheek and down to the edge of her jaw. You'll have no gentleman in your bed tonight, my lady. In other words, a typical evening, she mused, and gave a shriek of laughter as he suddenly tossed her over his shoulder and carried her up the stairs. Zachary, put me down this very... Oh, you barbarian, someone will see. 
he carried her past a gaping housemaid, disregarding Holly's mortified pleas, and headed into his bedroom, where he proceeded to provoke and tease her for hours. He made her laugh, made her play and struggle and groan with pleasure. Afterward, when she was exhausted and sated, he made love to her with gentle tenderness, whispering to her in the darkness that he would love her for eternity. It humbled her to be loved so greatly, and she could not fathom why he thought her so special when she was so very ordinary. There are very many women like me, you know, she murmured as the morning approached, while she lay with her hair streaming across his neck and chest. Women with my kind of upbringing, ones with older titles and nicer faces and figures. She felt him smile against her cheek. What are you trying to say? That you'd rather I'd married someone else? Of course not. She tugged at a curl of his chest hair reprovingly. It's just that I'm not the great prize you make me out to be. You could have gotten any woman that you had set your heart on. In my entire life, there's only been you. You're every dream and wish and want I've ever had. His hand played gently in her hair. Mind you, I don't always like feeling this damn happy. It's a bit like King of the Mountain. Now that you've reached the top of the pile, you're afraid to be knocked off? She asked perceptively. Something like that. Holly understood exactly how he felt. It was the very reason she had once refused to marry him, fearing the risk of losing something so precious, until the fear had stood squarely in the way of what she had most wanted. Well, we won't live that way, Holly murmured, kissing his bare shoulder. We'll enjoy each moment to the fullest, and let the morrow take care of itself. Having taken an interest in one of the reform societies Zachary had donated to, Holly attended a meeting of the gentlewomen who had founded the group. As she learned more about the group, which was a children's aid society, she became enthusiastic about helping in ways other than merely donating money. The women in the society were busy organizing charity bazaars, lobbying for social legislation, and founding new institutions to help care for the multitude of children who had been orphaned from recent epidemics of typhus and consumption. When it was decided to write a pamphlet describing the conditions of child labor in factories, Holly volunteered for a position on the committee. The next day, she and a half-dozen women went to visit a broom-making factory that had been deemed one of the worst offenders. Suspecting that Zachary would not approve of the factory visit, Holly decided not to mention it to him. Although she had braced herself for an unpleasant sight, Holly found herself unprepared for the misery of the conditions of the factory. The place was filthy and poorly ventilated, with many children working who were clearly younger than the age of nine. Holly was moved to quiet anguish at the sight of the thin, wretched creatures with blank faces, their small hands moving in ceaseless, tedious work, some of them missing fingers from accidents while using sharp knives to cut bundles of straw. They were orphans, one of the adult workers explained, gathered from orphanages and moved to a narrow, dark dormitory next to the factory. They worked fourteen hours a day, sometimes longer, and in return for their relentless labor, they were given a minimum of food and clothing and a few pence a day. Gravely, the women of the Children's Aid Committee remained at the factory and asked questions until their presence was discovered by a manager. They were quickly ushered from the premises, but at that point they had already learned what they needed to know. Saddened by what she had seen, but filled with resolution, Holly returned home and wrote the committee's report to be presented to the Society at the next meeting. Tired from the meeting, Zachary asked at supper that night, his perceptive gaze noting the signs of strain on her face. Holly nodded, feeling more than a little guilt about not telling him where she had been that day. However, she was fairly certain of his displeasure should he find out, and she reasoned privately that there was no need to confess. Unfortunately, Zachary did find out about the factory visit the following day, not from Holly, but from one of his friends, whose wife had also gone. 
Unfortunately, the friend had also related that the factory was in a particularly unsavory part of town, surrounded by streets with names like Bitch Alley, Dead Man's Yard, and Maidenhead Lane. Zachary's reaction astonished Holly. He cornered her the very moment he arrived home, and she realized with a sinking heart that he was not merely displeased. He was irate. He strove to keep his voice controlled, but it actually shook with fury as he forced words through his clenched teeth. Damn it, Holly! I'd never have believed you'd do something so harebrained! Do you understand that the building could have collapsed around you and those henwits? I know what condition those places are in, and I wouldn't let a dog of mine venture past the threshold, much less my wife. And the men! Good God! When I think of the low-living bastards who were in your vicinity, it makes my blood curdle. Sailors and drunkards on every corner. Do you know what would happen if one of them took it into his head to snap up a little treat like you? As the thought seemed to temporarily render him incapable of speech, Holly took the opportunity to defend herself. I was with companions and ladies, he said savagely, armed with umbrellas, no doubt. Just what do you think they would have been able to do had you met with bad company? The few men we encountered in the neighborhood were harmless, Holly argued. In fact, it was the very same place you lived in during your childhood, and those men were no different from you. In those days, I'd have played merry hell with you if I'd managed to get my hands on you, he said harshly. Have no illusions, my lady. You'd have ended face to the wall in Maidenhead Lane with your skirts around your waist. The only wonder is that you didn't meet that fate with some randy sailor yesterday. You're exaggerating, Holly said defensively, but that only roused his temper to a higher pitch. He continued to blister her ears with a lecture that was furious and insulting by turns, naming the various diseases she could have contracted and the vermin she had likely encountered, until Holly couldn't bear another word. I've heard enough, she cried hotly. It's clear to me that I'm not to make a single decision without asking your permission first. I'm to be treated as a child, and you will act as a dictator. The accusation was unfair, and she knew it, but she was too incensed to care. Suddenly, his fury seemed to evaporate, and he stared at her with an inscrutable gaze. A long moment passed before he spoke again. You wouldn't have taken Rose to such a place, would you? Of course not. But she's a little girl, and I'm... My life, he interrupted quietly. You're my entire life. If anything ever happens to you, Holly, there is nothing left for me. Suddenly, his words made her feel small and petty, and as he had accused, irresponsible. And yet her intentions had truly been good. On the other hand, she had known that visiting the factory had not been the wisest thing to do, or she wouldn't have tried to keep it secret from him. Swallowing back further arguments, she stared at a fixed point on the wall with an unhappy frown. She heard Zachary swear beneath his breath, the ugliness of the word causing her to wince. I won't say another word if you'll make me a promise. Yes, she said warily. From now on, don't go anywhere that you wouldn't feel perfectly safe taking Rose, unless I'm with you. I suppose that's not unreasonable, she said grudgingly. Very well, I promise. Zachary nodded shortly, his mouth set in a grim line. It occurred to Holly that this was the first time he had ever exerted his marital authority. Moreover, he had handled the situation far differently than George would have. George had set far greater limits for her, albeit in a gentler fashion. In the same circumstances, George would undoubtedly have asked her to leave the committee altogether. True ladies, he would have pointed out, did little more than carry baskets of jellies and soup to the poor, or perhaps contribute a bit of needlework to a bazaar. Zachary, for all his fire and thunder, actually asked very little of her in the way of wifely obedience— I am sorry, she brought herself to say stiffly. I didn't mean to worry you. He accepted the apology with a single nod. You didn't worry me, he muttered. When I realized what you'd done, 
It scared the living hell out of me. Although their quarrel was made up, and the atmosphere became easier, Holly was aware of a certain constraint between them that lasted through dinner and afterward. For the first time in their marriage, Zachary did not come to her bed at night. She had a restless sleep, tossing and turning, waking frequently to realize that she was alone. In the morning she was frustrated and bleary-eyed, and to compound her discontent, she discovered that Zachary had already left the house for his offices in town. It was difficult to summon her usual vitality during the day, and the thought of food was singularly unappealing. After consulting a looking-glass to view her own fatigued appearance, Holly groaned, and wondered if Zachary had been right, that she might indeed have caught some sort of illness during her factory visit. She napped late in the day, pulling the curtains closed in her room to block out all trace of light. After sinking into an exhausted slumber, she awoke to find Zachary's outline near her as he occupied a bedside chair. What time is it? she asked groggily, struggling to rise to her elbows. Half past seven. Realizing she had slept longer than she had intended, Holly made an apologetic sound. Did I make everyone late for supper? Oh, I must have. Zachary hushed her softly, moving over her, pressing her back to the pillows. Megrims, he murmured quietly. She shook her head. No, I was only tired. I didn't sleep well last night. I wanted you. That is, wanted your company. He laughed softly at her awkward admission. Straightening, he unbuttoned his waistcoat and dropped it to the floor, then tugged at his necktie. The low, vibrant sound of his voice in the darkness seemed to gather and tickle at the top of her spine. We'll have supper sent up for you. The white banner of his shirt fluttered from view, as it, too, was cast to the floor. In a little while, he added, and shed the rest of his clothes to join her in bed. Over the course of the next fortnight, Holly was aware of not quite being herself, the fatigue having settled deep in her marrow and refusing to leave no matter how much she slept. Retaining her usual good humour took a great deal of effort, and late in the day she often felt irritable or melancholy. Her weight began to drop, which she rather liked at first, but unfortunately her eyes had begun to take on a sunken aspect that was not at all pleasing. A family doctor was sent for, but he was unable to find anything wrong with her. Zachary treated her with extreme gentleness and patience, bringing her gifts of sweets and novels and amusing engravings. When it became clear that she no longer had the stamina for lovemaking, despite her willingness, he settled for other intimacies, spending the evenings bathing her, rubbing scented cream into her dry skin, cuddling and kissing her as if she were a treasured child. Another doctor was sent for, and then another, but neither had been able to come up with a diagnosis other than decline, the word all physicians used when they were unable to identify an illness. I don't know why I'm so weary, Holly exclaimed fretfully one evening, while Zachary brushed her long hair as they sat before the fire. The air was warm, stifling almost, but she felt chilled in all her limbs. There's no reason for this decline. I've always been perfectly healthy, and nothing like this has ever happened to me before. The motion of the brush paused, then resumed its gentle stroke. I think you're over the worst of it now, came his soft voice. You seem a little better today. While he brushed her hair, he made a hundred promises of all the things they would do when she was well again, the places they would travel, the exotic pleasures he would show her. She fell asleep in his lap with a smile curving her lips, her head resting heavily in the crook of his arm. The next morning, however, she was much worse, her body quivering and light and burning hot, as if every part of her had been transmuted from flesh to flame. She was only vaguely aware of voices, of Zachary's gentle hand on her head, 
and Paula's light, cool fingers moving a cool rag over her scorching skin. It seemed that if that gentle, cooling stroke ever ceased, she would not be able to bear the heat that would surely overtake her. She heard herself whispering words that made no sense. Then, some moments, everything was clear enough that she could speak. Help me, Mother. Don't stop, please. Dear Holly, came Paula's kind, familiar voice, and the cloth moved diligently over her, ceaseless and untiring. Somewhere amid the delirium, she heard Zachary as he snapped out orders to servants and sent a footman for the doctor, and there was some new, hoarse note she had never heard in his voice. He was afraid, she thought dully. She tried to call for him, to reassure him that she would certainly get well again, but now that was only an elusive hope. It seemed this terrible inner fire would always be with her, burning and charring until she was nothing but an empty shell. A new doctor arrived, a handsome blonde man who wasn't much older than herself. Having always been attended by grey-whiskered old physicians of renowned experience and wisdom, Holly wondered if Dr. Lindley would be of any use at all. However, his cool competence was immediately apparent, and during his examination she felt her delirium receding somewhat, as if storm clouds had been driven at bay by an emerging sun. With a gentle briskness that somehow reassured her, Lindley left behind some brandy tonic and sent for some broth from the kitchen, advising that she must eat to preserve her strength. He left to confer with Zachary, who waited outside the room. Finally, Zachary came in to see her. Carefully, he took the bedside chair and moved it to the edge of the mattress. I like that Dr. Linley, Holly murmured. I thought you would, Zachary said dryly. I nearly turned him away at the door when I saw his appearance. It was only because of his excellent reputation that I let him inside. Oh, well. Making an effort, Holly dismissed the subject of the handsome doctor with a feeble gesture. He's moderately attractive, I suppose, if one likes that golden Adonis sort. Zachary grinned briefly. Fortunately, you prefer Hades. She made a sound that, given more breath, would have been a chuckle. At this moment, you bear the god of the underworld more than a passing resemblance, she informed him. She watched his face, which was calm and self-assured as always, except that he couldn't conceal the skull-white color of his skin. What is Dr. Linley's verdict? she asked in a scratchy whisper. Only a bad case of influenza, he said matter-of-factly. With some more rest and time, you'll be just... It's typhoid, Holly interrupted, a weary smile curving her lips at his deception. Naturally, the doctor had advised him to keep the news from her, to prevent worry from hindering her possible recovery. She lifted a slender white arm and showed him the small pink blotch on the inside of her elbow. I have more of these on my stomach and chest, just as George did. Zachary stared thoughtfully at his shoes, hands shoved deep in his pockets, as if he were deep in concentration. However, when his gaze lifted, she saw the gleam of hideous fear in his black eyes, and she made a crooning sound of reassurance. She patted the mattress beside her. Slowly, he came to her and rested his dark head on her breasts. Encircling his powerful shoulders with her arms, Holly whispered into the thick locks of his hair, I'm going to get well, darling. He trembled all over, and then recovered with startling quickness, sitting up and regarding her with a shadow of a smile. Of course, he muttered. Send Rose away to protect her, she whispered, to my family in the country, and Elizabeth and your mother. They'll be gone within the hour. Except my mother, she wants to stay and help care for you. But the risk, she said, make her go, Zachary. We Bronsons are a damned hardy breed, he said with a smile. 
Every time some plague or epidemic went through the rookeries, we came out completely untouched. Scarlet fever, putrid fever, cholera. He waved his hand in the same gesture he would use to shoo away a gnat. You can't make one of us ill. I would have said the same for myself not long ago. She shaped her dry lips into a smile. I've never been really sick before. Why now, I wonder? I nursed George all through the typhoid and never had a single symptom. The mention of her former husband caused Zachary to turn whiter, if that was possible, and Holly murmured contritely, understanding his terror that she would come to the same end as George. I'll be all right, she whispered. Just need rest. Wake me when the broth is sent up. I'll drink every drop, just to show you. But she had no memory of the broth, or of anything distinct, as fiery dreams engulfed her, and the entire world dissolved into swirling heat. Her tired thoughts tried to break through the shimmering, hot wall, but they were battered away like moths, and she was left with no sense, no words, nothing but the incoherent sounds that rose endlessly from her own throat. She was tired of her own ceaseless droning, and yet she couldn't seem to make it stop. She had no power over anything, no sense of day and night. There were times when she knew that Zachary was with her. She clung to his big, gentle hands and listened to the soothing murmur of his voice, while her body was racked with pain. He was so strong, so effortlessly powerful, and she tried in vain to absorb some of his vitality into herself. But he could not give her his strength nor could he shelter her from the waves of fiery heat. It was her battle to fight, and to her weary despair she felt her will to recover fade, until all she was left with was the wish to endure. It had been like this for George. His gentle spirit had withered from the harsh demands of typhoid, and there had been no fight left in him. She had not understood until now how difficult it had been for him, and finally in her heart she forgave him for letting go. She was so close to letting go herself. The thought of Rose and Zachary still had power to entice her, but she was so tired, and the pain was pulling her irresistibly away from them. It had been three weeks since Holly had become bedridden, weeks that would forever blend in Zachary's mind as one long interval of exhaustion and misery. Almost worse than Holly's delirium were the intervals when she was lucid, when she smiled at him affectionately and murmured concerned words. He was not eating or sleeping properly, she said. She wanted him to take better care of himself. She would be better very soon, she told him. How long had it been? Well, typhoid never lasted longer than a month. And just as Zachary allowed himself to be charmed and convinced that she truly was improving, she would sink back into her feverish ravings, and he was cast into worse despair than before. It surprised him at times when a newspaper was occasionally placed before him, along with a plate of food. After a few mechanical bites of bread or fruit, he would glance at the front page of the paper. Not to read— but to marvel bleakly at the evidence that the rest of the world was going on as usual. The events in this house were catastrophic, soul-consuming, and yet business and politics and social events continued at their customarily brisk pace. Not that this trial of endurance was going unnoticed, however. As the word of Holly's illness had spread, the letters had begun to arrive. It seemed that everyone from the highest social circles to the lowest wished to express their concern and friendship for the ailing lady. Aristocrats who had treated the newlyweds with everything short of actual disdain were apparently now anxious to prove their loyalty. It seemed that as Holly's illness progressed, her popularity climbed, and everyone claimed to be her closest friend. What a great, sodding mass of hypocrites! Zachary thought sullenly, staring at the great hall filled with floral bowers and baskets of jellies and biscuit tins and fruit liqueurs 
and silver trays heaped with messages of friendly sympathy. There were even a few callers. Despite the contagious nature of typhoid fever, and Zachary took savage pleasure in turning them away. There was only one that he allowed inside the house, one that he had been expecting. Varden, Lord Ravenhill. It somehow made Zachary like Ravenhill more for not bringing another useless basket or an unwanted bouquet. Ravenhill called unannounced one morning, dressed soberly, his blond hair gleaming even in the subdued light of the entrance hall. Zachary would never be friends with the man. He could not bring himself to forgive someone who had been a rival for Holly's hand. However, he had felt a grudging gratitude ever since Holly had told him that Ravenhill had advised her to follow her heart rather than adhere to George Taylor's wishes. The fact that Ravenhill could have made Holly's decision difficult, but had chosen not to, made Zachary feel a bit more kindly disposed toward him. Ravenhill approached him, shook hands, then stared at him intently. The light, grey eyes missed nothing as they swept over Zachary's bloodshot eyes and huge, gaunt frame. Suddenly, Ravenhill averted his gaze and ran a hand over his jaw with several slow repetitions, as if considering a weighty problem. Oh, Christ, he finally whispered. Zachary could read his thoughts easily. That Zachary's appearance would not be so ravaged were Holly not in grave, perhaps fatal, danger. Go up to her if you want, Zachary said gruffly. A bitter, self-mocking smile curved Ravenhill's aristocratic mouth. I don't know, he said, his voice nearly inaudible. I don't know if I can go through this a second time. Do as you like, then. Zachary left him abruptly, unable to stand the twitching pain in the other man's face, the flash of fear in his eyes. He did not want to share feelings or memories or platitudes. He had coldly told his mother, Maud, the housekeeper, and any servant within earshot that if they resorted to fits of weeping or other displays of emotion, they would be banished on the spot. The atmosphere in the household was calm, quiet, and oddly serene. Not caring where Ravenhill went, or what he did, or how he might locate Holly's room without assistance, Zachary wandered aimlessly until he came to the ballroom. It was dark, the windows covered in heavy draperies. He shoved one of the velvet panels aside and secured it, until long shafts of sunlight scored across the shining parkade floor and illuminated a green silk-covered wall. Staring into a huge gold-framed mirror, he remembered the long-ago dance lessons, the way Holly had stood in his arms and earnestly murmured instructions to him, while at the time all he had been able to think of was how he desired her, loved her. Her warm brown eyes had danced as she had teased him. I wouldn't suggest applying too many of your pugilistic skills to our dance lesson, Mr. Bronson. I should dislike to find myself engaged in fisticuffs with you. Slowly, Zachary lowered himself to the floor and sat, his back against the window ledge, remembering, his eyes half closed, and his head drooped in weariness. He was so tired, and yet he couldn't seem to sleep at night his entire being locked in suspenseful agony. The only peace came when it was his turn to watch over Holly, and he could reassure himself every minute that she was still breathing, her pulse still beating, her lips moving ceaselessly as she floated through fragments of dreams. After what could have been five minutes or fifty, Zachary heard a voice echo in the dark, gleaming cavern of a room. Bronson! He lifted his head and saw Ravenhill standing in the doorway. The Earl looked pale and grim, almost unnaturally self-controlled. I don't know if she'll die, Ravenhill said curtly. She doesn't look nearly as sunken and emaciated as George did at this point. But I do know she's heading into the crisis, and you'd do well to send for the doctor. Zachary was on his feet before he had finished the last sentence. 
Holly seemed to awaken in some blessedly cool dream, the pain and heat lifting, leaving her relaxed and more alert than she had felt in weeks. I am better now, she thought in surprise, and looked about eagerly, wanting to share the wonderful news with Zachary. She wanted to see him and Rose, and to make them understand that the torment of the past days was finally over. But she was perplexed to find herself alone, standing in a cool, faintly salty fog that reminded her of the seaside. She hesitated, not certain of where to go or why she was here, but she was lured by faint, sweet sounds ahead. It almost sounded like water splashing, birds chirping, trees rustling. She wandered forward, her limbs invigorated, her senses refreshed by the soft atmosphere. Gradually, the veil of mist faded, and she found herself in a place of sparkling blue water and gentle green hills, with lush, exotic flowers everywhere. Curiously, she bent to touch one of the velvety, peach-colored blossoms, and its fragrance seemed to surround and intoxicate her. Despite her puzzlement, she wanted to laugh in pleasure. Oh, she had forgotten how it felt to be so purely happy, in the way that innocent children were. What a beautiful dream, she said. A smiling voice answered her. Well, it's not precisely a dream. She turned with a bewildered frown, hunting for the source of the tantalizingly familiar voice, and saw a man walking toward her. He stopped and stared at her with the blue eyes she had never forgotten. George, she said. Holly's fair, fresh skin had a plum-colored cast, and her breathing was alarmingly fast and shallow. The fever burned unbelievably hot, and her eyes were half open in a strange, fixed stare. Dressed in her white gown, with only a light sheet to cover her legs, she looked as small as a child as she lay alone in her bed. She was dying, Zachary thought numbly, and he could not seem to think of what would happen afterward. For him there would be no hopes, no expectations, no future pleasure or happiness, as if his own life would end when hers did. He waited in the corner of the room silently while Dr. Linley examined Holly. Paula and Maud had also entered the bedroom, both of them obviously struggling to mask their grief. The doctor came to Zachary and spoke very softly. Mr. Bronson, there are several techniques I've been trained in, most of which I believe would finish your wife off quickly rather than save her. The only thing I can do is give her something that will make her passing easier. Zachary did not require an explanation. He knew exactly what Linley was offering. To drug Holly so that she would sleep peacefully during the last painful stage of the typhoid. He heard himself breathing in a too rapid, too light fashion that was not unlike Holly's. Then he heard the sound change, and he glanced toward the bed as Holly's breaths came in difficult, fitful sighs. The death rattle, he heard Maud say fearfully. Zachary felt his sanity snap, and he flinched under Linley's steady regard. Get out, he said hoarsely, almost giving in to the temptation to bear his teeth at them all and growl like an enraged animal. Leave me alone with her. Leave, now. It almost surprised Zachary that they complied without argument, his mother weeping into a handkerchief as she closed the door. He locked the door behind them, secluding himself in the room with his wife, and went to the bed. Without hesitation... He sat on the mattress and gathered Holly in his arms, disregarding her weak, protesting moan. I'll follow you to the next life if I have to, he whispered harshly in her ear. You'll never be free of me. I'll chase you through heaven and hell and beyond. He continued to whisper without stopping, threatening, coaxing, cursing, while his hands gripped her body close to his, as if he could physically prevent the life from flowing out of her. You stay with me, Holly, he muttered savagely, his mouth sliding over her hot, wet face and neck. Don't do this to me. You stay, damn you. 
And finally, when no more words would come from his aching throat, he sank down to the mattress with her, burying his face against her still breasts. It was indeed George, but his appearance was altered in some way from how it had been in life. He looked so very young, his skin and eyes and hair radiant, every aspect of him glowing with strength and health. Holly, darling, he said with a quiet laugh, seeming to enjoy her surprise. You didn't realize I would come to meet you? In spite of her pleasure at seeing him, Holly held back, staring, fearing for some reason to touch him. George, how can it be that we're together? I... She considered the situation, her happiness ebbing, as she realized that she might have lost the life she had always known until now. Oh, she said, her eyes stinging and aching suddenly. No tears came, but she was filled with desolation. George tilted his head and regarded her with loving sympathy. You're not ready for this, are you? No, she said in growing desperation. George, have I no choice? I want to return at once. To that prison of a body, and all the pain and struggle. Why not come with me instead? There are places even more beautiful than this. He extended his hand invitingly. Let me show them to you. She shook her head violently. Oh, George, you could offer me a thousand paradises, but I could never. There is someone, a man who needs me, and I need him. Yes, I know about that. You do? She was amazed by the lack of accusation or recrimination in his face. George, I must go back to him and Rose. Please don't blame me. You must understand that I didn't forget you or stop caring for you. But, oh, how I've come to love him. Yes, I understand. He smiled, and to her relief... His hand fell back to his side. I would never blame you for that, Holly. Although she had made no effort to step backward, it seemed that her anxiety had pulled her several yards away from him. You found your soulmate, he commented. Yes, I... A wash of clear, bright knowledge swept over her, and she was relieved that he seemed to understand. Yes, I have. That's good he murmured. It's good that you realize how fortunate you are. I had only one regret when I came here. I had done so little in life for other people. So much of what we concerned ourselves with was immaterial. There's only love, Holly. Fill your life with it while you can. Her emotions tumbled over and over as she watched him walk away. George, she cried unsteadily longing to ask him so many things. He paused and looked back with a loving smile. Tell Rose I'm watching over her. And then he was gone. She closed her eyes and felt herself sinking, falling much too fast, back into the heat and darkness, where the air reverberated with savage, snarling words that caught around her like chains. The vehemence frightened her at first, until she understood its cause. She moved, her arms feeling wretchedly heavy, as if they had been encased in iron. After the wonderful floating lightness of her heavenly vision, it was difficult to accustom herself to this pain and illness once more. But she accepted it gladly, knowing that she had gained more time with the one she loved most, in this world or the next. She reached out and stilled the words on her husband's lips and felt his mouth tremble against her fingers. Hush, she whispered, glad that his violent litany had quieted. It was so difficult to speak, but she concentrated fiercely on making herself understood. Hush, it's all right now. She opened her eyes and stared into Zachary's pale, wild face, the black eyes were fathomless with astonished wonder. The lashes spiked with tears. Slowly, 
she stroked his hard face, his cheek, watching as sanity and awareness crept into his expression. Holly, he said, his voice shaking and utterly humble. You, you'll stay with me. Course I will. She sighed and smiled, keeping her hand on his cheek, though the effort demanded all her strength. Not going anywhere, dearest Zachary. Epilogue Hiya, Mama, hiya! Holly unrolled more string, and the kite dove and soared in the cloud-ribboned sky, its green silk tail fluttering amid a strong breeze. Rose trotted beside her, shrieking her approval. Somehow their skirts and legs tangled, and they fell together in a wildly giggling heap. Bounding up immediately, Rose took the roll of string and continued to run, her brown curls flying in shining banners behind her. Holly remained on the ground, resting on her back. Smiling, she relaxed on the crisp green lawn while the sun shone full on her face. Holly! The anxious note in her husband's voice pierced her reverie. She rolled to her side with an inquiring smile. He was coming toward her from the house, his stride purposeful, his hard face set with a frown. You must have been watching from the library window, Holly murmured, crooking her finger for him to join her on the grass. I saw you fall, he said curtly, squatting beside her. Are you all right? Holly wriggled to her back, heedless of possible grass stains, knowing she looked far more like a tumbled country lass than the grand lady she had been reared to be. Come closer and I'll show you, she said throatily. A reluctant laugh escaped him as his gaze travelled over her abandoned posture. The skirts flipped up to reveal her white stockinged ankles. Holly lay still beneath his perusal, hoping his reticence with her was finally beginning to fade. In the past six weeks of her recovery from typhoid, she had regained her health in full measure, until she was once more pink-cheeked and lively, and even a bit plump. She knew she had never looked or felt better, and along with her health had come all her natural desire to be physically close with her husband. Ironically, Zachary's recovery had been somewhat slower than hers. Although he was as affectionate and teasing as ever, there was an unbreakable restraint in his manner with her, an undue carefulness in the way he touched her, as if she was still so fragile that he might accidentally cause her harm. Although he had regained some of the weight he had lost, he was still a bit too lean, too watchful and tense, as if he were waiting for some unseen enemy to pounce. He had not made love to her since before the typhoid fever. There was no mistaking the fact that he wanted her, and after the past two months of celibacy, a man with his sexual appetite must be suffering mightily. But he had greeted her recent advances with careful, gentle rebuffs, promising that they would be intimate again when she was better. Clearly, his opinion of her health was far different than her own, or even Dr. Linley's. The physician had tactfully informed her that she was ready to resume all normal marital activity as soon as she felt able. However, she didn't seem able to convince Zachary that she was more than healthy enough to receive him in her bed. Wanting him to relax, to be happy, to lose his restraint in her arms, Holly slid him a provocative glance. Kiss me, she murmured. There's no one here but Rose, and she certainly won't mind. Zachary hesitated and bent over her, brushing his mouth gently over hers. She slid a hand around the back of his neck, fingers curving over muscles that were as hard as steel. Holding him to her, she touched her tongue to his lips, but he would not share his taste with her. He took her wrist carefully and pulled her hand away from his neck. I have to go back, he said unsteadily, and let out a panting breath. Work to do. Shivering and laughing briefly, he stood in an easy movement and threw her a glance of tortured love. He returned to the house, 
while she raised herself to a sitting position and contemplated his tall, retreating figure. Clearly something must be done, Holly thought, with mingled amusement and exasperation. Of all men, she had never thought Zachary Bronson would be so difficult to seduce. He seemed almost afraid to touch her. She had no doubt that he would make love to her again some day, when he finally realized that he would not inadvertently hurt her. But she did not want to wait. She wanted him now, the vigorous, full-blooded lover, whose lusty advances made her mad with pleasure. Not this careful, considerate gentleman, who seemed entirely too self-controlled for his own good. Returning home from a long day spent in his town offices, Zachary entered the house with a sigh of relief. It had been an unexpectedly difficult negotiation, but he had finally acquired the largest interest in a Birmingham metalwork factory that produced chains, nails, and needles. The difficult part had not been in settling the financial terms, but in convincing his would-be partners that from now on the factory would be run by his managers his way. There would be decent hours for the workers, no children employed, and part of the profits would be reinvested in ways his partners had called foolish and unnecessary. He had nearly walked away from the deal entirely, and when they had realized he would not yield an inch, they had agreed to all his terms. The day of patient, persistent debate had left him agitated. He was still tense with battle readiness, longing for a way to expel his pent-up energy. Unfortunately, his favorite method, that of tumbling his wife, was still not available to him. He knew Holly would welcome him if he approached her that way. However, she still seemed so small and fragile, and he was terrified that her health might undergo a setback if he pushed her too hard. Moreover, his own feelings for her overwhelmed him. It had been so long since he had made love to her that he half feared he would fall on her like a rabid animal when he finally approached her. It was Thursday, the usual night off for the servants, but the household seemed far quieter and emptier than usual. As Zachary wandered from the entrance hall to the family dining room, he discovered that the cold supper that the cook always set out on these evenings was not to be found. Checking his pocket watch, he discovered that he was only a quarter hour late. Was it possible that the family had already eaten and retired? Mysteriously, there wasn't a single person in view, and no one responded to his casual call. The house seemed deserted. Frowning, Zachary strode to the grand staircase, his pace quickening as he wondered if something had gone wrong. And then he saw it. A rose with crimson petals, laid carefully along the bottom step. He picked up the flower, the long stem carefully denuded of thorns. As he ascended the stairs, he found another on the sixth step, and another on the twelfth. His gaze progressed upward, discovering that a trail of red roses had been laid out for him to follow. A smile pulled up from deep inside him, and he shook his head slightly. He wandered along the path of roses, in no particular hurry as he added to his growing collection. The blossoms were lush and fragrant, the sweet smell teasing his senses as he carried them. After retrieving more than a dozen, he found himself standing before his own bedroom door, with one last bloom dangling from the doorknob by a red ribbon. Feeling rather dreamlike, he opened the door, crossed the threshold, and closed himself inside the bedroom. A small table, laden with covered silver dishes and candles in silver holders, had been set in the corner. His gaze travelled from the cosy supper for two to the sight of his pretty, dark-haired wife, who was dressed in something filmy and black. Her body was visible through the wickedly revealing negligee, and he stared at her in stupefied silence. Where is everyone? he asked with difficulty. Holly waved a rose as if it were a magic wand. I made them all disappear. Smiling mysteriously, she came forward to embrace him. 
Now, which will you have first? She asked. Supper, or me? The roses dropped to the floor in a rustling, sweetly aromatic heap. He stood amid the cascade of blossoms as she pressed against him, silken and fragrant and utterly female. Zachary's arms went around her. The feel of her warm flesh beneath the transparent black silk was enough to make his mouth go dry, and his aching loins wake in a rapid, twitching surge. He tried to control the bursting excitement that filled him, but he was so hungry with longing, his body so damn deprived, that all he could do was stand there and gulp for air. Her small, clever hands roamed busily beneath his coat, tugging at buttons, pulling at fabric. Until his shirt hung free of his trousers, her palm brushed lightly over his rock-hard erection, lingered in a squeezing caress, and she smiled against his shirt front. I suppose this answers my question, she murmured, and set about freeing him from the tight constriction of broadcloth. Somehow, in the midst of his turmoil, Zachary was able to make his stiff mouth form words. Holly, I'm afraid. Oh God, I can't control myself. Then don't," she said simply, and tugged his head down to hers. He resisted, his face drawn with torment. If I should cause you a relapse, darling," she stroked his cheek with her soft hand, smiling tenderly at him. "Don't you know that your love only gives me strength?" She touched the corner of his taut mouth with a gentle fingertip. Give me what I need, Zachary," she whispered. "It's been far too long." Groaning, he took her sweet mouth with his, delving deeply with his tongue, and the pleasure of it drove him wild. He kissed her endlessly, sucking, stroking, devouring, while his hands cupped over her silk-covered breasts, her round hips, her bottom. The feel of her made him dizzy. He dragged her to the bed and tossed her on top of the mattress, and tore at his own clothes until most of them were gone. He crawled on top of her, his hands and mouth searching for the white skin left uncovered by the veil of black silk, while she whispered urgently for him to unfasten her gown. There are some buttons, she gasped. No, not there over here. Yes, and a ribbon that ties over my. Oh yes. His growing desperation made it impossible to dispose entirely of the intricate network of fastenings. Finally, he settled for pushing the filmy skirts up to her waist and lowering himself between her open thighs. He pushed himself inside her, lunging, sliding, until he was deeply encased in her silken heat. She moaned and wrapped her arms and legs around him, her hips pressing firmly upward against his weight. Framing her face in his hands, he kissed her open mouth and began to thrust without restraint, taking her in primitive, impatient drives that made her whimper against his lips. The delicate crescents of her nails pressed into his back, and he shuddered and pumped harder until the eruption of sensation caught up with him at last. For a moment, the release seemed too intense to bear, white hot and consuming as it blazed through his body. Just as his climax began to ease, he felt her inner muscles tighten around him in a long, exquisite ripple. He took her cry into his mouth and held himself as far inside her as possible, riding her until the last tremor had faded. They lay together, winded and relaxed and steeped in pleasurable aftermath. Zachary drew his fingers over his wife's alluring body. Unfastening what was left of the negligee and stripping it away, finding a rose poised on a nearby pillow, he retrieved the soft, open blossom and drew it over her damp, pearly skin, tickling her breasts and navel, gently stroking it between her thighs. Zachary, she protested, delighting him with a blush. He grinned lazily, feeling at peace for the first time in months. Which he murmured, "You knew I wanted to wait longer before doing this." Holly levered herself over him with a triumphant smile. "You don't always know what's best for me," 
He tangled his hands in her hair and urged her to kiss him. And what is best for you? He whispered when their lips had parted. You, she informed him. As much of you as I can have. Filled with adoration, Zachary stared into her smiling face. I believe I can oblige you, my love. And he pulled her deep into his embrace and loved her once again. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation of Where Dreams Begin by Lisa Kleipas. Copyright 2000 by Lisa Kleipas. Performed by Rosalind Landor. Directed by Jerry Maybrook. Performance copyright 2011 by Brilliance Audio. All rights reserved. For further information concerning this program or other Brilliance Audio titles, please call the following toll-free number. 1-800-222-3225 or visit our website at www.brilliansaudio.com No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast or copied without written permission. Address all inquiries to Brilliance Audio P.O. Box 887, Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417.